Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of Citadels of the Lost, The Annals of Dracus, Book Two, by Tracy Hickman. Performed by Phil Giganti. Chapter 9 Death's Shadow. This is madness! Urulani huffed. And to what particular aspect of this madness are you referring? Dracus responded. The air weighed down on him, laden with the moisture from the night's rain. He was sweating profusely and having trouble keeping the salty liquid out of his eyes. The clouds had cleared with the rising sun, but the warmth only served to increase his discomfort. The fact that we are here at all, or perhaps that we actually believe we can survive a thousand leagues from any help. I can think of a number of different ways that our situation would qualify as insane. Did you include the fact that we're following a Chimerian into ruins which we know to be deadly? The captain said, sweat beating on her dark forehead. In order to give a dwarf back a piece of rock? How about that we have happily left our stronghold, because a proven traitor among us tells us that some goddess none of us has ever heard of told her so? Was that on your list? Well, we're apparently not all happy about that, Dracus answered, pushing aside a massive fern frond, trying to keep Ethis and Mala, both of whom were ahead of him in sight. And I'll even admit that it was on my list. She cannot be trusted, Dracus. Urulani said as she followed at his heels. Even the Lyric thinks she is insane. This isn't the time, Captain. We may not have another time. Urulani snapped back. I'm beginning to wonder if all you Southlands humans are lunatics. What a horrible place, he thought, as he made his way around a fallen pillar jutting out of the shattered stones of the nearly obliterated roadway. Who in their right mind would want to live here? Who out of their right mind would want to live here either? A quick smile flashed across his face. There were certainly enough people here to ask that question and get an answer with authority. The lyric had not been in her right mind since House Timuron fell, and it was beginning to look as though Mala had joined that particular tribe as well. Mala's new obsession with having seen a goddess and fleeing back into the jungle ruins looking for some living road made just about as much sense as the lyric. Maybe they were all destined to that fate, he thought, as he struggled to keep his footing over a pile of loose stones between a row of bushes with thorns nearly as long as his hand. Perhaps it was an inevitable result of breaking the magical bonds that had held him in a blissful state, innocent of the true horror of his life as a slave. What had his freedom won him except misery, suspicion, and a journey that had brought him to die in a land far from anything that he had ever known? All this because his name happened to be the same as the one mentioned by some long-dead poet, and because everyone else, it seemed, wanted the story to be true. Well, if I am insane, Dracus said, entering a small section of the road where the cobblestones were fitted so tightly together that they had kept the jungle foliage at bay. I wish it were in a more pleasant climate. What do you think, Captain? Does the fact that I would rather die in more pleasant surroundings prove me sane or not? Urulani smiled slightly. I think that leaves the entire question open. Well, Ethis must be crazy, Dracus stated, looking ahead of them. He's carrying the dwarf. Urulani looked up as well, peering through the jumble of broken walls, street, and plants. Jugar was strapped to the back of the Chimarian, lashed down like scowling cordwood being hauled to market. He's the only one who could shoulder the little fool. The dwarf's none too happy about it, but his comfort is the least of my concerns. What about the lyric? Dracus wiped his brow again, but it did not seem to help. She's ahead of us, too. Ulani reported as she scanned the thick undergrowth around them. The lyric seems to be keeping up better than I am. I'd be more comfortable with the deck under my feet. Land is hard for me. What about your wondrous goddess talker? Up ahead, Dracus replied. With Ethis? Urulani said, raising one dark eyebrow. Yes, Dracus nodded, not wanting to be drawn into that particular argument. With Ethis. The roadway they were following could barely be discerned as having ever lived up to the name. Ferns and thick brush, as well as a number of towering trees, had laid claim to the ancient path. 
From roots to leaves they had broken up the evidence of man's ordered mind and handiwork over the centuries, until only scattered pieces remained. If there had once been far-seeing towers, they were now obscured by the enormous trees growing in thick succession. Only jumbled fragments remained. The ruins of Pythar were, to Dracus, a metaphor for madness, like making one sad way through the remains of greatness that no longer functioned or even made sense. They had left the cliff city as soon as they could gather what remained of their belongings. Ethis asked them to go down by the same stairs they had come up the previous day. Their intruder had apparently come to them some other way, which Ethis believed too dangerous for Mala or the Lyric to traverse. He had gratefully left Urulani off of that list, as Dracus was coming to appreciate the captain of the Sondau clan and knew that any inference of her being weak might well have ended in blows exchanged. Ethis said the trail led downward, and that he and the dwarf would meet them at the base of the stairs once he knew where the trail went. Dracus half believed the Chimerian would dump the dwarf and disappear altogether, abandoning them, but Ethis arrived as promised. He showed them a passage to the other side of the broken bridge and onto what once had been a wide boulevard, now choked with vegetation. Ethis, followed closely by the suddenly enthusiastic Mala, led them down the broken avenue. They passed several ruins whose remains made Dracus's heart ache for their lost and ruined beauty. A partial wall with frieze carvings across its face, forming compelling patterns within patterns. A fountain which, though long since non-functioning, intermingled its own perfectly crafted stone leaves with those of the surrounding plants, or a staircase rising to nothing with stone riser posts formed to look like jumping fish. In each case, Dracus felt the ghostly presence of artisans who were long dead. Who carved that frieze, he wondered? What hand held the hammer and the chisel? To whom did they go at the end of their day's labor? The evidence of their hands was everywhere, and Dracus struggled to comprehend their loss. Four separate streets intersected the boulevard. Ethis paused for a moment, his head and body rising slightly as he turned around. His voice was lowered when he spoke. They're back. Back, Urulani said. The hunters, you mean, or whatever they're called? Yes, Ethis said. Can we get back to the cliffs? Dracus asked at once. No, Ethis said, shaking his head. They're coming from the cliffs. The markings lead this way. Come on. He dashed down the avenue to his left, weaving across the fitted stones among grass blades that were nearly ten feet tall. "'Where are we going now?' Urulani asked as she adjusted her grip on her sword. "'One foot after the other, Captain,' Dracus said, drawing his own sword. "'Anywhere but here.' They both ran after the others into the opening formed by the remaining stones of the road. It was a ragged course, but Dracus soon realized that it was a path. In places, he noticed, the stones did not fit the pattern of the remaining road. There were large, flat stones laid across the ground that bridged the grass between sections of the old avenue. A loud rustling sounded behind them. Whatever was following them had plunged into the tall grasses. Either they did not know of the path, or they were heedless of it. Dracus glanced back and could see the tops of the grass blades violently shaking behind him and to his left. He gritted his teeth concentrating on the path before him and the back of Urulani, who was running the twisted way in front of him. With shocking suddenness, they emerged from the grasses into another clear intersection. This area appeared to be burned, as though a fire had passed through a few seasons before. Ahead of them, the Lyric and Mala were running toward a black thicket of brush that looked as though it were spilling from one of the branching alleys. Ethis was standing in front of it, waving them on. There was an opening in the wall of brush. Mala and the Lyric had already passed into the opening. Dracus and Urulani ran across the space quickly and ducked into the low opening, passing Ethis. There was an obvious path beaten into the ground, again weaving back and forth deeper into the thick brush. Ouch! Urulani exclaimed quietly. Dracus looked at her. Her arm was bleeding near the shoulder. The brush was filled with razor-sharp thorns. Ethis came in behind Dracus, pulling a woven patch of the same thorny materials behind him and sealing the way behind them. As Ethis turned, the dwarf strapped on his back swung toward Dracus. I have never suffered such indignities in my life! 
Jugar was almost purple with rage, his spittle flying at Dracus's face, only a hand's breadth between them. Slung to the back of this thieving bendy like I was one of his rubber-bottomed offspring! Silence, fool! Ethis hissed. We're not alone. Straw-thin rays of sunlight were all that penetrated the thicket. The branches of the thorn-covered brush so thick around them that it was impossible to see anything beyond. Ethis raised one long hand, holding his palm toward Dracus and Urulani. The thicket shook suddenly with several impacts, each followed immediately by whooping and screeching sounds that they felt as a chill in their bones. Shadows moved across the face of the thicket, blotting out shafts of light back and forth. Ethis turned to Dracus, his expressionless face registering concern for the benefit of his companions. Then he motioned with his hand for them to continue farther into the thicket. This path is no accident, Dracus whispered to Urulani. They emerged from the thicket into an enormous plaza. Its grounds also burned to stubble where the grasses were just starting to reestablish themselves. Broken columns on either side lined the area that was nearly fifty feet across and more than three hundred feet in length. At the far end stood a wall nearly three stories high, with additional crumbling walls and structures holding it vertical. The remains of buildings lined the great square. The rest of their companions were waiting nervously for them. The terrible whooping sound came again from the left. Others soon joined it in chorus, beyond the ruins across the square and from the ruins to their right. Now where? Dracus demanded of Ethis. The Chimerian's head moved in swift jerks as he took in the area around them. That way, he said, pointing to their right. Down the length of the plaza, run! Oh, no! cried the dwarf. Not run! Ethis plunged ahead of them, all four of his arms swinging with the effort of his dash, the dwarf roaring now in pain with every step. Dracus had the lyric by one arm as they both dashed down the center of the plaza together. Mala ran alone, her auburn hair bouncing in the wind behind her. Ethis suddenly skidded to a halt in the center of the plaza. Dracus nearly fell over trying to stop short of running into anyone. What is it? It ends, Ethis said in blinking astonishment. What ends? Urulani demanded. The trail, Ethis said. It ends right here. I think you may be right for once, Chimerian, Jugar said after drawing a deep breath. Look! They were swarming over the ruined walls. They might have been mistaken for humans except for the long barbed tails. Their legs were different too, double segmented with both forward and backward knee joints. Their feet had a heel claw and elongated toes with long claws at the end, as did the hands at the ends of their immensely powerful arms. The bones of their faces were angular, ending in jutting spiked bones. Their wide mouths were filled with long, sharp teeth. Their scales shone in the sun as they screamed. They flowed like a tide over the ruins from all directions at once, surrounding the plaza. They crept forward, crouching down on all four appendages, coiling muscles to strike. Dracus raised his sword, wondering just how tough the hides of these horrors would prove to be. There would be no time for words. Even if there were, he had nothing to say. The stone beneath their feet suddenly shifted, tipped, and dropped beneath them. Caught off balance, they all tumbled into each other, sliding sideways down the stone into the darkness. The monstrous horror screamed as one, leaping forward toward their prey. But it was too late. The stone had already risen back into place. Their prey had vanished into the earth. Chapter 10 Eishander Dracus rolled over quickly, his right hand desperately searching for his sword. Hey! Sorry, he said, moving his hand in a different direction across the stone floor. Touch me again with that hand and you'll lose the arm that goes with it! Urulani snapped. Dracus's fingers felt the familiar bite of a cold steel edge. He lightly followed the side of the blade to the grip and snatched it thankfully. The muffled sounds above him sent a shiver through him. Now they're angry. Quickly pushing himself up to his feet, Dracus looked around him. A single bright patch of light lit the vast subterranean room. Massive columns, wider than Dracus's reach, marched in seemingly endless procession into the darkness. Opposite the light, 
and behind him a great device towered from floor to ceiling. Dracus took it all in at a glance, a hopeless complex of spiked wheels, rods, and cords that the warrior found completely incomprehensible. A shadow passed over the device, and the light was momentarily blocked near its source. Others, Orulani, Dracus shouted. Get up! There's someone else down here! The screeching above them was getting louder, as was the pounding on the stone above. Sand, shaken loose, fell in thin veils around them. The great device creaked. Where do we go? Mala cried as she scrambled to her feet. Toward the light, he said. Come on, everyone, let's move now! They started their run toward the square of light at the end of the enormous room. A shadow again flickered against the intense light. Did you see that? Urulani shouted. Keep running, Dracus urged. Run through it if you must, but don't stop! The rectangle of light was getting closer. Dracus's eyes were adjusting to the change. There were trees and sky beyond, fitted stones of a plaza, and they burst into the open stone court beneath the towering city wall behind them. The sounds of the monsters were beyond the wall, but Dracus doubted that it would hold them back once they caught the scent of him and his companions. Yet that was not what astonished him. The plaza sloped down, forming a key that jutted into a wide green river. More astonishing still, two longboats formed from bundled reeds were tied to the end of the key. One held a few provisions. The other was nearly empty, except for one very interesting occupant. No longer a child, but not yet grown into his beard, a young male human stood at the front of the boat, a long pole in his hand. He wore a leather loincloth and vest, but little else, his feet being bare. His skin was a deep brown color, but his hair was straw-colored, long, and pulled back into a thick braid. The pole he held extended down into the water, where the youth was holding the boats against the current next to the quay. He stared at them expectantly, waiting. At this, I think we found your thief. Dracus smiled. The tied-together boats drifted down the center of the river. The young man, he looked to be about fourteen years old, piloted the boats with his long staff. When the boy had pulled the staff from the water earlier in the day, Dracus discovered that the pole actually had a flattened, wide end at the bottom that allowed him to use the implement as a pole and as a paddle or rudder, depending on the needs at the time. It proved to be a most effective tool in keeping their course steady down the serpentine convolutions of the river's passage. He doesn't say much, does he? Urulani observed from the front of the reed boat. She seemed more relaxed now that they were on the water, although Dracus suspected that she was a bit restless over not being in command of the ship. She continued watching the river as they drifted with the current, affecting a pose of being in charge of a craft over which she had no authority or control. He may not speak our language, Ethis said. The Chimerian was sitting at the front near where Urulani stood, his back to the direction of travel as he inspected and repacked his gear in his field pack. It has been more than five hundred years since the unified tongue was spoken in these lands. Their language would almost certainly have been corrupted by now. For all we know, they may have even lost the ability to speak altogether. Altogether, the lyric said. Ethis glanced up at her. She was sitting in the back of the boat near the silent young man. What did you say? I said altogether, the lyric replied. Why? Ethis asked. Because you wondered if we had lost the ability to speak it, the lyric replied. I don't understand, Ethis said, shaking his head. Dracus chuckled. <sighs> Ethis, may I introduce you to Letaria, a relatively minor character? I am not a minor, huffed the lyric. From the ravine sea tales, she was renowned for taking everything said literally. Charmed, Ethis said without enthusiasm. Dracus watched the deep jungle drift past, its thick brush occasionally giving up a glimpse of some piece of ancient fallen structure. There are many ruins along the river. Following Dracus's gaze, Urulani looked over at a broken tower foundation around which the river waters swirled. There will be more ruins along the river than inland. Civilization tends to follow the course of rivers. They offer water to sustain life, 
and irrigation for crops, as well as an easy source of sanitation, so long as you don't give much thought to those who are downstream. They also offer the benefit of easier and faster travel over longer distances. If you are ever lost, a river will always take you somewhere. Well, we are certainly lost, Dracus said, looking back past the young native boy to the second boat tied behind them. The prow and the stern of each boat curved upward, where the reeds were bundled and lashed together. Mala lay sleeping in the front of the second boat, with her head against the raised prow. Jugar was also in the trailing boat, Ethis having rigged what remained of the canvas he had used to haul the dwarf all morning as a shade for him. The dwarf had been knocked cold by the fall through the trap door in Pythar, and still lay unconscious in the bottom of the boat. Dracus considered Mala for a moment before he spoke again. It's a road, isn't it, Urulani? The river, I mean. This is Mala's living road. Perhaps, Urulani replied, turning back to watch the river ahead of them. Or she may just be crazy. Even the lyric thinks so. Whether providence, fate, or just luck brought us here is unimportant, Ethis said. The question is, what do we do next? This river eventually could take us to the sea. Which sea would that be? Urulani chided. Any sea, I would think. Ethis answered back. You are supposed to be a renowned captain, are you not? Sail along the coast until we find familiar waters and then head back south from there, back to more familiar lands. What in these? Ulani gestured at the reed boats. I may be a fine example of my craft, Chimerian, but not even the gods of the ocean depths would attempt an open water crossing in one of these reed sponges. Quiet, both of you, Dracus said. The most important thing is to find a way to make contact with this native boy's people and find a way to survive. Then we'll worry about building ships and crossing oceans. And what makes you think we can trust him? Ethis asked. He could have left us back there, Dracus said. Someone made those paths, and as good as he was at sneaking into our camp and taking our things, he was waiting there for us by the quay when we were all but dead. If it hadn't been for him, we would have been a quick meal for those... those... Pythars, the boy said. Yes, Pythars, when they... Dracus stopped speaking. They all turned to look at the boy, who continued working his oar against the river, shifting them again toward the center. You speak our language? Dracus asked cautiously. No. The lyric sniffed. We speak his. The boy laughed. <laughs> she funny. Just wait, Dracus said shaking his head as though it would somehow help him to embrace this new thought. We've been talking here for the last four hours, and you've understood everything we said? Most, the boy replied. You are much entertaining. I learn your secrets. That is the way of my duty, the way of my glory. Save you did I. Hero am I. Far runner am I. A far runner. Ethis said carefully. Tell us, what are forerunners? The boy's face broke into a sneer. The formed man is from a far land indeed, if you do not know about forerunners. We leave the clan, master rivers, run far to the ancient places and brave the citadels. We gather our past from the fall of the proud and bring them back for our clan. My father was a forerunner. My father's father was a far runner. I now am a far runner. So you rob the bones of the dead, Urulani said, recovering from her astonishment at the speaking boy. The dead brought down their doom on their own heads, the boy shrugged. They have no more use for their things. Why not just live in the citadels? Ethis asked with a shrug of all four shoulders. The boy glared at him. The four-armed man is a child. Yes, Ethis said carefully. I am a child. Teach me. Citadels are cursed. So you bring back cursed items to your tribe? Dracus asked incredulously. No, foolish man! The youth spat back heatedly. Cursed magic we leave to die with the citadels. Only far runners are blessed by the gods to go there, 
and find those things not of the magic. It is our honor. It is our glory. And yet we were there, Ethis said evenly. We too braved the cursed citadels. The boy's lips curled in disgust. You were lost. You would have been eaten by the pythar if I had not led you to the river. You are children fallen in a pit of dragons, crying for help. And you are most brave, Ethis continued. So brave that you stole our things from us. Yes, I took your things, the boy said proudly. It was to my honor and your shame. Yes, you are brave, Dracus said. The boy was in this way over his head, no matter what his boasts might say. The boy was quick, certainly, and dangerous, but any one of them would be able to take him in combat, let alone all of them at once. We are shamed before you. We would like our things back now. They are mine, the boy said, thrusting out his jaw. I have taken them as is a forerunner's right. Yes, they are. Ethis took up Dracus's thought. But I am surprised that you would bring a great magic thing back to your clan. You are talking foolish again, the boy said dubiously. No, Ethis continued. You took a stone from the dwarf, a black stone. It is great and terrible magic in disguise, and you have brought it back with you. The boy's eyes went wide. He suddenly tossed his long pole at Dracus, who barely had the reflexes to catch it. The boy jumped down, shoving the lyric aside so violently that she nearly fell out of the boat. Frantically, the boy pawed through his sack and pulled out a black, faceted stone. He drew back his arm as though to pitch it with all his might into the river. Ethis lunged forward, snatching the stone out of the boy's hand before he could let loose his throw. "'Do not worry, friend Farrunner,' Ethis said, steadying the boat as he sat back down. Four armed men are immune to the curse. I will take care of it for you, and protect you and your clan from its effects.' The boy blinked, uncertainty in his face for the first time. His lower lip quivered slightly. The honor is still yours, Farrunner, Dracus said quietly. I am Dracus. This is Ethis. The woman at the prow is Urulani, and this woman we call the Lyric. We are your prize, and we will not trouble you. May we ask you your name? Ishander, the boy said. I am Ishander. Then Ishander, Dracus said, handing back the long pole. We are trying to find our way back home. Where are you taking us? Home, Ishander answered. My home, but your people. If you are lost, will they not come looking for you? <sighs> no, Ishander, Dracus said with a sigh. No one is looking for us at all. Chapter 11 Hunter and hunted. Soan Jen Ray, the renegade elven inquisitor whose capture and death was decreed by imperial will throughout the Ronos Empire that he had faithfully served, sat wearily down at the crest of a small knoll, leaning his back against the sloping broad trunk of a tree as he gazed back down at the length of road he had just taken. Looking behind him had become a necessary habit. He was verging on the far northern reaches of the empire, as far from the imperial city of Ronos as possible, and he knew that it was not far enough. The Shellisfield Road wound its way among the gently rolling mounds of the North March, an unhurried path for traders who came eastward from Rivertown. At that walled village the road split, the coast road following the river to the ports of the Shadow Coast to the west. Gnomish goods from Cape Jakar on Manticus Bay traveled this road as well as goblin spices from Rhodesia's Gorgantia Bay far up the coast. He knew this because he had journeyed with those cargoes, quietly working his passage on a gnomish galley and helping shift their jars in Chelsea to the transport wagons. Chelsea was an elven settlement, requiring that Soan take more care to not be recognized for either whom he now was or who he had once been. He had covered many leagues since discarding the robes that once heralded him as an inquisitor of the Iblisi, 
taking instead the more common robes of a fourth estate merchant as he reinvented himself and his false past. His mate staff, powerful symbol of his former calling, he disguised as best he could from the eyes that occasionally might be cast in his direction. He never considered discarding it, though its discovery in his hands would certainly expose him. It was too powerful a weapon to be without. In his mind, Soen saw the farther reaches of the road branching south from Rivertown to become the main trade route down through the North March connecting with the Imperial Folds, the magical transportation portals that were the backbone of Ronos' commerce, communication, and might. Just outside an otherwise inconsequential village called Char. Through these portals he had passed freely only a week before, a master on a mission sanctioned by the imperial will and blessed by Chadre, the matriarchal head of the Iblisi order that he faithfully served. What a difference a few weeks can make, he thought. He drew his mind back sharply to the present and again studied the road below him at the base of the knoll. It was a well-traveled road, as it made its way east toward the town of Shellis Field at the base of the Whispering Hills, just two leagues ahead. Shellis Field was one of several towns established just short of the borders of Ephendria, the silent reclusive land of the Chimerians. Those strange, four-armed creatures with their blank, nearly non-existent faces came to Shellis Field for trade, leaving their own borders closed to anyone not of their race. The Shellis Field Road was not wide or well-maintained, because those who normally traveled it, while constant, were few. Recently, however, some great movement had flooded over the boundaries of the established road. The new ruts had not yet sunk deeply into the hard ground, despite the evidence of a large number of travelers, all moving northeast. The predominance of tracks were Manticorian, lion men inexplicably now moving from their traditional clan holdings in the steppes of Chenandria, up this road, and probably far past the Whispering Hills. Such a migration was without precedent, but it was not Manticoreans alone. Also mixed in with the tracks were those of plains gnomes from Vestasia, and an unusual number of goblins who were rarely, if ever, seen this far south of their Nordesian lodges. Whole nations on the run, and I'm running right along with them. Soen sighed all because of a few broken slaves. Soen gazed again down at the dirt road. The number of Manticorean tracks was dizzying. And I have to find one among an entire nation of Manticores, Soen thought. Just a single, broken, crazy, bolting Manticore slave by the name of Belag. Find him, and I'll find the human Dracus. Find Dracus, and perhaps then I'll have the means of convincing the devout members of my former order that there is more value in my life than in my death. Soen was both the hunter and the hunted. The game was which role he would fulfill first. Someone below him had left the road and was climbing toward him up the knoll. Any new acquaintance could be the harbinger of either his salvation or his doom. So one always found his interest piqued to discover which of the two was approaching. "'Good noon to you!' called out the other as he approached. "'A good noon to you as well!' So one called back. He could easily make out four arms and the featureless face that marked the approaching creature as a Chimerian. This approaching citizen of Ephendria held walking staffs in two of its four hands. As to its gender... So one knew that determination would have to wait until the creature was closer. Most elves could not tell whether a Chimerian was male or female until the creature specifically let them know during conversation. Even as a trained inquisitor, so one had difficulty knowing at a distance. What news do you bring? News enough, the Chimerian replied. And good news at that. I come from the Shadow Coast, and the cities are alive with the most amazing talk. Come, share the shade of my tree. So coaxed with a practiced smile, his hand resting with studied ease on his disguised staff. Fire and death spooled in the back of his mind, his hand communicating his murderous intention to the staff that warmed beneath his hand. I long to hear what is happening in the world. It was a lie. Soen had himself just come from the Shadow Coast, 
and knew better than most what was truly going on there. "'Thank you, noble elven lord,' the Chimerian said as he stepped up to the tree, paying the deference to the elf that Ronas demanded of everyone else in the world. "'Your generosity is great and does honor to us both. I am Tien Jakai, of late a merchant of the Fourth Estate and of the Order of Paktan.' Soen lied again. When conversing with strangers, he knew, the more distant his location was from the heart of the imperial will, the more politic it was to distance himself from the empire in every way. I have come to seek a better destiny here in this wild land than I found in the stifling and rotting courts of Ronas. And you? Ah! the Chimerian replied. Then the Shadow Coast is just the place for you, or perhaps even the Mistral Peninsula itself far beyond the mournful mountains. There are great opportunities there. I should know. Trade was once my profession. The Chimerian extended a free hand. I'm called Vendis. This seems to be the season for changing professions, Soen thought, but instead reached up with his own free hand grasped Vindis down near his elbow, and said, "'And what do you do now, Vindis? "'Why, I believe I am a pilgrim. "'You're a... I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. "'I am a pilgrim. I am on a spiritual journey,' Vindis said, leaning on both his walking sticks. "'You asked for my news. Have you heard the stories of the prophet?' Hunter or hunted? So one thought, though not a muscle moved in response, his left hand still resting on the mate staff. I've heard nothing but this prophet Belog since tracking the manticore all the way to Port Melthis, he thought. The more immediate question has more to do with Vendis. Do I use this Chimerian or kill him where he stands? Is he a predator or the prey? A prophet, Soen replied with carefully feigned interest. Is there such a thing? All the winds of the Shadow Coast could not match the force of the words being whispered about him from Shell Sea to Goganta Bay. Surely with so many stories he must exist. The weight of tongues never adds to a truth, it only detracts, Soen said. But please go on, tell me about it. I have heard that it began many centuries ago. The Chimerian stopped. Surely my noble lord has heard this tale. Not at all, I assure you. Soen lied again. He had heard variations of this tale, some wilder in their miraculous attributions than others, in every town, village, or hamlet that he had entered. Each one had grown with every telling, but he was trained as an inquisitor, and so he took in all variations of accounts, knowing that often the truth was found in the smallest, barely included detail. Please, continue. The Chimerian's face twisted into what almost passed for a smile. Well, I have heard that it began many centuries ago, when the Humani ruled a great nation across the northern sea. There, the might of the terrible Ronas came down in its wrath upon the Humani and crushed their brittle bones back into the dust of their land. But as their great priest died on the altar of their citadel, he wrought a great prophecy that one would come afterward who would bring down the towers of the unjust and avenge the bones of the Humani. Ronas would fall before the thunder of his words and the fire of his mouth, and his name would be called Dracus. I believe I have heard something of this tale. So uncoaxed. In truth, he had studied the original prophecy texts in the deep libraries of the Iblisi Lyceum. The prophecy itself was far more complex than this simple telling, and more disturbingly, almost grotesquely detailed. This was a children's version but he had to know who this Chimerian was and why he had approached Soen searching for the same Belog he sought himself. It is very old. But he has come, the Chimerian hissed quietly. This Dracus has come at last. 
It is said he broke the chains of his enslavement through the power of his own hands. He vanished before the eyes of the Iblisi, who were sent to recapture him, destroying a legion of their ranks with the wave of his hand, and weeping for their loss afterward. He walked the forests of Faerie, and emerged whole and untouched from the other side. This Humani Dracus is the prophesied one. He has fulfilled the prophecy in every particular. That was certainly not true. Soen and three remaining members of his quorum had chased Dracus and his companions down the wide length of the Hyperion Plain, only to lose them when they crossed into fairy lands. That move had cost him the lives of his two Codexia, and nearly that of the Assessia his master Chidre had sent to spy on him. Would that he had died then, Soen thought. I managed to track Dracus again on the Thetis coast, only to lose him when the fool Jukung showed up to kill us both and ruined it all. So, uh, this Dracus is the prophet you were looking for. It was a deliberate error meant to bait Vendis. So I knew very well who the prophet was supposed to be. Oh, no, the Chimerian answered gently. The prophet is the one who tells the stories of Dracus. He is the one who comes ahead of Dracus, preparing the way for his return. At least those are the tales that are being told on the Shadow Coast. I have not met this prophet, and am curious as to what sort of a creature he is. That is why I have become a pilgrim, that I might discover the truth. A worthy ambition. So and nodded. The Iblisi had been the guardians of truth for centuries. It was their job to keep the truth safely hidden away. In an empire where history itself was modified to suit the whims of the moment, only the Iblisi kept the sacred difference between reality and expedience. Truth, or the safekeeping of the truth, was therefore his business. To find the truth of a thing is of value indeed. I think I might like to hear what this prophet has to say as well. I am on no otherwise urgent business, and am searching for a better truth, just as you seem to be. I don't suppose you know where this prophet might be found, do you? Vindis opened his mouth as if to speak, but hesitated for a moment. Uh, he is, they say, a most generous being, but those who are close to him keep his location closely guarded, for fear that the emperor might wish him ill. But those who told me the tale also told me where to seek him. I am an elf, as you can clearly see. So and said, But is not the truth for all creatures, even the elves under whose doom we quake? Is there no elf who might hear the truth, and, knowing it, follow it too? Bindis thought for a moment, and then nodded, smiling his strange smile once more. Then, Tian Jakai, come with me into Shellis Field, and we shall decide together how best we may find this prophet. Soen did not for a moment believe that this Vindus of Ephendria met him by anything like coincidence. Only fools believed in the providence of the gods arranging such an obvious and fortuitous meeting. Hunter or hunted, stalker or prey. Soen stood up, his mate staff still ready. An interesting game, he thought. Chapter 12 Prophet for Prophet It's about time you got in, the goblin innkeeper huffed, his brick-red arms folded across his sunken chest. I was beginning to wonder myself what I'd be able to find for my own supper, let alone anyone who's left with coin. Soen stood in the shadow just inside the open door frame. The contrast made it hard for the goblin to see him from his perch atop a tall stool behind the inn's ledger desk. Soen hung back to observe as Vindus dealt with the creature behind the desk, as well as his own mounting frustration. Good innkeeper, Vindus said after a deep breath, all four of his narrow hands gripping the front edges of the desk as he spoke in controlled tones. For the last time, we are not the Teamsters you are expecting. We do not have any shipment for delivery. Well, then, what good are you? 
The goblin yelled as he leaned his face forward until his hooked nose nearly touched the Chimerian's face. His nasal, high-pitched voice was grating even on Soen's ears. I've got nothing to eat! Sold it all down to the last pickle and then sold the barrel they come in! I'll bet they ate that, too! The Chimerian gripped the desk edge harder. We're not... Um, merchants? I mean... We are merchants, but we're not your merchants. That's not why we're here. We just want to ask you if... So you're merchants, but not merchants when it comes to me, eh? We're travelers. We just want to ask you... No! The goblin innkeeper said emphatically, its brown ears waggling as it shook its head. We are taking on no borders. I appreciate your patronage, but there ain't no tea nor buy left in all of Shella City. Soen stifled a laugh, turning his head away momentarily. Shellis City was what the locals had started calling their collection of huts, lean-tos, and shacks. It was difficult for Soen, who had spent far too much of his life in the broad cobblestone streets and magnificent towers of Ronos itself, to put the image of this random collection of hovels in the same category of city. Not even the glorified mounds behind the village, the whispering hills, were as impressive as their names might sound. The rounded top seemed to rise reluctantly from the plain, lacking sufficient enthusiasm to push to any truly inspiring height. Granted, he mused, they were standing in the finest structure the town had to boast of, the Gobble Inn, but the name itself all too perfectly demonstrated the refinement and taste of the establishment itself. It was both pretentious and tawdry at the same time, too much statuary, and all of it bad reproductions of more elegant and famous pieces. The massive fireplace that took up an entire side of the common room opposite the desk was elaborately carved from stone into the enormous shape of a goblin's head, its gaping mouth forming both the inner hearth and the hood. The stonework, so unnoted, was impressive, carved from a single piece and probably by dwarven craftsmen by the careful and delicate detail work it demonstrated. It was unquestionably an exorbitantly expensive feature, especially considering its remote location from imperial trade. Yet the overall effect of the gaping maw containing the fire was, despite its expensive craftsmanship, in hideously bad taste and completely uninviting. Soen had not yet decided if that was, in fact, the intention of the goblin innkeeper, who seemed not just indifferent to the clientele standing before his desk, but remarkably hostile. Soen smiled to himself, baring his pointed elven teeth. He moved forward. Innkeeper, I beg your pardon, but I have forgotten your name. Soen said, stepping up to the ledger desk. Gubekandres! The goblin answered indignantly. And what business does a longhead have traveling with a bindi anyway? Soen ignored the multiple insults implied in the remark. Master... Gobekandrus, you have found us out. But, Vindus began. Soen turned to the Chimerian. It's no use, Vindus. I told you that this goblin looked far too obtuse and puerile for our scheme to get past him. Scheme? Gobekandrus asked. Vindus turned to face the elf. You're right. He is the very embodiment of puerile. Soen nodded. Uh, not to mention obtuse, and we could have made such a fabulous profit. Profit! The goblin squeaked. The elf and the Chimerian were ignoring him in their conversation, but he was hanging on their every word. What profit? When will the shipments arrive? Soen asked. Oh, Vindus pondered. Um, perhaps tomorrow? That soon? Soen asked with astonishment. Oh, well, that may be a very optimistic expectation. What scheme? Gobicandrus leaped up onto the ledger desk, reached out and grabbed both the elf's cloak and the Chimerian's collar with each of his bony red hands. Soen turned his black, featureless eyes on the goblin. Why, we are merchants, and we have brought goods. We need information to make this scheme work. However... 
We should have realized that you are far too verbose and intractable for us to have fooled you. However, perhaps you would be interested in a business proposition, a sharing of our abilities for our mutual profit. I've already got money, the goblin said, letting loose his grip and drawing back slightly. As one can plainly see, Soen continued, his black eyes shining in the dim light of the common room. It's goods you need, and those are what we have. Hmm. What's your plan? The goblin asked quietly, his red eyes fixed on the elf. We are interested in moving these items quickly. Soen continued. Most of the crates were mistakenly addressed to another destination, and we would just as soon sell the items quickly before anyone makes any kind of trouble over a few mistakes on a cargo manifest. Vindis glanced sideways at Soen, but being a Chimerian, there was no appreciable change in his face. I'm not concerned with where things were supposed to go, the goblin said through a sneer. Just、uh, <laughs> where they end up. Then I think we are in agreement. Soen smiled, his lips pulling back over his sharp teeth. I heard the pilgrims passing through were a good market. Good. Gobakandra smirked. Them pilgrims came through here like one of them plagues. Locusts couldn't have done a better job cleaning out the town. They came up the south road as happy as you please, mantecor singing their songs and what not. And before you knew it, they were streaming through here like a flood, buying up everything that looked remotely like it could be eaten or drunk. Sure, they paid and paid good imperial coin as well as some of those Jakaran trade notes and even a few king's rune slate. From the Goblin Peaks, price them high as you please, and they just kept paying. In the end, none of them town merchants would take coins or notes. It all came down to gems, metals, and the like. Took it all we did. Then what happened? Vindus asked. The Goblin started to laugh. Huh. <laughs> well, then they left. Left. Aye, every last one of them, and took every morsel with them. Gobekandrus roared with mirth. <laughs> the town's full of money, bursting at the seams with it, and you can't buy a loaf of salt bread or a bottle of mulled wine for less than a king's ransom. <laughs> Holding his belly, Gobekandrus rolled onto his back. Soen and Vindus just stared as the hilarity overtook the goblin. <laughs> I can just about buy this city with a crate of apples. <laughs> Elected king for a barrel of wheat. <laughs> exactly, exactly our point, Vindus said, trying to bring the goblin back to the subject. If you can tell us where these pilgrims went, then we'll know where to take our goods for sale to. Ain't no point in that, boys, the goblin said. Wiping his eyes as he stood back up on the ledger desk, <laughs> we already rung them pilgrims out. Sure, you just bring the goods here to my inn, right here, mind you. And within a few days, we'll have more business than even the pilgrims brought us. Soen lifted his head back slightly; the points of his ears itched. What do you mean? The blade of the northern will. Gobekandrus said, as though stating the obvious, "The legions of the Ronas Empire are coming this way. Two or three days at the most." The goblin leaned in, his voice conspiratorial through his smile. "You bring your wagons here to me, and we'll be the only game in Shellis City. The legions will pay far more than those religious fanatics, and in solid imperial coin, I can guarantee that by the time I'm finished with your crates, there'll be no trouble with any manifest. We'll split the take in half. Half," Vindus exclaimed. "I'm taking all the risk." Gobekandra snapped, his eyes narrowing. "All you have to do is count your coin." One tenth," Soen stated. The goblin snarled. Ah, I'd rather sell my inn. If you think they'll buy it, 
but knowing the legions, they would just as soon burn it to the ground. So one answered, Without our goods, you have nothing to sell. <laughs> one in three, the goblin said. One in five, so one responded. And I see that I can still walk right out your door. One in four, Gobikandra said as his eyes narrowed. So one turned to Vendis. You know, I seem to recall a tavern up past that wreck of a smithy. That seemed to be a nice place. Fine! The goblin pushed out his bony hand. One in five it is. Soen smiled. I'm sure you will not live to regret this, Master Gobacandras. Are you certain the pilgrims are well on their way? War is always good for business, but not if you're caught up in the middle of it. Eh, they went up the north road as happy as you please four days ago. At their rate, they're probably crossing the shrouded plain as it is. <laughs> Good a place to die as any, I suppose. Gobicandrus shrugged. So, what do you say? Have we a bargain? You can trust me when I say that the moment our goods arrive, Soen said through his best sharp-toothed smile, we will bring them straight to you. Tian Jakai? Vindis asked, after they had stepped out into the dusty path that passed for the main road through Shellis. What was that about? Soen turned, answering to his adopted name without hesitation. Hesitation always kills you, he thought. Friend Vindis, our new acquaintance and partner, Gobacondrus, has no intention of splitting anything with us. I suspect he would murder us in our sleep once the goods were delivered. If fortunately for us, he will wait until we do deliver the goods. And since there are no goods to deliver, we should be reasonably safe before we leave this ridiculous excuse for a town. But why all the... You want to find the prophet, don't you? Soen said as they walked briskly side by side. I want to find the prophet, too. All I did was to offer him one kind of prophet in exchange for information on where to find the other kind. The Shrouded Plain? A migration that size shouldn't be terribly difficult to track. So that's where we find him? Perhaps, if we're quick enough. Now it seems that the Empire wants to find this prophet as well, and I suspect that since they have sent the legions to do the job, they do not have any expectation of treating him or his followers kindly. If we're going to ask this prophet any questions, we're going to have to find him before the weight of imperial might does so. But the Shrouded Plain, Vindus asked, it's a terrible place. Why would anyone want to cross that? I've got a better question for you. Soen replied as he hefted his pack to his back and shouldered his mundane-looking staff. Why should the Empire send an entire legion to deal with a migration of religious pilgrims. Chapter 13 Panaris Road Shellis Field was not the last town on the North Road, but it certainly was the biggest. The settlement Soen and Vendus encountered as they followed the immigration trail along the western slopes of the Whispering Hills got progressively smaller each barely more than a collection of a few houses huddled in proximity against the wild expanse around them. As they passed by these smaller outlying farms, Soen occasionally saw their goblin residents standing by their doors and watching them with suspicion. They were never threatening, nor did they come any closer to inquire about the passing strangers. At least the trail was an easy one to follow. The wide swath that the immigrants cut both down the old road and to either side of it where possible would have been difficult to miss blindfolded. The smell of oxen droppings ground into the earth was pronounced, a sure sign of manticores on the move. For once, Soen was glad to be on so obvious a course despite the inherent dangers it presented. It meant that he could concentrate on his companion, Vendis. The Chimerian remained irritatingly cheerful, even at his most serious. He was also, unfortunately, a most affable companion on the road. For Soen, who was used to maintaining long silences as he strode the face of the world alone. The constant need to keep up a conversation that Vendus demonstrated was exhausting and demanding. As an Iblisi, 
Few would have dared to approach him in dialogue, and those who did, even in his own order, would have preferred to keep their exchange short. But he wasn't an Iblisi to Vendus, or God's willing anyone else for the unforeseeable future. He was Tien Cha Kai, the wandering merchant of the Pakhtan, in search of some prophet of the north. He was supposed to be interested in the torrent of unending words coming from Vindus as they walked. So on those occasions when Vindus stopped and asked why the elf merchant was so quiet, Soen had learned to respond with something on the order of, Oh, I've just been thinking. To this, Vindus invariably and earnestly replied, Thinking about what? At which point Soen would have to elucidate on whatever subject Vindus had been chatting about. This, of course, would set Vindus off on another line of thought that Soen fervently hoped would occupy his companion for a long stretch of the road. As I've heard from some of the Ephendrians who occasionally make their way through this country, it has something to do with the rock formations at the northern end of the Whispering Hills. You can see them just up there beyond the rise. See how that granite upthrust splits in several places? Well, the wind crosses there pretty much throughout the day and night. And the currents and eddies through those crags make a peculiar sound very much like voices. For a time there were shamans who would camp at the foot of those crags, listening to the voices in the wind and interpreting their words for pilgrims who came to them trying to speak with their dead relatives or loved ones. That all started because of a legend the local goblins had from their ancestors, who first settled here during the Age of Mists before the Shadow War. Have you heard of them? Soen cleared his throat, trying to bring his mind back to the conversation. <clears throat> heard of who? The shamans of the Whispering Hills? No, I don't believe I have, Soen replied. Privately, he wondered if Vendis was now referring to the original shamans, who initiated the cult during the Age of Mist, or the revival shamans, who came to the area during the Age of Fire, and twisted the rituals into a powerful death cult. Or was he referring to the most recent incarnation carried on by the local goblins, who used it as an easy source of money from those few travelers who either by mistake or design came upon them? The history of each was a separate subject tied together only marginally by the legends regarding the winds blowing across the rocks, and none of their histories was particularly interesting. Well, said Vindus after taking a deep breath, there actually were three separate incarnations of the shamans. Soen groaned. Are you feeling all right, Tien? Vindus asked. Yes, I am fine, Soen answered. Something from my lunch did not agree with me. Oh, would you like to stop? No, Soen said emphatically. Walking at least gave him something more to do than just listening to Vindus. The Chimerian appeared to be taken aback by the strength of his refusal. Soen noted with satisfaction that the shadows had lengthened considerably. Soen tempered his voice. No, I'm fine. The walking helps me feel better. We'll soon be stopping for the night. Of course, Vendus said with satisfaction. I recall that there's a good spot just atop the next rise. Hey, where are you going? Soen broke into an easy run, putting some distance between himself and the four-armed Chimerian. Maybe it was the road, he thought, that was playing tricks on his black, featureless eyes. The closer he got, however, the faster he ran. Then abruptly he stopped. The red dirt of the road had been worn away. In its place lay a patch of gray granite stones, each fitted together with such precision that Soen could not have wedged the sharpest blade between them. Soen smiled broadly, exposing his sharp teeth. Vendis ran up behind him. What is it? Soen smiled. It's the Panaris Road. I didn't think it would still be here. This was built early in the Age of Fire and leads directly... Soen stopped talking as his gaze followed the road. Leads directly where? Vindus asked. There, my friend. Soen pointed with his long, narrow finger. Two lone figures sat on the broken stones at the side of the ancient road. One was a human male, who upon seeing Soen scrambled to his feet. He was middle-aged as humans go. A remarkable feat, considering he was wearing an incongruously shiny armor breastplate over his otherwise dull slave's tunic. His exposed head was shaved, as was typical of all slaves. 
He was short and stocky in build, with a great hooked nose and dark piercing eyes that seemed fixed on Soen. He leaned heavily upon a staff with a crystal fixed at the top of its shaft. The other was an elven captain. His long armored helmet gleamed among the blades of grass where he had set it next to him. The captain's pinched face had a long scar that ran from his forehead, past the corner of his right eye, and nearly to his ear. The right eye was a dull graying color, now useless. One of the captain's sandals had also been removed as he sat vigorously rubbing his aching foot. The human spoke first, his eyes fixed on Soen as he approached. <sighs> You've come at last, I see, but you're still behind. Will you ever catch up? The captain gave the human a quick kick with his bare foot, and then groaned from the pain he had caused himself. Braun, shut up! Hunter or prey, Soen thought. Which is which? My apologies for this fool, the captain said to Soen. We found this proxy wandering about the Northlands a few days ago. My tribune seems amused by him, but I don't find him quite so entertaining. No apologies necessary, valiant captain, Soen said with a slight bow. I am Tien Jia Kai of the Pactan. This is Vendis, a merchant trader of these lands. We are all far from Ronas, are we not, captain of the imperial will? We are Tien Jia Kai, the captain acknowledged through a heavy sigh as he gazed around at the open lands around them. I am Captain Sukai of the First Modalis Legion, and I feel as though I have walked every step of the road from Ronas today, but I believe I have walked far enough. The captain nodded toward the north. They had crested the rise at the end of the whispering hills. The broken granite crags stood off to their right, but it was the vista before them that caught their attention. The plain sank down before them as though the thumb of some god had pressed down into the face of the world. There, in the last rays of the setting sun, lay the salmon-colored tops of clouds beneath them in the distance, holding close to the ground in a perpetual fog that extended beyond the northern horizon. But it was the encampment that bordered on the near edge of the fog that held his fixed attention. It was a tremendous collection of tents, wagons, animals, nearly a mile wide where it nestled near the strange and permanent bank of fog. Then we take our leave of you, great captain, Soen replied, for it seems that our remaining road must perforce be one quickly traveled. If that road continues to the north, Sukai chuckled as he went back to rubbing his foot. Then I might suggest a different road entirely. Your counsel is good, Soen replied. We shall divert as soon as possible. Fare you well in the Emperor's grace. And you, the captain answered with a shrug. Soen turned and continued down the road to the north, his eyes fixed on the encampment. Behind him, the proxy called after them in his strange, unhinged voice. <laughs> He isn't there, you know, <laughs> but he will be. Uh, just you wait, uh, he, he will be. Through it all, Vindus had not said a word. It was almost thirty minutes before Vindus found his voice. Who was that back there? You heard him, Soen answered without breaking his stride. He's Captain Sukai of the Modalis Legions out for a stroll with his proxy, Braun. They won't be lonely for long, however. Within a few minutes of that captain getting the ache out of his feet, that same proxy undoubtedly began propagating gatefold symbols all along that ridge. By now, more proxies from the following Centauri have propagated an exponential number of gate symbols. It won't be long before those two hapless servants of the Ronos Empire have been joined by the entire blade of the Northern Will, at least two full legions, almost sixteen thousand warriors. Vindus looked back. I don't see any. It is the perfect position. Soen continued, his gaze fixed forward as he walked with a brisk pace. Deploy the army behind the rise so that it can be hidden from the enemy, and then deploy the command tents along the ridge last so that you can command a proper view of the field of battle. Vendors took several quick steps to catch up to the elf. They mean to attack the encampment. I believe we may have found your fellow pilgrim's friend, Vendus, Soen said in an eager voice. 
but I believe the legions have found them as well. There must be more than ten thousand in that camp, Vindus stammered. Surely they're mostly families, children. Closer to fifteen thousand, I should think. Soen replied. They are at least another three leagues away. Look there, the trailing elements have not yet caught up with the main encampment. You can see the dust still rising behind them, so they are still moving. What does it mean? It means, Soen grinned once more, that we are not stopping until we've reached that camp. Twilight was nearly over by the time they approached the trailing end of the migration. Soen had given considerable thought to their approach. He was not concerned about being a prisoner. Indeed, it was part of his plan to become a prisoner. No, the real difficult part was not being killed in the process of becoming a prisoner. The signs on the trail had clearly indicated that they were following a huge encampment of manticores, lion men of the Chenandrian steppes. They came from a fierce and proud warrior tradition, where the family's status and honor were embodied in the ancestral armor that passed down through generations. Though the elders of the Manticos assembly, the closest the clans ever came to a central government, had surrendered their conquered lands to the greater glory of the Ronos Imperium, they had not surrendered their warrior hearts as well. Several of the clans had left the assembly rather than submit to the elves, and one imperial eye was forever trained on Chenandria, where the fire may have died, but the coals still burned hot in manticore hearts. These manticores had left their ancestral lands and journeyed beyond the boundaries of Chenandria, taking everything they possessed with them into a strange and hostile land beyond the control of the emperor or any respect for an elf. As an Iblisi, he might have walked into such a camp without fear of protecting himself. However, as Tien, a lowly fourth estate merchant wandering about in the night on the edge of their camp, his fate might very well be in question. He held his mate staff in his right hand, but to use it would unequivocally expose his true nature. That would defeat the entire purpose of his journey. Pray or hunter, always the same question. So, um, how do you think we should do this? Vindus asked. Do what? Soen replied casually. They were rapidly getting closer to the massive wagons of the manticores ahead of them, the dust from the eight-foot-tall wheels settling on their robes. Let them know we are here, Vindus said sotto voce. Oh, I wouldn't worry about it, Soen said easily. I'm sure we already have... Will you do me a favor? A favor? Yes, a small favor, really. What? Would you just walk in front of me for a few minutes? Soen said pleasantly. Just until we reach those wagons. Uh, just until? Yes, until we reach those wagons. Vindish shrugged and then took a few quick steps forward. You mean like... Something huge smashed against the Chimerian, driving him forward ten feet and into the back of the wagon with a sickening splat. Soen was already moving. He had felt the movement more than seen it, the thin hairs that circled his elongated head shifting with the air about him. At once he fell flat against the ground. The massive dark form flew over him with a roar of angry disappointment, huge arms clawing at the darkness above him. Any gods who can hear me... Soen muttered, "'Pray this works.' Soen let go his staff, pushing it slightly away from him, even as he felt the pounding feet of the enraged manticore charging toward him. Slowly and deliberately, Soen pulled his knees up under him, but he kept both of his hands flat against the ground, his face down and his eyes averted. Then he held very, very still. He could feel the hot breath of the manticore on the back of his neck. "'Who are you?' roared the manticore, its voice so loud in Soen's ears that he was actually startled. I'm alive, Soen thought. I am a pilgrim, he answered. The manticore laughed. <laughs> An elf pilgrim? Is not one prophet the prophet of all? Soen asked. His face remained turned down, his hands touching the ground before him. Three full breaths from the manticore brushed against the back of Soen's neck before he replied. Oh, perhaps. 
the manticore answered at last. Get up! Soen stood, picking up his staff. Give that to me! The manticore said at once. Soen looked at the manticore. He was mature for his race, but still an able warrior. He wore intricate armor of a very old design. This staff, Soen said carefully, was given me by my grandfather, my father's father, and is the symbol of my family's honor. The manticore snorted loudly. Ha! It is a stick! Yes, but it is my stick and my honor. Soen replied, Honor is found in battle, Longhead! The manticore snarled. I fight a different war. Soen answered, handing the staff to the manticore. Chapter 14 Gran Aur Soen followed after his captor, a manticore who had flatly stated that giving his name to the elf was beneath him, with Vendus at his side. Three more manticore warriors followed a few steps behind them, waiting for their own excuse to pounce on the captives and get a few battle strikes in of their own. The group wound their way into the interior of the encampment, down crowded paths between clusters of tents and wagons. Many of the covered wagons had rigged their canvas to form temporary shelters along the side of the towering wagon boxes. Now these were hastily being taken down and secured once more over the wagon's load. Everywhere Soen looked, there were creatures of many different races rushing in furious activity. The great majority was made up of manticores, but the remarkable thing in this for Soen was that they were in families. Manticores rarely allowed outsiders into their clan prides or even to see their young. Yet here Soen observed them all. Elderly lion men with long, dusty manes stooped next to a fire by a wagon as they gestured in storytelling to a circle of cubs and their manticore mothers, while their fathers readied their wagons to leave. A group of young lion men struggled with a recalcitrant team of oxen, while another group of young manticore women jeered at them from beside their own quickly harnessed team. Manticore males and females rushed to strike their recently made camps, or to move the oxen out of corrals and take them back to their yokes. Not just manticores, however, but other races packed the encampment as well. A considerable number of Chimerians were also here in the camp, as were a not insignificant number of dark-skinned humans, and even a few lighter-skinned humans as well. In several instances, Soen observed these Chimerians and humans working at a furious pace side by side with the manticores, and they often seemed attached to a manticore family camp wagon. Hakaaran gnomes ran everywhere through the camp, stopping here to listen to a story and there to lend a hand, or occasionally bumping into another gnome and chatting furiously before dashing off to some other parts unknown. The paths were occasionally so crowded that it was difficult to tell where a camp ended and the path began. Everyone, however, quickly moved out of the path of the manticore warrior, their eyes fixed on the captives with a mixture of curiosity and suspicion as they passed. Their pace was only impeded by the occasional choke of oxen in the path before them, who were not impressed by either the strange prisoners or the fierce warriors accompanying them. "'Just when were you going to tell me about the ambush?' Vindus asked testily. "'What ambush?' Soen answered. "'That ambush at the edge of the camp!' the one where I ended up with my head smashed against the back of a wagon. Oh, that ambush, Soen said, delight playing about the edges of a smile. You and I need to talk more, Vindus huffed. Look, Soen said, you're a Chimerian. These manticores patrolling the perimeter of the caravan were obviously in the mood to kill us first and then ask who we were later. I needed time before being too dead to manage a proper surrender to the manticores. I knew you could take the blow of their initial charge because... Because I'm a bendy! Vindis bristled at the implied insult in the word. I was going to say that you are more flexible. Soen corrected. Being flexible does not mean that it doesn't hurt. Vindis replied. Or that it doesn't still hurt. Then I am sorry for your pain. Soen answered almost truthfully. 
Nevertheless, manticores prefer to strike first with their claws and fists, claws that would not cut deep enough to do you any lasting harm, and the unusual telescoping bones and pliable sinews of your race would blunt their hammering fists. It takes a great deal to kill your kind, Vendis. Very sharp blades and at the right puncture locations, or a knowledge of the nerve points that can paralyze Chimerians long enough to allow for more permanent options. You sound a little too familiar with the subject, Vindus said. Soen shrugged. We are still alive, and I count that as something of a victory. For now, Vindus grumbled. Yes, for now. The manticore leading them turned to the left, and then right once more. The smells of cooking in the camp were becoming more pronounced, heavily laden with spices that were in turn enticing, exotic, cloying, and occasionally brought tears unbidden to the elf's eyes. Would you look at that? Vindus exclaimed. They were passing a small group of elves. These two had been repacking their camp and were just finishing. These pilgrims don't seem to be very discriminating, Vindus said with sarcasm. I did say I was sorry. So encountered, but his mind was considering the implications. Not only had the encampment included the elves in their camp, but indeed seemed at ease with them living among them. Where are they going? Findus asked quietly as they continued on. Toward the center of the camp, I should think. Soen answered, his mind still on the pilgrim elves. The layout appears to be concentric, even though the paths are maze-like in their design. A good proper defensive structure, actually, so I suspect we're headed for some sort of interrogation. No, Vindus interrupted. I mean, where do you think this camp is headed? They came from the south, so they wouldn't be reversing their direction. Ephendria lies to the east, and I know from personal experience that an incursion of a single outside individual over their border is cause enough for the Chimerians to be outraged, let alone what looks like an entire small nation. If their objective had been the Shadow Coast... Then there are much better and faster routes to the west that they could have taken at several places in their journey. That leaves north, the shrouded plain. That's no choice at all. It's said to be blanketed by a haunted fog more than a hundred leagues across, a place where ancient spirits continue to wander and exist only to lead others to their doom. Cheerful prospect. Soen chuckled darkly. So, where are they going? The crush of the encampment suddenly gave way to a large circular clearing, surrounded entirely by manticore warriors in full armor. In the center, nearly one hundred meters from the edge of the clearing, was a large multi-chambered tent. Soen grinned. I suspect we're about to get the answer to your question. The tent was not the most opulent that Soen had ever seen. Indeed, even by most Manticorean standards, it was modest and a little austere. There were the usual compartments, small rooms all arranged around the large central gathering room, but they were few in number, and all of them had their partitions pulled back so that the elf could see the contents of each. A sleeping chamber with the expected ground mat and tubular pillows, a small dining table built low after the Manticorean custom of lounging on pillows for formal meals, and an ablutions chamber common to every household in Chenandria. Curiously missing was the deity shrine that universally graced every Manticorean household. Their Manticorean captor had preceded them into the tent, and now stood in the center of the gathering room facing them. Gran R will arrive shortly. You will kneel when he enters the room. You will speak only when he gives his permission for you to do so. You will answer his questions when they are asked, and keep your own questions to yourself. Ah, stand where you are, and I will inform him that you are here. Do not move. Do as I have instructed you, and you may yet live to see the stars again. Vindis cast a sidelong glance at the elf. Well, Tien, what's our next move? My understanding is that we're to make no move at all. Soen replied, his eyes fixed straight ahead. What kind of an elf are you? Vindus snarled. You let me take a hit from behind so that you can properly surrender. Several legions of the elven army are about to display the displeasure of the emperor in a most emphatic way against mostly the old, the infirm, and the helpless. 
and now you just want to stand here and wait? What happened to the defiant spirit of the elves that led them to conquer the world? It's hard to conquer anything when you're dead. So an observed, victory always consists of letting someone else die for their cause. Vendis cast a baleful eye on Soen. You're still here, aren't you? Soen replied. Besides, if we're going to find this prophet you keep telling me about, who better to point the way than the leader of these pilgrims? Vendis sighed. <sighs> Do you always have to be right? No, but I always am. Soen grinned to himself. He thought he also heard a low chuckle from one of the three manticore guards still standing behind them. The sound of the tent flap being pulled aside caused both Soen and Vindus to straighten slightly. They felt more than heard the movement behind them before the large, stooped figure of a manticore shuffled around them, with two young manticores assisting him on either side. The mane of the elder manticore was almost entirely gray, cascading back from the crown of his head down the back of the great ceremonial mantle that he wore. In his hoary left hand he clutched a tall, intricately carved staff, the top of which was fashioned into a clawed hand gripping a fractured crystal globe. The ancient manticore squinted at the elf and the chimerian from a face filled with the deep folds of age and partially covered by a long gray beard that had been carefully braided just below his chin and fell nearly to the center of his chest. Under the critical gaze of the old manticore, Soen quickly remembered the instructions he had been given. He knelt down to the ground on one knee, followed quickly by his Chimerian companion. The wizened manticore kept staring at them, even as he continued his shuffling walk toward the back of the tent, both manticores at his side in constant attendance. Soen watched and waited. The old manticore disappeared into the back sleeping chamber of the tent. The two manticores assisting him closed the flap behind them, shutting them off from all eyes in the central chamber. A moment passed, during which no one spoke or moved. Soen sighed. Well, I suppose our interrogation is over. The quiet was broken by a resounding, deep bellowing sound that shook the tent poles behind them. Soen turned instinctively toward the resonant sound. It came from a younger manticore wearing a plain tunic, leggings, and a cloth robe. There was genuine amusement in his eyes, and perhaps a bit more, Soen thought, as he quickly examined the creature. He had the broad manticorean face, though his mane was perhaps a bit short for his apparent age. This he kept pulled back tightly away from his face and bound in the back. I can see you have met Grodek. The young manticore said through a broad smile of his fanged teeth. He's my captain of the evening watch. He's very good at his job, but I think he takes me a bit too seriously sometimes. The manticore strode around in front of the kneeling elf and Chimerian, extending both of his broad, strong hands. Come, get up. Let us talk quickly, for you are late arriving and there is much to be done. Late? Soen asked taking the manticore's offered huge hand, his own smaller hand nearly disappearing in its grasp as the manticore effortlessly pulled the two of them to their feet. You were expecting us? Of course. The manticore flashed another beaming smile. We've been tracking you for several hours. I wanted to just bring you in, but Grodek was concerned and suspicious. Of course, his job is to be concerned and suspicious, so I can hardly fault him. Unfortunately, you arrived just ahead of a much bigger problem, which I must address very shortly. I hope to have a much longer discussion with you both later, but there simply is not time to interview you now. For the time being, what are your names? The manticore's breezy manner had taken Soen by surprise. The Lion Man race was little known for its humor, and it had often been said that they had practiced being dour until it was a fine art among them. I am Tian Jakai, a merchant of the Fourth Estate and the Order of Pakhtan. A merchant who travels without goods, the manticore observed as he turned toward the Chimerian. And you? I am simply known as Vindis, sir, the Chimerian answered awkwardly. The manticore nodded. Ah, uh, well, 
I am Gron Aur, the leader of these combined clan prides on our pilgrimage into the land of the Chosen One. You are the leader? Soen asked, his voice rising in astonishment. But I thought the old one. <laughs> no, Gron Aur said, a smile playing about his fangs as he spoke. That is one of the clan elders. He is in need of some rest before we set out again, and I offered him my tent. It will not be a long rest, sadly, for our time is already short. Gron turned to one of the guards. Agrawl, please remove Vindus and keep him company outside while I speak with the elf alone. I'll call for him when it is his turn. Vindus barely had time to raise one of his forearms in protest before the powerful Hegrawl grabbed him and dragged him swiftly out through the tent flap. You can hardly blame them for being suspicious, Gron R said with a deep sigh. He turned back to gaze at Soen. Ah, tell me then, Tian Jakai, why does an elf come seeking so carefully the company of pilgrims? Soen looked into the bright eyes of the manticore and saw something familiar in them. Because I, too, am a pilgrim, Gran Ar. Indeed. And what do you seek, Tien Jakai? A man of prophecy. A man named Drakus. Mm. It seems all the world is seeking Drakus. The manticore answered, his manner turning suddenly thoughtful. And perhaps we shall find him together then, Tien of the Pakdan. But first, we must survive your brethren. The legions? Soen asked. Already assembled to the south and moving. I had hoped they would wait to attack in daylight, but that is not our fate. Granar nodded. The order has already been given to break the camp. Our warriors are arrayed at the rear to cover our flight. Flight? Soen exclaimed. May I ask to where? The only place the gods have granted us, Granar replied. You come at a strange time, Tien of the Pakdan. Do you believe in this Drakus that the prophecies foretold? Soen felt uncomfortable under the manticore's gaze. I do not know, Granar. I only know that I seek him and must find him. That is the truth of it. As close to the truth of it as I might speak. So one thought. The manticore smiled and nodded his great head, his eyes fixed on Soen for a few long moments as the lion man thought before speaking again. Mm. You shall join with us, Tien. We shall seek him together. Gronar said with some conviction. He snapped his fingers loudly. Hegrol appeared instantly, his large hand on the grip of the sword at his waist. Take Tien to find Captain Grodek. I believe he is holding a walking stick that was confiscated during Tien's introduction to our camp. Have him kindly return it to our fellow traveler. Yes, Master Granor, Hegral said in a snapping voice that was a little too loud. Thank you, Soen said, bowing graciously to Granor. That stick means a lot to me. Granor bowed in return. Oh, so Captain Grodek has informed me. Several minutes had slowly passed since Hegrol and his elven charge had left Granar with the Chimerian prisoner. During all that time, each had watched the other with interest, but neither had spoken a word. At last, Granar spoke. Is he the one, Vindis? I believe so, Master, Vindis replied with casual ease. That he is or was an inquisitor of the Iblisi is certain, given that Mate staff he tries so hard to conceal. There are a number of their order who are scouring the North March, Vestasia, and the Shadow Coast right now, but I feel certain that we have the one. Soen Chienre, Gran R murmured, an inquisitor who appears to be out of favor with his own order. Appearances can be deceiving, Master. Vindus said, folding the upper set of his arms across his chest while placing the lower set of hands on his hips. Why do you let him so near you? There's an old saying among my people, the manticore said. 
Hold your enemies closer than your friends. You still do not know why he is seeking Dracus, then? No, master, Vindus answered. I wonder if he does himself. Chapter 15 Battle Lines Grodek! Soen yelled as he followed on the heels of the Manticorean warrior. Where is my staff? I have more important duties than finding your stick for you. Grodek roared back as he stormed down the line of Manticore warriors arrayed in a battle formation beyond the southern end of the encampment. So enraged inside, he could think of a dozen ways to kill the Manticorean warmaster on the spot, with or without his Mate staff, and had certainly done so to others with less provocation. Killing Grodek meant disrupting the chain of command for these warriors at a critical time, and Soen just could not bring himself to make a bad situation worse simply for his own satisfaction. Not, he noted, that it would make much difference. Grodek continued yelling at the warriors arrayed in front of him. Maintain the line! They'll come at you quickly out of their magical gates! You've got to get to them before they can form up! Then charge when you see the chance! Soen shook his head. It was a classic Manticorean battle structure that had been passed down from generation to generation for the last thousand years and bent in more recent times to address the specific challenges presented by the difference in elven warfare doctrines. It was also why the Legion of Ronos had won every battle against the Manticores in the last two hundred years. Do you even have a clan, Grodek? Soen suddenly demanded as he continued to follow on the Manticores' heels. Have a clan! Grodek turned suddenly, baring his fangs as his eyes narrowed on the elf. I am a warrior of Clan Hravash, you insignificant longhead! Who were your parents? Soen held both hands up, palms facing away from the manticore. My apologies, War Master Grodek. The manticore snarled and then turned once more to stalking the line of warriors. Soen quickly looked around. Night had fallen, but he knew that would not stop the legions any more than the antiquated battle traditions of the manticores. He could see that there were elements of the camp that had started to move, incredibly, toward the cursed mists of the shrouded plain. But it was like watching a river break up at the end of winter. The wagons and pilgrims closer to the battle line had to wait until the bulk of the camp in front of them started moving before they could move themselves. The edges of the encampment were over a hundred yards from the battle line, but that distance would be nothing for the legions to cross once they smelled the blood of unarmed prey. Nothing among the pilgrims was happening quickly enough. Then Soen saw what he was looking for, the battle standard of Clan Hravash. By tradition, such a standard flew in every battle the Manticore clans fought, and usually above the clan house that commanded the battle line. That it now flew above a handcart did not diminish its significance to the manticores. Soen ran across the open space toward the rear of the pilgrim company still waiting to move forward. He could see hundreds of faces glancing backward toward him, uncertain and afraid. It did not distract him from his purpose. He quickly closed with the battle standard and the cart next to it, sliding slightly on the prairie grass beneath his feet as he came to a stop. Grodek would not have trusted an item of honor to anyone else once he had given his word. Manticore battle traditions dictated that all his possessions be held in his home during battle and were considered sacrosanct in any conflict. But when a manticore no longer had a home, his possessions would be kept. Soen suddenly stopped tossing Grodek's life possessions on the ground and smiled. His mate staff filled his hands with familiar warmth. A sudden shout, and instantly the air filled with a roaring cacophony of sounds. The legions were on the march toward the Manticore battle line and were within a thousand yards. Many in the first lines were impress warriors, but elven warriors were backing them up. The Blade of the Northern Will was a Modalis legion and preferred to use their own warriors in battle in combination with impress warriors of the Six Estate Slaves. Soen quickly ran back toward where he could see Grodek once again yelling instructions at his warriors. The elf's mind spun the words in his mind, conjuring the power building in his mate staff. He could only trust that the darkness would help him. 
Grodek had pulled out his signal horn, a small curving instrument with which the manticores issued their signals on the field of battle. The former Inquisitor stopped behind the manticore commander and felt the release of the energy from both his body and the staff, the rush of power through him. It was a momentary ecstasy, and he felt the customary emotional and physical drain when it was done. He glanced once behind him, and satisfied, spoke loud enough for as many of the manticores grimly arrayed before him to hear. Grodek, the encampment! Soen shouted. They've moved to the west. Grodek spun around, the horn already raised. Ah, now what are you? They've shifted along the front of the fog, Soen said, pointing with his staff and hoping that the Manticorean warrior would not notice that he had retrieved his own staff from the bottom of Grodek's cart. The manticore's jaw dropped open. The entire camp had somehow shifted behind him. "'Your battle lines,' Soen said, pointing once more toward the warriors. "'You'll be out of position. The clans will be undefended.' Grodek shouted at once, "'Warriors of the clans! Rise up! Charge right! Protect the clans!' Grodek put the horn to his lips and sounded a series of thunderous blasts. Answering blasts resounded all down the battle line. The Manticorean stood up in confusion. The signal was not the one they were expecting. They were trained warriors, though so unrealized, many of them were still very young. They too now could see that their wives, children, brothers, sisters, their clans, had all inexplicably moved from behind the protection of the carefully placed battle lines and were now so far to the west that they could no longer be protected. Charge right! Grodek bellowed, then sounded the signal again for the line to shift. Charge right! The line answered, and they began to run across the line of march from the approaching elven legions. Soen crouched down in the grass, his black eyes gazing with fixed intensity on the approaching line of the legions. The magic he had conjured bent what little light there was from the stars above, making the image of the fleeing pilgrim company appear much farther to the west than its actual position. Shifting the battle lines to protect the false company was meant to draw the legions away from the real refugees. Take it, Soen muttered toward the approaching legions through his sharp, clenched teeth. Take it. The front lines of the legions wavered for a moment, and then started marching toward their right. Soen smiled. He could not see the refugees behind him as his own spell prevented it, but he could see the image of them off to the west. They were starting to move at last toward the fog. Still, not quickly enough. Grodek's horn sounded again, this time with the signal every manticore warrior on the line expected. The manticores began their charge just as Soen arrived. The legions were within fifty yards of their lines— the lion men surged forward as a tide, tearing over the ground with their battle roars resounding, their blades cutting the air as they ran. Soen gritted his sharp teeth. He knew what was coming, but he also knew that he could never have prevented it, never have convinced Grodek of the truth. He charged forward with them, struggling to keep up with the great lion men in their onward rush. The manticore slammed into the front lines of the legions, smashing the impress warriors and dealing death to them in horrific numbers. The Impress warriors, who had no memory of ever losing a battle, because their elven masters had erased any such memories from their minds, suddenly panicked, broke ranks and ran, trusting that the elven warriors behind them would cover their retreat. The elves were not there. Unnoticed by either the charging manticores intent on their prey, or by their own Impress warriors on the front line, the elven warriors had quietly retreated back through the gatefolds another hundred yards, there they had not formed a line, but were arrayed in octia clusters around the folds, as though prepared to retreat through them again. Forward! Grodek bellowed over the sounds of death. Forward! Encouraged by their success, the manticores continued their charge in pursuit of the remaining impress warriors, running them down and continuing their charge toward what looked to them like the disorganized line of elven warriors ahead of them. Soen kept glancing backward, dreading what was to follow, and desperately trying to reach the still-charging Grodek, who remained yards ahead of him on the battle line. Forgotten were the proxies, 
most of whom had died in the initial charge. They had come forward with the impress warrior line, and had, as instructed, inscribed the gatefold sigils at the farthest point of advance. The gatefolds flashed once more, and several centauri of the elven army emerged from the gates that had suddenly opened behind the Manticorean line. No Manticore warrior stood between them and the fleeing refugees. The elves charged at once toward the unprotected wagons, intent on inflicting as much death as possible. Grodek heard the folds open behind him. He turned as Soen reached him, the manticore's face filled with horror. More centauri of the legion were folding in all around them. The battle line was dissolving into chaos. Run! Soen yelled at Grodek. Sound the retreat! Grodek's eyes remained fixed on the wagons. A massacre was but heartbeats away. Grodek! Soen screamed. Charge to the north! Grodek's eyes suddenly focused. He pulled his horn to his lips and sounded the signal. The manticore line had collapsed into chaotic melees. Groups of manticores fought elven warriors in a mass of confusion. Manticore blood flowed thick across the ground as the elven warrior's superior training was evident in their systematic and long-practiced slaughter. The sound of Grodek's horn was still answered from up and down the battlefield with repeating sound, though far fewer in number than had answered before. Within moments, every manticore on the field of battle attempted to disengage from the enemy and charged northward toward the unrelenting, menacing fog. The threatened pilgrim caravan suddenly vanished. The illusion dissipated. The confused elves, seeing their prey evaporate instantly before their eyes, were momentarily uncertain, but the tribunes conducting the battle from the ridge three leagues to the south acted quickly. The elven centauri quickly folded away back to their original battle formations to regroup and determine what had gone wrong. Soen ran with Grodek toward where the illusory caravans had existed only moments before. The elven folds were collapsing around them. The screams of the wounded manticores and elves behind them echoed in their ears, as did the sounds of the pounding feet of the remaining elven centauri, who were now chasing after the retreating manticores. Soen ran into the fog and kept running, directly into its chill, smothering embrace. Chapter 16 Silent as the Grave Soen slowed his pace when he was nearly a mile into the mists. The ground was flattening out and seemed to be descending slightly beneath his feet. Normally this would have allowed him to quicken his pace, but nothing about his surroundings struck him as normal. Elves naturally have keen sight and hearing, abilities which had been honed fine by Soen in his role as an inquisitor of the Iblisi. But his senses appeared to be failing him in this strange blanketing mist. He could hear the sounds of those around him, usually muted, but occasionally sharp and nearby, yet he could not discern their direction or precise distance. The elves also had a limited ability to see heat during the cool of night, but this utterly failed him now. All he was left with was a strange blue-green glow that was everywhere in the mists and increasing with each step. So one wondered idly if the glow was always here or was created by the passage of living creatures through it. It was entirely speculation on his part, but the mental exercise helped keep him focused despite the haze all around him. The enormous shape of a manticore shadowed the fog before him. So one slowed even more, his mate staff held at the ready. The former Inquisitor gritted his sharp teeth in preparation for battle. The shadow emerged before him in the aqua-green glow. It was a pillar of stone. Soen let out his breath and ruefully shook his head. Looking for me, came a voice sounding clearly in his right ear. Soen spun into a defensive stance, his staff clearing the space around him, leveled to launch a deadly array of powerful magic. A figure was retreating from him slowly into the glowing mists. So when narrowed his lids over his featureless black eyes and frowned, it was about the size of an elf or human, and moved like it could have been either. He made a mental effort to relax his grip on the staff and began pacing the figure through the fog, trying to get a better look at it as he moved across flat ground covered in anemic yellowed grass. He tried to close with it gradually. While he felt he was getting closer, his prey somehow continued to elude him. 
There was a building emerging from the mists ahead of them toward which the figure was walking. It was a tall, circular structure, set atop a round foundation of shallow steps. Fluted columns supported a domed roof overhead. It was a typical structure of the old kingdoms, so unrealized, the frivolous sort of a building they used to call a folly. It was ornamental, lovely in its architecture, and completely out of place. There was something about it that was both purposeful and useless all at once. The figure stopped halfway up the steps and turned, pulling back the hood covering her head and obscuring her face. <sighs> Chetre! Soen breathed in a mixture of apprehension and admiration. How nice of you to remember me, the ancient female elf said, smiling back at him in the glowing mists. You've been looking for me behind you since you left me your message on the throne of the Jakaran, and now you have found me at last. More accurately, you have found me. So an answered, though his lowered mate staff never wavered. But why come yourself? Killing was never a pleasure to you when it was done by your own hand. You always preferred to enjoy it as a spectator. Why bother to come yourself? Come inside, Selwyn. Chidre smiled, her cadaverous face pulled back in a ghoulish grin. Everything will be made right. Everything will be explained. Soen raised his narrow, pointed chin slightly. I think I would like to get this explanation right here. Thank you all the same. Nonsense, my boy, the keeper said with a sharp-toothed grin. Come on up here and see for yourself. The answers are all right inside. I'd rather find my own answers. Soen replied. The wispy hairs at the back of his elongated head were twitching. Something was wrong here. You're looking for something that doesn't exist, Tadre said, her smile falling slightly. Don't be foolish, boy. Tadre turned away to step inside the folly. Soen released the charge in his mate staff. A white bolt shot from the end, encapsulating Tredre and suspending her in time. The Inquisitor did not want to harm the Keeper. He needed her alive if he was ever to get back into the graces of his order. She was the most powerful member of the Iblisi, and Soen knew better than to equate her age with weakness. It had cost him dearly in the drain of the remaining charge in his staff, but he knew he had only one chance— that Chidre had turned her back on him at all, making his attack possible, was an unusually rare mistake for her, and Soen had not hesitated to take advantage of it. He rushed up the steps of the folly toward the glowing spheroid of temporal stasis, stopping short of the top stairs. The mystical globe, surrounded with silent lightning, was empty. Impossible, Soen uttered. Come in, Soen, called the voice from within the folly. Soen peered between the pillars. There was nothing but darkness within. I'm waiting for you. Soen turned and ran with all his speed down the stairs and across the plain through the glowing mists. Many shadows appeared in front of him, and he remembered that he had directed the entire column of refugee pilgrims into the mists. Perhaps he had found them gathering together and trying to make their way as a group. In any event... They would provide cover for him against the pursuit of Chidre or any Iblisi whom she'd, no doubt, brought with her. He barreled in among the figures, rushing by their shadows in the fog. They were not moving. Soen quickly stopped, examining them more closely. They were stone carvings, statues, all arrayed on the plain facing in the same direction. It was an army rendered out of rock. Some held swords with the short, broad blades of the Empress warriors. Many were human, though the majority were either manticores or chimerians. More striking still, Soen realized that they were all different, carved in the shape of individuals. In fact, some of their faces looked quite familiar. Soen blinked. He was staring into the face of a statue that was an uncanny likeness of the human he had met only the day before on the Panaris Road. The figure's arms were outstretched, and his face was upturned in a strange, rapturous grin. Soen struggled for a moment to recall his name. Braun, he thought. He moved quickly past the figures, heading in the direction they were facing, 
subconsciously following their silent intention. There was the Tremerian Vendis, his face turned away, unlike any of those around him, his four hands held up before him as if to ward something off. As he broke through the front ranks of the stone army, Soen saw statues of a manticore and a dwarf standing in front of the motionless ranks behind them facing across a river. Beyond the stone manticore waited the folly. Soen drew in a breath. He was sure that he had kept a straight line in his dash away from the isolated structure, and yet here it was again, the same in every detail. "'Looking for me,' came a different voice from behind him. Soen wheeled around and suddenly stopped the arch of his staff before it connected with the man standing there. More in anger than astonishment, the elven inquisitor exclaimed, "'You!' "'I've been waiting for you,' said Dracus. The human didn't look much different from the way Soen had seen him last, fleeing in the ship of the Forgotten. His dark hair was roughly cut, and his beard was untrimmed and wild. The dark brown eyes were unmistakable, as was his stocky build. More particular was the shape of his ear, a unique feature among humans, and for members of the Iblisi profession, the surest way to differentiate humans from each other. He still wore his tattered slave's tunic, but had managed to pick up pieces of leather armor along the way. None of it matched, of course, but it would serve better than no armor at all. Dracus deftly held the hilt of a sword casually in his hand, seemingly more out of habit than as a threat. "'I have been looking for you,' Soen replied. "'You've caused a lot of trouble in the world and no small inconvenience to me personally. And yet we both seem to be the prey at the moment, don't we?' Dracus said with a sigh. Ah, I think we can help each other. We can start with who they are, Soen said, nodding toward the statues whose ranks faded beyond Dracus into the glowing green mists around them. Dracus looked over his shoulder. Them? They are the future, Soen. They are what is coming. The future, <laughs> Soen said with a nervous laugh. Then they are not coming very fast. Faster than you think, friend. Dracus said as he walked past the Inquisitor and started toward the folly. I can show you your future, Soen. It's just in there. You Iblisi are all concerned with keeping the truth, the guardians of truth. Or is that the barriers of the truth? I've never quite understood the difference. Follow me, and I'll show you a truth no living soul has ever known. Soen started to walk after Dracus. How is it possible that I, an inquisitor of the Iblisi, should find myself over a thousand leagues from the Lyceum Halls of Ronos, and stumble through a blind fog to find the one human in all the North March that I want to find? That Dracus should have changed so little, and look exactly as I expected? You haven't changed at all, have you, Dracus? Soen asked casually. <laughs> you would be surprised at how much, Dracus said. You'll see as soon as we're inside. How good of you to remember my name. Soen spoke quietly. Without warning, Soen swung his mate staff. The sound of it tore the air with speed and strength, aimed precisely at the base of the human's neck. Soen nearly fell off balance as the staff passed unhindered through the neck of Dracus, ripping through the air on the other side. Yet in the instant of contact, a bone-chilling cold rushed up the length of the staff, shooting into Soen's fingers, running up his arms and driving frigid pain into his beating heart. The Inquisitor stumbled slightly, recovering as the staff continued its powerful arc and nearly carried him over with it. "'Been looking for me?' Dracus turned around, facing Soen, but this time the dark eyes of the human were empty space." The apparition of Dracus grinned. We've been looking for you. Soen ran past the folly, away from the stone army, leaving all of it to fall behind him. He found a river with an ancient broken bridge and followed its banks to what he thought was the north. The river led him to the folly. Soen turned at a right angle to the river, pushing his way through a thicket of dead trees in the thick green glow of the mists. He came too quickly upon a precipice, fell over its edge, and tumbled down the slope, sliding at last to a stop. He pushed himself painfully to his feet. The folly stood before him, 
a mist-shrouded squat tower ahead of him in the green glowing fog. Three shadowy figures were moving toward him out of the fog. Kinsei, Fang, and Chukung, all fellow members of the Iblisi Order, and all of whom Soa knew for a fact to have died. Chukung's face was disfigured as he had last seen him, including the great gash across his windpipe that Soan had cut for him. They shifted around to surround him, their own Mate staffs leveled at him, urging him toward the folly. Soan bared his teeth. A deep, resounding shock wave rolled across the plain, followed at once by a white, diffuse point of light in the fog to Soan's right. The dead Iblisi around Soan turned in shock toward the new searing light. A second, deafening sound rolled over them as the fog was driven back, burned away by the light. The specters surrounding Soan keened horribly, their shrill voices in agony as their shapes collapsed into dust in the sudden wind. On a rise over the plain, the single figure of a manticore stood. The light shone from the tip of the sword he held high over his head. Already figures were emerging from the fog, held at bay by the light of the sword, and gathering around the manticore. Men, women, children of humans, manticores, chimarians, and others, many having even managed to keep control of their wagons and beasts, thronged toward the lone manticore at the top of the rise. So in turn, and walked toward the light. Chapter 17 Nothing But the Truth Sujay Shurion was offended by the rain. He normally enjoyed a good downpour in Ronas Chas. It allowed him to be even more secluded than usual as he passed down the streets of the great city, and he enjoyed having the streets largely to himself. Ronas Chas was, he reflected, much more impressive without all the elves clogging the streets and spoiling his view. The rain washed down the streets, giving them a gloss under the leaden skies overhead. He preferred the softer light of the cloud-shrouded rainfall to the starker, glaring illumination of clear skies. But today he found the weather an affront, because it had been so ordered at the Emperor's whim. The Imperator of all Ronas was melancholy, and High Priest Wajon Ray of the Myrdan Dai had inferred at court that this should mean that all of Ronas Chos should weep with him, including the sky. It irritated the Sinekai of the Modalis that the beloved rain should fall simply because of the imperial whim. Sajay's booted footfalls splashed down the length of the narrow Via Chiampasi, turning to his right at the intersecting Via Torakia, which opened almost at once onto the Paz Vitragen, the Plaza of the Unexpressed. A column of polished stone rose from the center of the ornate fountain, soaring nearly a hundred and fifty feet above the cobblestones and capped by a statue of Ron, flanked by smaller statues of Moneris, the goddess of silent contemplation, and Anje, the god of seeing the unseen and hearing the unspoken truth. Fitting, Sajay thought, as he crossed the wide plaza toward the myriad buildings comprising the ministries to the southwest, that these should watch over the plaza of the unexpressed. Keeping the truth unspoken was the watchword of all Ronas Chas and contemplation in silence was the only way one could keep from quietly vanishing, both from memory and existence within the imperial city. Sujay drew his thick cloak tighter about him against the rain as he quickened his steps toward the Via Ronas. He had little time to make his appointment with the one woman in all the empire with whom he could never afford to be late. It could not have been helped as the news he had received required verification before he could risk even mentioning the subject to his host— and his confirmations had only come to his ears minutes before. Now, having been confirmed, this meeting was not only inevitable, but also critical. Sajay Shurion quickly moved down the wide avenue of the Via Ronas and across the God's Bridge, the rain drawing a veil around him as he crossed the island toward the old keep of the Iblisi. "'I, dear Sajay, how kind of you to call!' Sujay smiled, mentally arming himself for the cut and thrust of the verbal engagement. Both of them knew that kindness had nothing to do with his presence in the Iblisi stronghold. It was most gracious of you to agree to see me, Keeper, especially on such short notice. Your time is precious and not lightly granted. 
I only regret that this weather prevents us from meeting in more comfortable surroundings. Chidre pulled her lips even farther back into what should have passed for a smile, but seemed more a hideous grin. Chidre Tsi Aru'un, keeper of the Iblisi, sat on her throne in her wide hall with the low ceiling beneath the courtyard of the old keep. She was an ancient-looking elven female, the skin of her face so tight that her sharp teeth seemed to hold a perpetually cadaverous smile. She stooped forward on her throne, gripping her mate staff as though it alone was keeping her from falling to the floor. Sajay noted, however, that her black eyes were still shining, and that she was not leaning on the staff nearly as hard as she would have him believe. As to her regretting the weather, Sajay would not have put it past her to have arranged it. You need not be troubled, Keeper. Indeed, it is my concern for you and your honorable order that brings me here today. Chidre blinked. Sajay was being direct, and the Keeper was uncomfortable on such open ground. Indeed. Your concern must be urgent to bring the Janitor Omris of the Order of Vash to me in such haste. Perhaps it has something to do with your cousin's daughter? Sajay braced himself, but it was too late. Hers is a sad tale, is it not? Chidre bowed her head slightly. Returned from the western provinces, her family and honor lost. The makings of an epic, were it not so tragic? Though I suspect that epic it will become in its telling, should a few unpleasant details be omitted. Sajay kept silent, refusing to give his adversary the satisfaction of an acknowledged hit. Parry and riposte, then parry again, until the opportunity to strike presents itself. Turn the opponent's advantage to your own. He bided his time, offering up the truth to the keeper of truth, until the time was ripe for the lie to be told. There is no point in denying it to you, keeper. It is partially on her behalf that I have come. Sajay said, This girl, Shabin, Chidre said with quiet confidence. You may use her name here where everything is known. Not everything, Sajay thought. At least I fervently hope not everything. Already he sensed he had given away too much. He had confirmed Chidre's suspicions about Shabin and their relationship. That knowledge could go badly for him in the wrong ears. Still, Sajay knew in this game that one should always use the truth until the lie was absolutely necessary. As you wish, Keeper. Shabin Timuran of the House of Timuran is, indeed, the daughter of my unfortunate fool of a cousin. It has become a matter of honor in my house that we find the one who so terribly wronged her and bring him before imperial justice. Yes, yes, yes. Chidre waved her hand dismissively. This slave named Dracus who has fled to the north, and I suppose you wish for the Iblisi to find this runaway slave for you? No, Mistress Keeper. Chidre moved as if to speak, and then paused for a moment. You do not wish us to find this slave Dracus? No, Mistress, Sajay replied. We have already done so. He is forming an army of rebellion in the northern provinces, and the legions have been dispatched to deal with the problem. That is not why I have come before the keeper of all the Iblisi. Chidre frowned. What has happened that would occasion this humble keeper of the truth to be of service to you? Sajay clasped his hands behind his back. I come with strange news, keeper, and would hope that your wisdom would guide me. All the knowledge of the Iblisi is at your disposal, Chidre lied. What news brings you here? News of a battle, Keeper, Sajay replied. A battle most gloriously won beyond the North March folds, north of a place known there as the Whispering Hills, against this same army of rebellion. The Shrouded Plain, Chidre said. It is on the Ephindrian frontier, if I am not mistaken. You are most learned of all elves, Keeper, Sir Jay replied. 
and you have come to tell me you are troubled by this great and glorious victory against the enemy of your house? Chidre said, impatience coloring her words. I have come to report that the victory was not as complete as the commanders in the field have reported to the imperial throne. Sajay responded, The Blade of the Northern Will Legions were in pursuit of this Dracus rebellion. A large force of rebellious manticores and chimerians fleeing northward out of northern steppes. They all believe in some nonsense about this slave being a human legend, though I can make little of it. Indeed, Chidre answered, her smile having somehow managed to lessen slightly. A human legend, you say? It is of no consequence, Sajay said, smiling inwardly. I am more interested in the reports that, after our warriors engaged these rebels on the very edge of this shrouded plain, they fled into the mists, and our forces were unable to either find or pursue them. Contact with this large group of dangerous rebels has been temporarily lost. Another lie. Sajay knew exactly where they were, which was why he had come. An unfortunate result. Chidre agreed, leaning back slightly. Sajay realized she was feeling uncomfortable being forced to stoop over on her chair. Chidre wanted to straighten up against the back of the throne, but could not do so while Sajay remained, or risk giving up her pretense of being feeble. Word had reached our ears of such a battle, but we are sorry to hear that the outcome has not been as complete as we had previously heard. I regret that I am unlearned in the arts of war, Ginatar Omri Sijay, and feel ill-equipped as to how I might advise you on matters of martial conflict. On the contrary, Keeper, you can be of great assistance to me, Sijay replied with a nod of his head. The details of the final moments of this battle have only recently been made known to me. It seems that while our armies were on the verge of a complete victory— one individual changed the complexion of the field of battle and allowed the rebels to escape. Chidre stiffened on her throne. A single person, you say? Yes, an elf. Chidre ran her long tongue over her thin lips. And what, may I ask, did this singular elf do? She does know him, Sir Jay thought a thrill of triumph running through him. That leaves only one question to be answered. The details have not yet reached us, and the reports we have are vague at best. But we believe that he used aether magics to create a diversion. Some reports even say that this elf held office among the Iblisi. That is not possible, Chidre responded decisively. No, I know where all my children are to be found. Chidre replied again with a forced smile. This elf, whoever he is, is not one of my order. I am pleased to hear it. Sajay replied with a slight bow. I suspect these reports are of an impostor on the frontier, who has lied about his importance at the expense of the honor of your esteemed order. Such an impostor must not be tolerated. Chidre replied. The honor of my house is challenged. It is our fervent hope that your legions crush this impostor's corpse beneath their boots, as well as all those who have sided with him in his rebellion. Sir Jay nodded. The moment had come for him to tell the lie he had hoped to tell. Then I am pleased to report that your honor is vouched safe. This impostor is already dead. Chidre held perfectly still. Dead? Yes, my field commanders report that this elf who made possible the escape was killed before he himself escaped, Sir Jay said, clasping his hands in front of him and shaking his head. The reports are, as I said, still incomplete, but I have been told that his body remained on the field. I am somewhat interested in this impostor, Chidre said with carefully crafted apathy. Perhaps I could spare a few of my own inquisitors and assessia in recovering the body and determining this impostor's origins. I would gladly offer whatever assistance I could to—which was my purpose in coming, Sir Jay said, opening his hands. 
I am as concerned about this impostor as you are, Keeper. But the legions themselves are still in pursuit of these rebel forces, and determining the disposition of one corpse from among the thousands on a battlefield would be a disservice to the imperial will. Nevertheless, I assure you that I have made inquiries, and should be able to report to you a proper location within the next two or three weeks. But if you could send some of your own inquisitors to discover the body and retrieve it, then your generosity would serve us both in the imperial will. The lie. The elf in question was Soen, as they both well knew, and was anything but an impostor. Chidre would never take his word for it that Soen was dead, but she might consider the possibility enough to divert those who were looking for the living Soen to search a battlefield for a dead one. There were enough elven dead on the verge of the shrouded plain to keep them occupied for some time. Sajay just hoped it was enough to buy him time to find Soen first as his armies pressed northward along the shadow coast. It was only a matter of time before he caught up with Soen, and Soen would lead him to Dracus, if he could keep the Iblisi looking in the wrong place. Chidre drew in a deep breath. Then this impostor is certainly dead. Yes, and may the gods grant your Iblisi their favor in finding him. Chapter 18 the Ambeth. The sun was low on the horizon when Ishander steered their boats to the outside bank of a curve in the river. There a stone carving jutted out from the surrounding ferns overhanging the river. The youth braced his feet wide on the platform at the back of the boat and reached up with his bladed staff, catching the carving. The boat swung around with the current, but Ishander stood fast. Urulani, seeing what the young native was doing, moved to the back of the boat and reached up to catch the stone as well. The second boat passed Dracus, Ethus, and the Lyric, swinging with a bit more violence as its tether went slack and then suddenly tightened once more, pulling the bow sharply around against the current. "'Are we there?' Urulani asked the young man. "'No,' Ishander answered. "'We wait.' "'Wait for what?' Ethus asked, but the boy gave no answer." Time passed as slowly as the river drifting past them. Dracus had long since exhausted speculation and was never very good at small talk. The boy kept his staff lodged against the stone, holding them in this position, shifting only occasionally to keep his balance. The sun was nearly setting by the time he spoke again. "'We have been welcomed by the clan,' Ishander announced. "'You may let go of the stone, lady.' Urulani raised her eyebrow slightly. Dracus could not be certain whether she was surprised or affronted by the remark, but she let go of her hold, her dark arms falling to her sides, shaking them to relieve the aching. "'Did you see any signal?' Dracus whispered to Ethis. "'No,' the Chimerian answered quietly. "'But not seeing one does not mean there was none. We must be close.' The boats drifted around the bend, running down a straight section of the river that moved swiftly before slowing again as it turned to their left. "'You are the guests of our clan mother, Adelai El.' Ishander spoke without preamble. His voice was overly loud and carried a stiff, pompous quality. "'As guests you shall enjoy the privileges of our great city and the protection of its fortress walls. If you are to remain our guests, you will acknowledge the law of the Ambath clan as your own.' Our customs will be your customs, and our justice your justice. Do you submit to the will of the clan? I do, Mala answered at once. And I submit myself even more than she does, piped in the lyric. Might I ask a question? Ethis said as he raised one of his four hands. Ishander looked momentarily troubled, as though someone had sung a wrong note in the expected melody of his song. You... A question? Yes, Ethis continued. What if we don't want to submit our will to the clan? Ishander blinked. What if you... What? I mean, we don't know what the clan expects of us or what its rules are or whether we're breaking them or not. Ethis continued. So what if we don't agree to this will of the clan? Urulani turned to cast a look of gentle warning in the direction of the Chimerian. 
Ishander stuttered for a moment before recovering, indignation blossoming in his features. Well, you, you would, you would be horribly executed as cowards and enemies of the clan. Oh, well then, Ethis said with an exaggerated shrug. I guess we do submit to the will of the clan. What about the short one? Ishander asked, pointing his pinky finger at the second boat. Mala reached under the covering tarpaulin at once and raised Jugar's limp hand. So does the dwarf. We all do, Aishanda, Urulani said, her dark eyes fixed on the young man. But will you teach us the ways of your people? We do not wish to offend your clan mother. The young man smiled. Of course, I am a forerunner, and I know the ways of many places and peoples, but I have never met anyone like you. Were you a clan mother where you come from? Something like that, Urulani said. I was the captain of a ship, like you. Only my ship was larger and held all my clan. The boy's eyes grew wide with wonder, but he managed to recover his composure and regain his studied stoic expression. You gave your speech very well, Aishanda, Ethis said. Is giving that speech also part of the clan's law? Yes. Ishander answered. We far-runners must learn it before we may leave our clan's strongholds. It is to be given to all those the far-runners bring from the outside into our city. And how often have you given this speech yourself? Dracus asked. The boy glanced at Dracus and then fixed his eyes back on the river. Once? And that was to us, Dracus continued. Ishander ignored the remark launching once again into his recitation. Tremble before the wonder that is Ambeth, clan hold of the Ambeth people, and symbol of its might and glory. Look upon our wondrous works, and despair. Dracus turned to look forward where the river again twisted, this time to the right, and caught his first sight of Ambeth. His first thought was that the young man was making fun of him. Ah, Ethis said from behind him, so this is what has become of the mighty human empires of the north. As they came to the bend in the river, Ambeth appeared not so much a fortress as a stockade. Vertical logs had been driven into the ground to form a defensive wall. An attempt had been made to keep the jungle cleared outside the wall, far enough from the stockade, so that its defenders might see trouble coming before it was upon them. But the jungle was uncooperatively encroaching on the space. There were stockade towers erected on either side of the river and at intervals down the wall, but these were barely twenty feet tall, not even as tall as the Sabatria wall that had surrounded House Timuron and that had been considered only for show. Dracus craned his head, trying to see beyond the gap in the wall where the river ran between two of the watchtowers, and was dismayed. Ambeth was a little more than a collection of low, thatched-roof huts scattered over a spit of land that formed a long, slow curve in the river. Here and there among the huts, the crumbling walls of what may have been a former settlement jutted upward in jagged defiance toward the sky, but were generally ignored by the surrounding architecture of the hovels. There was a keep of sorts, a second stockade wall atop the rise looking over the river that surrounded a single tower. Even that structure was a sad one, cobbled around the remains of a former stone tower, now patched together with wood framing. As they passed slowly between the watchtowers, Dracus took in the totality of the village of which Ishander had so generously boasted. On their right, the stockade wall ran a short distance up from the shore and then angled back toward the river at a watchtower. There, barely past the river's edge, the stockade wall abruptly ended as though the river would protect the village and further extension was not required. To his left, the land rose gently from the river, creating a shallow beach toward which Ishander steered them. There were many boats on the beach and small homes beyond. Smoke rose from numerous chimneys and hung in a layer just above the village, turning blue and gray in the deepening sunset. His warrior mind instantly conceived of a dozen different plans by which he could overwhelm the defenses of this village— the place where they staked their survival. But it was the sound at last that attracted his attention. The sound of children laughing. Human children. Dracus stared in wonder at the beach ahead of them. 
from the hovels and the homes, the dirt streets and alleyways, the broken ruins and the thick bushes and plants they came. Humans, young, old, men, women, warriors and artisans, they came toward the beach. The wonders he had seen, Dracus realized. The ruins of greatness and power that they had witnessed in Pythar were the legacy of these people. Their ancestors had built these ruins. They had been a great people, a people who had challenged the Ronos Empire itself. One question kept nagging at him as they pushed toward the shore and the line of guards quickly gathering there. What happened that they should have fallen so far? All kneel before the clan mother of Ambath! thundered the broad-shouldered human who stood a full head taller than Dracus. Dracus had been considering what it might take for him to disarm the warrior, and on reflection believed he could do it. Still, it would not be proper to insult the only hosts they knew within a thousand leagues who could supply them with food and water. Dracus knelt along with Ethus and Urulani. Mala and the Lyric were behind them. The dwarf had, for good or ill, regained consciousness, and lay again on his makeshift litter, struggling to sit up. "'Where are we?' Jugar demanded. Dracus pushed him back, flat on the litter. "'We're in Ambeth. Hold still.' "'Ambeth!' the dwarf responded with a quizzical look on his face. "'Where, or what, is an Ambeth?' Dracus pushed Jugar back, flat, once again. "'Hold still and listen. Then perhaps we can all find out.' The keep of Ambeth was, as Dracus first believed, little more than a shored-up repair of a tower that had existed here long before Clan Ambeth claimed it as their own. A lodge hall had been added to the original broken foundation that joined with the tower walls. The tower itself had framing around it. Dracus was uncertain as to whether the ancient tower walls were holding up the framing or the other way around. Dracus and his companions had all been marched up from the shore through the town and directly across a wide square into the large room attached to the tower. The flanking soldiers did not seem interested in conversation, although the streets were lined with the curious townspeople, all of whom were gawking, laughing, pointing, and chattering with each other as though the newcomers were exotic animals on their way to the forum for a match. The soldiers had positioned them in front of a large fire pit near the center of the lodge with the tower base on the far side. A figure emerged from the shadows at the base of the tower. It was a woman of uncertain age. There were lines at the corners of her eyes, but her skin and her cheeks were otherwise smooth, as was her high forehead. Her hair was long and cascaded down around her shoulders, but there were streaks of gray in the rich black strands. Her eyes were a striking violet, bright and intense. She had a wide, generous mouth, although one of her front teeth was slightly crooked. She wore a long robe whose colors were indistinct and faded, while around her neck hung an eclectic assortment of so much different jewelry that Dracus wondered how she was managing to hold it all upright. "'I am Odlai Al, clan mother of old Ambeth,' the woman intoned in a deep, rich voice. She looked up toward the sky and brought her palms together in front of her. "'Half the strangers accepted our ways.' The strangers have accepted the ways of the Ambeth clan mother, Ishander said, his voice breaking slightly in his enthusiasm. The clan mother raised her hands high above her head and spoke toward the ceiling. Then the protection and hospitality of the Ambeth shall be with our guests, and the loss of the clan shall be their loss until the fall of the sky. The Ambeth are one, shouted the warriors in the hall followed closely by Ishander. The clan mother then lowered her hands and looked at Dracus. Suddenly, she smiled and winked, then started clapping her hands together in glee. Odlai El ran quickly around the fire pit and clasped Urulani by both hands, helping her to her feet. She moved among them, reaching down and helping them up as she chattered along. Oh, this is too marvelous to have you here with us, really it is. To think of it, outsiders who have come to us from foreign lands and bringing knowledge of places that we have only considered in our dreams. I cannot tell you how excited I am personally to see you. Anything I can do for you, anything at all, I'll do it if it is within my power to make it happen. 
I can only assume that you are on a great mission of some importance, for we have heard of stirrings among the dragons of the Surgani Mountains, and that danger is passing northward through the land, bringing change to the world. Draca stood as she took his hands. Clan Mother, uh, we are only... Great people of destiny, you may bring the salvation of our people at last. Restore the greatness of our land, and challenge the treachery of all dragons that was our doom. Odalai El said, smiling into Dracus's face. You honor us by coming to our clan. There is always profit to be had in change, you know. All one needs to know is how. Dracus was stunned. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, we... How soon will you be leaving? Odalai El concluded through her charming smile. Book One Rogues Chapter One Dragon Raid The throats of a thousand dragons answered the call. Dracus took several steps back from the towering statue, awestruck by the shapes rising from the craggy peaks beyond. He glanced back at the statue, the craning neck with the ridge of scales curving down to the horn-spiked head with blade-like long teeth onto the ancient marble base, the enormous stone wings rising straight up over a hundred feet, and the gigantic claws gripping the glowing crystal globes. His gaze jumped back to the mountaintops and the shadows pulling their way closer to him through the evening sky. Dragons. Real dragons. Even from this distance of several leagues, he could make out some details of the enormous monsters, their great wings sweeping forward and scooping the air down and back with every stroke. The sound of their shrieking calls rolled down the mountainside and shook the wide pedestal on which he stood, carrying away with it every other sensation. It encompassed him, shot through him, and drowned out everything else. Somewhere nearby, the muffled voice of Urulani shouted through the noise, calling her men to gather closer around the statue and ready their weapons. What were their names? He vaguely wondered. The dwarf, he knew, was also shouting nearby, but his voice sounded more distant than the dragon calls, and his movements seemed slow. Ethis was pulling at the dwarf, dragging him back onto the pedestal and closer to the fold, the magical portal sphere of radiant blue light that had opened at the base of the statue. Beyond the portal fold and through its shining blue haze, he could see a land of dense foliage and distant towers, but it seemed so very far away. Mala lay sobbing hysterically at his feet, Mala, his Mala, the Mala who had betrayed them all because Dracus had heard the song of these dragons and brought them here. Dracus grabbed her arm, yanking her to her feet. The muffled, confused sounds filling his ears suddenly cleared, and he was at once keenly aware of his surroundings. He had been a warrior not so many months ago, even if that lifetime now seemed like the distant past. His training acted for him. He reached for his sword, pulling it from its scabbard and finding comfort in the sound of the steel blade as it cleared the leather. Urolani! Get everyone back to the ship! Dracus shouted. We can't outrun that! Kendai yelled. It's coming here! Dracus snapped. It's coming for me! I'll stay here, cut back and forth through the fold, and keep them at bay until you can get to the ship and think of some way to get me out of this! I'm staying! Ethis said. We'll take them together! growled the dwarf. Urulani opened her mouth, but Dracus spoke first. You have to get the rest out of here, Dracus said in the firm voice of command that he had heard so often before from his commanders, and which he, in turn, learned to use on those under his leadership. It was a voice that carried its own authority. You're the captain. You're the only one who can. Take Mala, the Lyric, and your crew and get help. Urulani gritted her teeth and then turned to her men. You three! You and Quare bring the lyric! I've got the princess! We're going back to the Sadron! Now! Kindai, Jono, Gantau, and Lucrasse did not require another word. All four bolted from the platform, following their footprints back across the sands. So are you glad you came along, princess? Urulani said, grabbing the arm of the auburn-haired woman, pulling her away from Dracus. The harder she pulled, however the more firmly Mala gripped Dracus as though he were her only jetsam in a sea of fear. Urulani, after considerable effort, managed to pull her free. Let's go! No! Mala screamed, 
her hands shaking as her head and eyes began darting about. The monsters are out there! They've come from my dreams! They've come from my soul! We don't have time for this! Dracus barked, his eyes fixed on the dark shapes wheeling above them in the sky. You heard the man, princess! Mala shoved Urulani backward with a mindless animal roar. The captain quickly recovered her footing. Fair warning, Urulani said, as she pulled back her arm and smacked a quick fist across Mala's cheek. Mala, however, did not drop. She staggered backward several steps before her eyes went wide, and then Mala erupted into a fury. With a ferocity and speed that shocked Dracus, she clawed suddenly at Urulani's face. Just as suddenly, the lyric pulled her arms free of Quare and Yithri, leaping on Urulani's back. By the gods! Dracus shouted reaching over to try and pull the lyric from the captain's back. Get them out of here! Kanta! Bloody red streaks opened up along Urulani's midnight skin. Get back here! Lend a hand! Kanta slid to a stop in the sand, turned and rushed back to the platform. By the look on his face, Dracus knew the man was afraid, but obeyed. Dracus managed to pull the lyric off of Urulani's back. He pushed Mala behind him, but she was still sobbing and as afraid of the portal as of the approaching dragons. She pushed back against him from behind. Dracus struggled to keep his footing on the slippery marble. Good luck, princess, Urulani said. Men of Sandow, let's get out of here. It's too late, they're already here, Dracus bellowed. Ethis, you and Juga watch the sides and each other's backs. Urulani, get what's left of your men to form up with our backs to the fold. The plan's still good. We'll drop back through the fold if we need to and hold on the other side until your men bring help. What kind of help do you think they can bring against that? Urulani asked, pointing to the sky. Three of the great shadows in the deepening evening sky were ahead of the rest, their shrieking cries seeming to cut directly through Dracus's ears. When do we fire? Quare asked, but there was a strange quiver in his voice. The song returned to Dracus's head like a thundering chorus of a thousand voices. Back to the homeland of fallen dreams. Is this the prophet returned, wandering so long, wandering so strong? Wait, I... what? Draca stammered. Do we fire? Quarry repeated. No, we wait, Urulani replied. What? Yithri yelped. That's no welcoming party, lass, Jugar growled. So you want to fire arrows into that? Urulani pointed as the first of the dragons banked above the sands, its enormous leathery wings held tight against the air through which it rushed. Sweat was breaking out on her brow. Do you see the scales? Do you really think we can do any damage to it at this range? We have to wait until it is closer. I think it's already too close, Ethis shouted. We've got to retreat through the portal. No! Jugar yelled over the tumult of voices around him. We don't know where the fold leads. It could be a thousand leagues from... What does it matter where it leads? Ethis shouted back. How can it possibly be worse than this? Dracus barely heard the words around him. The song filled his mind and thoughts. Come to the claw and the forehand. Come to the land of the dead. Come, quiet stealing. Come to the healing. Mollus screamed. The dragon had turned above the sands, pulling at the air so hard that the dunes beneath it exploded upward in billowing sunset clouds of sand. In an instant, the enormous, gaping jaws, with razor-sharp fangs nearly as tall as Dracus, were closing on the platform. The fifty-foot wings of the beast struck down and forward, slowing the monster in mid-flight just short of the platform, the sudden hurricane gust knocking Dracus back two steps. The dragon's great left foreclaws extended down toward him. It was the eyes that caught his attention, Dracus realized in the last moment. Slit pupils and a terrible yellow color, yet focused, determined, alert, intelligent. Dracus reached forward with his left hand, transfixed by the eye of the dragon. The sound of crashing metal brought him out of his stupor. Urulani, Gantau, and Yithri had all charged forward. Their swords and weapons clashed against the open claws, slashing at the leathery flesh of the dragon's palm, which soon welled up with blood. Beyond the dragon, Kendai, 
DiGiorno and Lucrasi had drawn their swords, uncertain how to attack the creature. Kindai! Urulani yelled over the ringing blows as the dragon drew in a great gasping breath. Get back to the ship! Get help! The dragon's cry was deafening, causing everyone on the marble platform to involuntarily raise their hands to their ears. The dragon pulled back, landing with a resounding boom on its hind legs as it clawed at the air in pain and outrage. Its tail whipped frantically about, crashing through one of the statue's claws. Rubble from the broken leg of the statue flew across the platform, slamming into Gantau's chest and smashing him against stone at the back of the platform statue. Two more dragons landed with such force around the statue that the platform shook, knocking Dracus and all of his companions completely off their feet. Gantau lay unmoving in a growing pool of blood. Do you think we could leave now? Ethis shouted. Out! Dracus screamed as he grabbed Mala's arm once more. Everybody out through the fold! Dracus got his feet under him just as the dragon's head once more thrust down in his direction. He pushed Mala through the glowing sphere and prepared to jump after her. Something connected at his back, rushing him toward the sphere. His hands were pushed backward with a sudden rush, and he could feel the smooth, hard, and wet surface behind him. The dragon's fang. The dragon had lunged at him, but misjudged his prey. The massive head was pushing him through the portal, rushing through it with him. Draca saw the glow of the fold rush past him, and he was suddenly surrounded by the broken stones of a ruined plaza, and an impression of the astonished faces of his companions. Just as suddenly, the rushing sensation stopped, and he tumbled forward, rolling across the broken stones of the ruined plaza that cut at his arms and legs. The final impact with the ground forced the air from his lungs, and he struggled to stand up. The sight before him was not to be believed. The ancient plaza was illuminated both by the twilight sky above and by the quavering glow of the fold portal. The ruins of the plaza itself had been all but completely reclaimed by the dense, lush growth all around it, shadows illuminated by the fold as the day was ending. The only remaining feature that might have had any recognizable function from a more civilized time was a short altar near the glowing portal, a pair of crumbling low walls along the edges and several broken columns. But there was no time to consider this vision. Out of the soft radiance of the portal sphere the head and neck of the dragon protruded. The horns of the beast were thrashing back and forth, its jaws snapping at Urulani as she tried desperately to avoid its deadly maw, horns, and the raw power of its attack, while striking blows against it at the same time. Jugar was urging the lyric into the jungle despite her protests. Ethis had also drawn both of his weapons and was attempting to distract the creature. This resulted in one of the dragon's horns connecting with his chest and flinging him with such force into a tree that he seemed to nearly be wrapped backward around its trunk. By the gods! Dracus muttered as he sucked in air and adjusted the grip on his sword. How are we supposed to deal with that? Dracus charged the front of the head, then dodged to the side, trying to strike, but the dragon reacted swiftly, knocking Yithri into his path. They tumbled into each other, ending up on their backs, desperately scrambling to get up again. He had barely found his footing when he was forced to leap suddenly to his right to avoid one of the many spiked scales protruding from the monstrous snout. There was a strong smell of sulfur in the air that struck Dracus as out of place, but he had no time to think about it. Yithri! Quare! Urulani shouted. Steal from the right! My right or the dragon's right! Yithri yelled back. You're right, you stupid! Watch out! The dragon was fast. Faster than Dracus would have thought possible in a monster its size. Yithri had just leaped toward the beast, his axe raised over his head, when the maw of the beast snapped in his direction. Yithri's scream was quickly choked off as the massive, razor-sharp fangs and teeth plunged through his body. The dragon's head jerked back in distaste, rising up high above the plaza as it pulled in a great breath through its flaring nostrils. Take cover! Jugar yelled just before diving behind the remains of a pillar at the edge of the plaza. Dracus caught a glimpse of Mala standing, shaking in front of a low wall. He leaped, catching her shoulders and pushing her backward over the broken stones. Dracus felt the blistering heat against his back and saw the flash in his peripheral vision. He could not help himself. He had to look. The dragon was spewing fire from its upturned maw, 
a churning conflagration that exploded through the entire large plaza with roiling flames. The center was a brilliant blue color, a place hotter than Dracus had ever known. The strange trees, brush, and foliage encroaching on the far side of the plaza erupted into flame, their own heat adding to the conflagration. What remained of Yithri lay across the plaza, the stench of burning flesh filling the air. Proud are the dragons who hear the call, come at the sound of the song. Why come attacking, in discourse lacking? Dracus stood up. Mala sat quivering, her knees drawn up to her chest and her back against the wall. Dracus! She whimpered. Stay with... Dracus stepped over the wall, his sword swinging loose at his side as he walked directly toward the creature. The eyes of the dragon fixed on him, its spike-crowned head turning at his approach. Dracus was barely aware of Ethus, the four-armed Chimerian, running across the plaza toward him with the dwarf Jugar at his heels. The song in Dracus's head was overwhelming. Come is the brother of ancient day. Come to the land he once lost. Why come in anger? Who was the traitor? The dragon's flame choked off and its eyes focused on Dracus. The head flashed downward. The fold vanished. The neck and head of the dragon crashed down onto the shattering stones of the ancient plaza, blood rushing from the cleanly severed neck. Dracus stood still, blinking at the sudden change of events. The thunderous song in his head had suddenly vanished, leaving him disoriented in the sudden silence of his mind. He glanced uncertainly at his blade. Help! Dracus looked around. Help me out! It was the dragon. The dragon was speaking a good deal like Jugar. Dracus walked toward the dragon's head. The eye that had so enthralled him had gone dull now that the creature's life had fled. Juga? Dracus asked. Get this beastie off me! The dwarf yelled. The lower jaws of the dragon lay across the legs of the dwarf, pinning him against the fitted stones of the plaza, with the rest of his body unfortunately now situated in what had once been the mouth of the mammoth creature. Dracus examined him for a few moments. This is awkward. Awkward! Jugar yelled, his face purple with rage. I think the damned monster has broken my leg! Dracus looked around, still feeling dazed. Urulani was picking herself up off the stones as Quare rose to his feet uncertainly. Quare, give me a hand here. We've got to free the dwarf. Ethis came to stand next to Dracus. You're right, Dracus asked in flat tones. Yes, I'll be fine, the Chimerian replied, although I'm not certain for how long. We had better find some shelter, defensible shelter, and soon. We've already run out of daylight, and I suspect this will not be friendly territory in the night. That should keep anything too curious at bay for a while. Dracus nodded over toward the still raging fire in the forest at the northern end of the plaza. And the smoke will attract them in the morning, Ethis replied. I don't suppose you know the way back to the ship? Dracus asked, though he already suspected the answer. Ethis actually chuckled as he looked around. <laughs> no. The dwarf was right about one thing. That portal could have taken us a thousand leagues in any direction. Jugar might have better luck with knowing where we are by morning. Dwarves seem to have an innate talent for that sort of thing. But if you're asking my opinion, I believe we're lost in a land of legend, and a dangerous one at that. You're all the crew I have left to me. Urulani looked at Quarry. Stay close. Chapter 19 Dark Wells The dwarf rolled beneath a particularly dense fern and held perfectly still despite the pain shooting up his leg. Mardosh staggered as he came up the dirt path the locals grandly called Jurusta Road. Mardosh was his clan law escort, a warrior stooge assigned to him by the ever loving clan mother to go with him wherever he went in Ambeth and assist him with advice regarding what was permitted under clan law. This apparently also extended to who he could talk to, what he could talk about, and which parts of the town he was allowed to visit. 
Jugar had no doubts that Mardosh's duties also extended to reporting to the clan mother fully about all the locations he visited and the details of every conversation he had. The fact that everyone in their group was assigned a clan law escort when they left their quarters in the keep only deepened the dwarf's suspicions. They were captives in a prison without locks. Worse for Jugar was the loss of the heart of air. The very thought that he had lost the stone both sickened and enraged him. Without it, he was largely powerless, almost bereft of magic. The stone had been drawing upon Dunea, the soul at the heart of the world, absorbing its power from the surrounding stone. Jugar had hoped to use some of that air to heal his leg, though he had not decided whether to tell his companions about the mending. He rather enjoyed being hauled around by these humans, but then the stone was stolen by that Ishander whelp before he could magically mend the leg. He could feel it calling to him somewhere nearby, and he was desperate to get it back. But first, he had to find it. Jugar's frustrations were soon alleviated, however, when he discovered that he could easily outlast Mardosh in any drinking contest, and that Mardosh was more than willing to let him try. So each afternoon, Jugar would grab his crutch, slowly and painfully lead his escort down Tyra Road to a ramshackle tavern at the intersection with Elusia Road, and invite the hulking warrior to join him in a drink or two, or three, or however many were required. Then, when the time was right, the dwarf would slip out of the back of the tavern and make his way through the back alleys and narrow gaps between the shacks that comprised the town. His leg was still a problem, but far better healed than he led on to anyone. He soon discovered that he could make good time up the roads, and that most of the locals were indifferent to his passage, so long as he avoided the notice of the occasional warrior, who seemed more interested in keeping order in the town than conducting warfare, he could move about freely. Then, after a few hours, the dwarf would dutifully find Mardosh, often exactly where he had left him, and convince him that they had been together this entire time. Then the dwarf promised not to tell his masters about Mardosh passing out. But today, Jugar had been impatient, and Mardosh was trying to follow him, although his escort had a hard time catching Jugar as he made his hobbling dash up Elusia Road and onto Jurusta Road. As if these human fools knew anything about building a proper road, let alone who Jurusta, their own ancient goddess of spring, passion, and art, even was, Jugar thought, as he lay beneath the fern. To them it was just another name for the wandering breaks between the thatch-roofed hovels, packed in some cases wall against wall, in the tight space of the stockade enclosure. These may have once been true roads, Jugar knew, by the few patches of fitted stone roadway that remained, and perhaps these names that had passed down the generations once had meaning to the inhabitants of this place. But the great buildings had all fallen, and all that remained of the footfalls that once trod these spaces with such purpose were meaningless names of forgotten gods. Jugar watched as Mardosh, bleary-eyed, stood uncertainly on the road looking back and forth, and finding it impossible to make up what remained of his mind regarding a direction to take. Jugar decided to make up his escort's mind for him by pulling himself farther back into the brush and moving between the huts away from the road. He stood up slowly, picking up the carved stick he used for a crutch. He still favored the leg, and it gave him considerable pain, which the crutch alleviated most of the time. He could move quickly on it when occasion called for it, but a slower pace was more comfortable. He had decided to explore the north side of the town and try to discover where this Ishander made his home and get back his stone. Jugar scowled as he pushed through the thick fronds of dense undergrowth. All these plants! He was a dwarf of the mountain and of stone. Plants in their place were fine, but he found their touch unnerving in this climate, wet and slimy. He caught a glimpse of one of the watchtowers through the leaves overhead, and decided that it was as good a direction to take as any. He was losing sight of the thatched buildings around him when the jungle opened up onto the broken stones of a circular courtyard. One curved wall remained standing, supported by three pillars on the far side, sheltering the statue of one of the human goddesses. The broken bases of several more pillars were set about the courtyard, while the debris from the structure's collapse jutted out beyond the perimeter from the surrounding thick undergrowth. Jugar took all this in, but pushed it aside as his mind fixed on the object around which the stones of the courtyard were symmetrically arranged. It was an aether well. 
And yet, it was not, Jugar thought, as he examined it from beyond the rim of broken cobblestones. The stone was shaped like an aether well, but the material in it was a smoky gray color, dark and with unusual striations in the crystal structure. The stone jutted upward out of the ground, as Jugar had seen in the aether wells of the elves, but the shape of the stone itself was different, more of a jewel-faceted dome than a dagger driven into the face of the world. Jugar glanced around. The palm leaves of the trees rustled overhead with an afternoon breeze, but the courtyard was still. Tentatively, the dwarf placed his crutch onto the smooth stones, hopped once to stand on them, and then carefully made his way forward. Jugar had studied the magic of air and aether with a fanaticism fueled by desperation. Air was the magic of the dwarves, the fairies, the dryads, the sirens, the goblins, the merfolk, and the pixies. It was the magic of nature that welled up from the soul of the world, flowing and connecting all creation. It was natural and blessed by the gods. Aether was the magic of the enemy of nature. It was the magic of humans, of Chimerians, and worst of all, of the elves. Aether drove crystal blades into the world and bled the air from it, sucking it from the wound and distilling it into focused power that was terrible and precise. That was the purpose of the wells, to extract and refine the natural power of air into the potent magic of Aether. Jugar had studied Aether magic as one would study the moves of an opponent before battle, trying to know the enemy better than the enemy knew himself. He knew the lattice structure of the crystals used for the Aether Wells, the nature of their linkage to other wells, the loss of power over distance, and the dissipation rates of their charged devices over time. Contrary to what he had told the others, he knew a great deal about the use of Aether Magic and the complexities of activating it. The best he had mastered related to the heart of air, but that was because he was so familiar with the stone and its properties. His anger, after they had passed through the portal when the dragons attacked, had stemmed not from any lack of ability on his part, but because the portal had been powered from the dragon's side. Perhaps it was some energy seeping into the south of God's home range from the elven wells in Nordesia. All he knew was that there was no power on their side to activate the portal. It had angered and puzzled him at the time, but with his leg broken and beasties threatening, there was no opportunity to look into the matter. But he was a dwarf. He knew stone, and now he had the time. Jugar moved carefully across the courtyard and slowly knelt before the human aether well. The stone was covered in part by a layer of dust, sticks, and dead fronds fallen from the jungle canopy overhead. The depths of the stone looked dark to him. Jugar reached out with his hand to brush the debris from the well. His hand touched the stone. Jugar suddenly drew his hand back as though the stone itself were white-hot. His bushy eyebrows rose in astonishment. Carefully, he opened his hand and placed it cautiously upon the stone. A great gap-toothed smile slowly spread across the face of the dwarf. "'Oh, my beauty!' Jugar whispered, and he looked at the statue of the goddess against the shattered wall. I was so wrong. So you found an aether well? Ururlani shrugged irritably. I wouldn't be surprised if they were buried every hundred feet or so in this place. It would do you more credit if you broadened the scope of your understanding, Jugar sniffed. It isn't that I found an aether well. It's what the aether well told me that is important. So... Now the Aether Well is speaking to you? The lyric asked in breathless fascination. Dracus rolled his eyes. He had spent most of the day with the clan mother, listening to her blather on about the greatness of her people. How glad she was that they were granting their hospitality to such gallant strangers, all the while hinting at how happy everyone would be after Dracus led his companions beyond the stockade wall. Now their escorts had once again deposited them in their exclusive guest quarters, which it turned out were in the cellars beneath the keep. There were individual cells with cots and straw in them that might have passed for a dungeon, except that the town did not have enough iron to afford the fashioning of bars. Mala lay back on her cot while the lyric leaned against one corner of the room, humming to herself until her interest had been piqued. 
Everyone else had gathered around the dwarf in the open space in the middle of the cellar. Thank you, Litaria, Urlani said to the lyric before turning to Dracus. Do you know what the dwarf is talking about? No, Dracus sighed, rubbing the weariness from his face. <sighs> but I've learned mostly to let him keep talking, and eventually it seems to make sense. I am honored indeed that our good friend Draker should allow me to continue without interruption, for I assure you, the dwarf continued enthusiastically, that everyone here will profit greatly by their attention. Just when is he supposed to start making sense? Ethus asked Dracus. I shall use small words and illustrations for those who are challenged in the lingual arts. The dwarf frowned as he spoke. He knelt down on the packed dirt floor, pulling several stones out of the pocket of his vest and quickly setting them on the ground, arranging one large stone in the center and several smaller stones quickly around it. Gripping a small, sharp stone in his wide hand, Jugar pressed the edge of the stone into the dirt and drew lines from the outer stones toward the central stone. Think of these as elven aether wells, Jugar instructed. All of these wells are driven into the world, spikes that pull at the soul of the world. Soul of the world? Dracus asked, scratching his head. Jugar scowled. Air, the power of natural magic that binds creation and the world together. Dracus squinted and frowned. <sighs> Think of it as uh, wheat or grains or, or fruit, Jugar said. Things that feed you that come from the ground. Dracus nodded. These outside stones represent aether wells. Jugar continued with exaggerated patience. Think of these as a still for making ale. A dwarven metaphor, if ever there was one, Ethus observed. Mm. These wells draw the power of natural magic out of the world, like taking the grains or fruits and putting them into a still. It transforms the mash in the still into ale. The ale is a good deal more potent and has a more powerful effect on you than just chewing on the grains or the fruit, as I am sure you have experienced so many times in your life that its effects are apparently permanent. You've made your point, Ethis said. The Aether Wells transform the air drawn from the world into Aether, which is the basis of elven magic. Yes, but here is where I have discovered something that I had not previously supposed, Jugar said excitedly. He pointed down toward the outer stones, flicking his hand from each toward the middle. The Aether Wells provided only a small part of their refined Aether power to the households of the frontier. Most of the Aether they produced was directed inward through the connections between their wells to the center of the Empire, to Ronas Chos. Think of it! The power of an entire continent being drawn inward to satisfy the magic center of the Imperial Throne! It is what has kept the Empire in control down these dark centuries. The ability to deal with problems on its frontier from the powerful center outward. So what have you discovered that changes any of that? Ethis demanded. We had always supposed that the elves had patterned their magic on the human system of Aether. Jugar said, shaking his head. But I touched the stone of that well today a well of the fallen human ancients, and discovered that it works backward to the elven system. Backward? Urulani exclaimed. In what way? The stone was designed only to emanate and deliver power, not to gather it, Jugar said. The lattice structure within the crystal was specifically arranged to prevent power from flowing back down the linked structure. Jacus, he's not making sense again. It means that where the elven wells are designed to feed the magic into the center, Jugar said with carefully pronounced words, the human system was designed to feed the magic outward from the center, disseminating the power of the human magic to the outlying regions from a central source. That is why the portal could not be operated from our side when we arrived here. That is why magic has completely failed in this land. It may even be the reason why the human empire fell to the elves in the first place. So, Dracus said, 
gazing at the ground. It's like a river, flowing out from the center. That's right, lad! Jugar smiled. And something in the center has stopped the river from flowing? Urulani continued the thought. Exactly so! Jugar said, tossing the stone from his hand to the ground in triumph. If we were to find the source of this magic, open the gates that are preventing its flow, then who knows what wonders it might perform. The one thing I am sure of is that it would make their system of portals functional again. It could very well get us home. I tell you, when I looked up and saw that goddess looking over that well, I thanked her out of sheer joy. Goddess, Mala said, suddenly rising from her cot. What goddess? Why, lass, I was so ecstatic in my discovery that I didn't stop to ask her name. What did she look like? Mala demanded, coming quickly over to where the dwarf knelt. Did she speak to you? No, lass. Jugar looked up questioningly into the intent gaze of the auburn-haired woman. She was but a statue there at the edge of the courtyard. It's of no consequence. The point is that we need to find this place, this center of magic. I could do it, too, if I had the heart of air from that Aishanda thief. Drakus glanced at Ethis, but the Chimerian's face was blank as ever as he spoke. You are right, Ethis said. We should speak with this far runner about what he knows, where this center of magic might be found, the ruins downstream, and about your stone. Dracus, do you think you could arrange that with the clan mother? Odd Lyell? Dracus smiled. <laughs> Woven in the middle of all her polite speech were questions about whether we were warriors for another clan hold of humans sent to open the gates for their attack, disguised dragon men, or mercenaries hired by the dragons to spy on her personally. She likes to keep her enemies very close. I think if I proposed anything that would get us out of her great city, she would gladly help us fill our packs and shed a gracious tear while pushing our boats away from the shore with a firm kick of her sandaled feet. Jugar stood to face Dracus. Find me that stone, get us a guide to the center of their magic, and I might just be able to get us all home. Dracus looked at Mala. Then... Let's go home. Chapter 20 Grandfather What in the name of the gods was the point of that? Dracus huffed as he stepped out of the audience hall of Ambeth Keep. Ethis was at his heels as they both followed Ishander out through the gate of the Keep stockade wall and down the wide and uneven stone stairs. The locals called the open plaza before them Ambeth Commons, and in the escaped warrior's view it was the first thing these people had named correctly. The keep sat on a promontory overlooking a bend in the river, and the commons was a large open space behind it. The town's well was located in its center, with some of the larger merchant or tradesman establishments surrounding it. Not that there was much in the way of either merchandise or trade. Several roads led away from the plaza into the uneven angles of crowded huts and shacks that made up the architecture of the town. "'You mean our audience with the clan mother?' Ethis said as he followed Dracus down the stairs. "'We got permission to speak with this far-runner, didn't we?' "'The clan mother is wise!' Ishander said back over his shoulder, with defiance as he strode across the commons in front of Dracus and the Chimerian toward Tyra Road." She honors you by permitting this audience with the greatest of forerunners. Permission, yes, but just the two of us. Dracus answered the Chimerian as he picked up his pace to keep up with the young man leading them through the crowded streets of the town. You deliberately made sure the others were left out. Urulani looked as though she were going to take you apart with her bare hands. And the dwarf. Did you really want the dwarf along? Ethis said, his usually blank features shifting to express astonishment. Well, I'm sure you don't, Dracus said as they moved quickly down the gentle slope of the road toward the Elusia crossing. The street was crowded, but the humans packing the roadway about them hastily moved aside at the sight of the four-armed creature with a barely discernible face. Why didn't you just give him his stone instead of making him fret over it? Because it pleases me not to do so. Ethis responded with honesty that Dracus had not expected. He's far more manageable without it, and besides... He doesn't trust me. 
Indeed. Dracus rolled his eyes. I wonder why not. Keep up! Ishander shouted at them, although they were practically walking on his heels as it was. Besides, Ethis continued, he already suspected I stole it once. How will it look if it appears in my hands? The street. Dracus still had trouble thinking of the uneven dirt path in those terms. Meandered along the side of the gentle slope between the sawtooth placements of the structures on either side. Though every hut, hovel, or shop seemed to aspire to square corners, angles, and straight lines, none of them appeared to have had any success in the matter. Dracus believed he could count on the fingers of both hands the number that managed to hold themselves together well enough to support a second floor. Each was fitted around, over, or between the crumbling ruins of their glorious and long-vanished past, a legacy which appeared now to be more of an inconvenience to them than a loss. "'I don't know why you are so concerned about this,' Ethis continued. "'Because the dwarf was looking for the stone, he discovered the aether well, and a possible means of getting out of this strange land. All in all, my not giving him a stone seems to have helped us far more than if I had just politely handed it over to him. Besides, I managed to get Olyel to agree to call off her less than charming escorts as well by putting us under the charge of this most able warrior, Ishander. I would have thought that alone would have been worth the price of letting the dwarf pull at his own beard for a while. I could have used his advice, Dracus huffed. What needs to be decided now does not benefit from protracted argument, the Chimerian replied, a puzzled edge to his voice. I thought you of all people would appreciate a few less voices in your head. They followed Ishander as he turned right up a Bratius way the widest of the streets in Ambeth that ran from the flat river bank where the boats docked up the gentle slope toward the stockade wall. At the head of the rising street, he could see the old gate, as the locals called it, to the north that led into the more extensive part of the ruins. Ambeth had once been much larger than the present extent of the stockade walls. This morning, the gates were open as the hunt runners passed through them as they did each morning, singing their songs as they marched out of the town. They were followed by the grass-walkers, whose job it was to gather fruits and vegetables from the jungle, as well as from several large farming plots outside the village. Each group sang their own song, but the melodies each interwove with those of the other group. It was a rather beautiful sound, Dracus thought, with the hunt-runners and the grass-walkers naturally taking up different parts in harmony as they moved into the ruins and the jungle beyond. Old men and women as well as young children cheered and waved as the parade of workers moved past them. It would all have been a rather heartening scene if Dracus had not known that there was a good chance that a number of those singing as they marched resolutely through the gate would not be returning by nightfall. The hunt runners suffered perhaps the worst, as the prey they stalked was as often stalking them. The grass-walkers were not without their own dangers, as the carnivorous beasts ranging beyond the stockade walls often lurked around the more fruitful regions on their own hunts. The once civilized lands of the human empire had grown decidedly uncivil. As the old gate drew closed before them, hiding the deep ruins beyond, Ishander turned to their left, where Jerusta Street crossed a Bratius Way. Jerusta was barely a path here, snaking its way between homes, the street quickly dissolved into a labyrinth of huts and shacks so tightly jammed together that it was almost impossible to tell where one ended and the next began. "'The great far-runner lives here?' Dracus asked in dubious tones. Ishander, jaw set, turned so abruptly that Dracus nearly ran into the young man. "'He is the greatest of the far-runners! He has seen the farthest towers of the lost kingdoms and walked the streets of the gods!' You will be respectful of him, for that is the law of the clan. We accept the law of the clan, Dracus said, with a slight bow and opening his hands wide before him. The truth was, he was suspicious of the law of the clan, to which they were expected to so dutifully be obedient. No one ever bothered to explain, nor indeed seemed to know just what this law of the clan was, until Dracus or one of the other outsiders, as they were called, broke one of their unspoken commandments. Dracus suspected that their captors made up the details of the law of the clan as they went along, depending upon whatever the clan mother decreed from moment to moment. If anything, to Dracus, it seemed that the foundational principle underlying every application of rules was, 
If it can embarrass the outsiders or cheat them out of something, that is the law of the clan. Ishander scowled, but Dracus had a hard time taking the boy seriously. He was not yet in his beard, and despite his considerable bravado and unquestionable skill at survival while they were escaping Pythar, there was a greenness to the boy's manner and movement that the seasoned warrior now remembered seeing too many times in young impress warriors, eager, fearless, and all too often short-lived. Ishander squeezed back between two woven reed mats that passed for walls. Any concept of a path had vanished altogether, and Dracus found the smells overwhelming. The young man stopped again. "'Remove your shoes before you enter,' the youth commanded. "'Enter where?' Dracus asked. "'Honored ground,' Ishander said with a look that, not for the first time, told Dracus that it was common knowledge to everyone but him. When both Dracus and the Chimerian had loosened their sandals, the young far-runner pulled back a woven mat and beckoned the outsiders within. Dracus stepped barefoot onto the clean mat flooring and was at once confused and astonished. The room was small and had a low ceiling, but it was carefully organized and well-ordered in complete contrast to the chaos outside its walls. Yet even in its order, it was an explosion of contradictions. Low tables displayed a dizzying array of art alongside broken bits of mechanisms and intricate devices, the purpose of which Dracus could only guess at. On one table there lay scattered a pile of small metallic wheels with jagged edged teeth that seemed to have once fit together inside a bent, green-crusted metal casing. A box, encrusted so thickly in rust that it seemed barely able to hold its shape, sat in one corner of the small room. There were tubes of copper leaning against another corner, beyond a set of carefully arranged pillows that were in a hopeless tangle. Several statues had been placed about the room. Some of them were partial, and others complete. Some were so small as to be able to rest in Dracus's palm, while one statue of an enormous winged creature with four legs and no head was far too large for the room with one of its wings sticking out through the sidewall. But it was the large stone throne, the back of which ended abruptly in a jagged, shattered edge that commanded his attention, for there upon it sat the master forerunner. He had no legs below the knees. He was an old man, the oldest Dracus had any memory of ever seeing. His carefully kept white hair had been pulled back from his forehead into a long, tightly woven braid that fell down his back. His body was strong, but the tone in his muscles had started to fade. He had chiseled cheekbones, and his pale eyes were unfocused, seemingly trying to look everywhere at once. He turned toward the sound of Dracus and Ethis as they followed Ishander into the room. Outsiders! the elder forerunner exclaimed his face bursting into a smile of childish delight, though his eyes did not seem to find them as they stood before him. Ah, a human who smells of distant blood, and a robber man! Oh, how wonderful! Dracus glanced at Ethus, but the shapeshifter's face remained impassive. Come to hear, have you? Come to see! The old man cackled. (laughs) <laughs> Come to be led by the runner who cannot walk. Oh, we have, Dracus answered. We need to know. Of course you do! <laughs> the old man laughed, slapping his bony hands on his thighs. You're running far, young man, farther than anyone has ever run before. You have to know. Why, my son, you have to know better than any of us. Sire, you're confused. I am not your... Sire, be damned! You can save that for the clan witch and her puppet show down on the point. The old man interrupted again. My name is Coban Dakan. I'm the best damn forerunner that ever lived, boy. But your legs? Ethis asked. How could you? And the Chimerian! The elder man exclaimed. Never have met one of your kind before, though I've seen plenty of likenesses of your clan out in the lost. Lord, your kind were all made up by the lore-tellers, but I guess I was wrong. Well, 
I'll tell you, robber man, why this great far-runner is stumping around on what's left of his knees. I was running in the north, down the left branch, as it were, of the river Agrin, past the Divergence Falls. I had seen some markers that looked like an old road to Kesh Moran, the City of Delights, as it was known in the time before and was holding my path as close to the river as possible without losing the markers, taking me farther into the... Grandfather! Ishander grumbled under his breath. The old man looked over at the youth. Well, perhaps I'll tell that another time. The tale of the tale is that Clan Drevol found me and thought I was poaching on their past. They had the idea that Shurich was their ruin to pillage and wanted to say so clearly to our clan. So they took just enough of my legs to make sport of me. But I got them back, you see, after I'd been there several months and gotten used to getting about on these stumps. Grandfather! Ishander snapped. The elder man screwed up his face in disgust and turned back, his blank eyes looking toward Dracus. He's my grandson, and yet he treats me like a whelp. You can just call me Coban, as long as Zodlai is out of your shot and you don't make me mad. So, she sent you to me, did she? Um, uh, yes, Dracus said, clearing his throat. He was beginning to think he would not be able to fit his questions edgewise between the elder's words. Uh, we need to know. What happened? Coben said, his eyebrows rising. What happened in the time before when the magic was stolen from the land, when the citadels went dark and the plague from the south robbed the life from our land? Is that what you want to know? Yes, Coben, Ethis said. The elderly far-runner nodded sagely then sat back against the broken throne, pressing his long, bony fingertips together. "'Haven't the slightest idea,' the old man said. Dracus blinked. Uh, but, "'But we were told that, young man, I may not be much to look at now, but I was the best in my day,' Coben said. His blank eyes seemed to be looking onto a different place and a distant time. I ranged across the desolation. I've seen the canopy trees stretching over the borders of Armithia itself. I've scoured the Menaros ruins and tempted the Draconetti of Pythar. I've climbed the God's Wall Mountains and seen the dragons on their cracks. I've tread with quiet respect past the towers of Airgain and left the ghosts to sleep there undisturbed. I've even seen the towers, those incredible, heart-breaking towers of Koraipistan still standing bright in the distance. No man has gone further, seen more, and been more disappointed than I. No man alive knows more than I do about the past, and I'm telling you that all I know is that it's gone. It's all gone forever. Then you have no idea what happened in the time before, Ethis said, deliberately frowning. Oh, there are the stories and the legends, Coben shrugged, opening his hands casually. They tell of the time when the plague of long-headed demons came from the south and stole the magic out of the land. They say that men and dragons were brothers in the time before. "'together guarding the secret of the great magic that protected them both. "'There was some who, at least, one legend says, "'took this brotherhood too far "'and tried to use that same magic to remake humans "'into a semblance of their dragon neighbors. "'That is the explanation we have of the Draconetti, "'although we have no real knowledge of it. All of this happened so long out of memory, and the records were lost in the calamity when the Towers of Light went dark. The power of Aether, so the legend says, kept our land strong and the demons of the Southlands in fear. 
the Fordrim down the east fork of the Tyra tell a story where the dragons betrayed their human brothers. I spent some time with them before the Drevol took me, and that it was their betrayal that caused the Aether to be stolen from the land, and the glory of humanity to fall in a single night. What if the magic were to return? Dracus asked. What if someone found a way to bring it back? The old man pondered for a time before he spoke. That the Aether is gone is sure, and now there are none left who might use it, even were it to return. Even so, who can say what might happen? The long heads from the south believed that we were extinct, and after they had their fill of feasting in our land, left it like a rotting carcass. Yet the fathers of our fathers before us, few as they were, still managed to survive. We are still here. We may be a flickering flame in the winds of terrible times, but we burn still. Who is to say what we might be if the great fires were rekindled among the lost citadels? Can you tell us the way? Ethus asked. The old man smiled. No... Not even I can tell you that. I know the way, Ishender said, folding his arms across his chest. The old man turned to the youth, a pained expression on his face. No, Ishender, you must not. It is farther than even I have run. Your father was foolish to have tried. I will take you, Ishender said, ignoring the old man and addressing Dracus directly. I have seen the Towers of Light. I have walked the Lost Citadel. I know the way. Chapter 21 Uncertain Ground It is a violation of clan law. Felida, a female hunt-runner, stood before Urulani with her bare feet planted resolutely wide and firm against the track of packed dirt that ran its serpentine course through the thick jungle growth that all but obscured the collapsing ruins around them. It had previously been Arminthus Road, but once they had passed the near gate beyond the Ambeth Wall, the ancient avenue had nearly disappeared altogether. Felida was almost a full head shorter than Urulani, but had a muscular build that reminded Urulani of Jugar. She was unquestionably strong, as she had demonstrated only three days before, when she had found Mala and the Lyric walking up this same street toward the near gate, through the town's defensive wall to the north, and had summarily picked up both women and carried them back into the marketplace, where apparently clan law dictated they should remain. Her hair was a mousy brown, what little there was of it, since the woman preferred to keep it cut less than a finger's width in length. She had a strong jawline, which was often set in defiance of Urulani's wishes, and small gray eyes that peered at the captain of the Sidron with perpetual suspicion. Her skin was deeply tanned and leathery from exposure, leaving it wrinkled and old in appearance. If the woman had a love interest, Urulani would have liked to meet the person, just out of curiosity, to see what kind of companion this woman could successfully bring to heel that she would bother with enough to keep. Violation of clan law! Urulani yelled back at the hunt runner. Her own people, the Sondao of Nothri, had little in the way of material possessions except those that they liberated from their gnome, goblin, or elven neighbors whenever the need arose. The Sondao were a happy people, living life on their own terms to come and go as they pleased. These Ambeth humans were plentiful, it was true, but seemed in a perpetual state of anxiety and desperation. They hunted, but took no joy in the hunt. They brought in fruits and vegetables gathered from the forest, but never seemed satisfied with what they found or how much they brought in. The clan mother counseled peace, but beneath her words was a perpetual message of fear. Urulani's own people were dark-skinned sea raiders who had the sense to take only what they needed to live and spend the rest of their time enjoying the living of that life. These light-faced northern people seemed to have lost all their senses along with their color. They were afraid of everything, driven to have more of everything than any of their neighbors, and so busy getting everything that they had no time to enjoy anything. And all for what? So they could fill their lives acquiring a hoard of possessions, only to die 
and get no use or pleasure out of what they had spent their lives acquiring. If this was the great human empire of the ancients, then it was no wonder they were nearly extinct. And now, Urulani was facing perhaps the most stubborn example of northern human thinking in the compact body of Felida Creve, the so-called escort assigned to Urulani, Mala, and the Lyric. Only Mala and the Lyric had disappeared, which had made Felida more intractable than usual. Just which clan law are you thinking is being broken right now? Urulani seethed at the hunt runner, who looked as though she were holding her breath. The clan law that says that we are all supposed to stay within your sight? Or the clan law that says we must remain within the town walls? Or perhaps you're thinking of the clan law that says guests must be kept safe from harm? Well, Mala and the Lyric have managed to get through the gate without you stopping them, and they're out there, somewhere. Exactly where in the somewhere had become increasingly difficult to ascertain. Their trail was easy enough to follow when Urulani or Felida picked it up, but it often led into the ruins and seemed to wander back on itself from time to time. Urulani felt sure that it had led her and their escort both no more than a few hundred strides beyond the town wall, and yet Urulani had not been able to see the wall for some time and was feeling slightly confused by the tree canopy overhead that blocked her view of the sun. Their being out here is a violation of clan law, Felida said. You being out here is a violation of clan law. You must go back. I'd be delighted to go back, Urulani said, reining in her anger and trying to penetrate this woman's thinking by speaking slower. As soon as we find the Lyric and Mala. No, Felida responded. You are in violation of clan law. You must go back now. But if I go back now, I'll have to leave you to do it, Urulani said with bridled fury. And that would be a violation of clan law, wouldn't it? Being out of your sight. Felida puckered her lips in thought. It looked painful. Then I will take you back. Ah, but if you take me back, you will be leaving the Lyric and Mala out here beyond the Ambeth Wall, Urulani said. That would put them in danger, and then you would be in violation of clan law. Neither one of them has enough sense to survive on their own. Are you sworn to protect them? It is my unquestioned duty, Felida responded indignantly. Then let's find them quickly, get back inside the town wall, and then no one will be in violation of clan law, Urulani said, pushing her way past the shorter hunt runner as she again followed the booted prince of Mala's feet and the smaller bear prince of the Lyric back into the undergrowth. She could hear Felida following noisily behind her. What kind of a hunter is she? Urulani thought. Maybe her specialty is deaf beasts that have to be wrestled to death. Pushing past another fern, Urulani found the trail easier to follow as the jungle gave way to a colossal ancient structure. The domed roof had partially collapsed, but the walls seemed largely intact. Urulani wondered for a moment why the Ambeth had not used this structure for shelter rather than rebuild at the edge of the river. The trail of the two women led very clearly across the broken, dirty flagstones to a wide set of stairs and a large arched opening. The noise behind her had stopped. Urulani turned to look back. They must have gone in there. We just need to bring them. The short woman was trembling her eyes fixed on the ruin before them. Felida, Urulani asked quietly, What is it? You go, the hunt runner said in a quavering voice. Urulani opened her mouth, about to say something about it being a violation of clan law, but stopped as she realized that Felida was on the verge of fleeing. Instead, she said, All right, I'll go get them. You stay right here, and I'll be back. Yes, Felida gulped. I'm going to draw my sword now, Urulani said evenly. Right. Felida managed to nod her head. Urulani turned back, slipping her blade from its scabbard. It had been made abundantly clear to her by Felida that guests of the Ambeth clan were in violation of any number of clan laws simply by showing their swords uncovered anywhere at any time. The Sondao woman 
her smooth black skin now suddenly damp with perspiration, moved quickly up the steps and into the open arched portal. Dim light filtered into the hallway that appeared to run along the interior length of the wall before turning at the corners, the sagging ceiling having fallen completely in several places. The floor was covered in debris. The walls featured faces, dim and indistinct in this light, carved in a frieze that ran down the length of the hall. These lost humans had a fetish for face carvings, Urulani thought to herself, following the clear tracks down the hall toward a passage to her right. Lili. Urulani froze, her eyes widening in the darkness. She shook her head, drew in a deep breath, and then continued. The tracks definitely led through to the right. She turned and paused again. This was another hallway, but the walls were of wood. She could hear them creaking as she passed them, moving toward the intersection with another hall toward the end. There the halls turned left and right. She could see where these two continued deeper into the building. Lily. She had definitely heard the voice that time. It echoed down the hallway so badly that she was uncertain as to its direction. She could not tell if it was Mala's voice or that of the lyric, but it must have been one of the two of them. How either of them knew to call her by that name was a mystery that angered her. No one called her that anymore. She hurried down the hall to her left, following it to the right, and then stopping at another intersection. Two branching hallways went into the darkness on her left or her right, while the one in front of her continued a while before also turning right. Urulani gritted her teeth. A labyrinth, she muttered. I hate labyrinths. Lili. Urulani whirled about, but there was no one behind her. She was sure the voice had been close, so close that she thought she felt the breath on her neck. Where are you? she called out. Come, Lili. Come and find me. Urulani adjusted the grip on her sword. It must have been the lyric, she thought, moving cautiously down the narrow hall. She and Mala playing their own little game in the ruins like children, too foolish and young to know that there are dangers in the world. What was she doing here anyway? Charging in to rescue these two women who represented everything she hated? The lyric, who changed who she was and what she knew more often than the sun dawned. Urulani prized reason, tactics, and thought, while this woman placed them all in danger by her madness. Worse for her, though, was Mala. She was a traitor whose trust was forever lost and her every action in question. She had betrayed them all and had a hand, no doubt in Urulani's mind, in the attack on Nothri and the death of uncounted numbers of her kinsmen. The Sundao captain would have tossed her overboard the night she was exposed, and they would all have been rid of her long before now. And yet, here she was, moving deeper into this maze, and for what? to rescue two foolish women who could not even manage to keep within the barricade walls? Why have you come, Lili? I've come for you! Urulani shouted down the hallway. We've got to get back to the town! No, Lili, the deep voice said. The walls around Urulani groaned. You did not come for the women. You came for him. I don't know what you're talking about! Urulani shouted, her hands suddenly shaking. She had to concentrate before it would stop. We need to leave! You cannot leave, the voice said. It seemed to come from everywhere. You came to find me, but you are lost and wandering. You do not know the way because you do not know what you want. You will never find it until you know what you seek. I'm looking for two women. You do not want them. But I will have them! Because he would want it to be so. Stop it! Urulani shouted. A whisper came into her ear. You are lost, Lily. You need to find the stars again. They have been hidden from your eyes. But you shall see them again, as you did when you were young. Come to Celesta, Lily. Urulani turned toward the voice. The faces in the wall were those of a woman. It was her own face carved in the wall. The face slowly smiled at her. 
Urulani roared, swinging her sword wide and connecting with the carved face. In an instant, the wall exploded into dust, followed by the wall behind her and those at either end of the labyrinthine halls. Instinctively, Urulani raised her arms to cover her face. When she lowered them at last, she saw that the entire maze had vanished, crumbling to dust around her. In the center of the now empty shell of the building stood the lyric and Mala, gazing up at a statue of a woman that had remained unscathed through the years and the fall of the maze. Urulani quickly crossed the now open space, her footfalls kicking up thick dust as she ran. Lyric! Mala! The women turned toward Urulani. Mala had an expression of surprise, but the lyric was unfazed. So, you came for her, the lyric said with a smile and a vacant expression. She said you would come when she called. Come with me, Urulani said, not wanting to think about what the lyric was implying. Felida is waiting for us outside, and we've got to get back inside the town before we're missed. Oh, I don't think anyone will be looking for us, the lyric said with a smile. They'll be dealing with far bigger problems. You're right, though. We had better hurry or we'll be caught outside. He has come. He's the beginning of the path, but he does not comprehend its ends. The lyric looked up. Urulani followed her gaze. Sunlight was streaming down in columns from the broken dome far overhead. Urulani could hear horns blasting in the distance. A screeching sounded so loudly that it raised a pall of dust up from around their feet as a shadow rushed overhead, blotting out the sun in its passage. Its shape and sound Urulani had seen only once before, but it was unmistakable to her now. An enormous dragon had come to Ambeth. Two more shadows like the first crossed over them in quick succession before Urulani was finally able to run toward the open doorway of the structure, with Mala and the Lyric close behind. As soon as they were outside, Felida joined them in their mad dash. Chapter 22 the horn and hand. The crash of a gong resounded from the walls of Ambeth. Dracus started at the sound and the quick succession of alarms that followed it. He pushed his way out of the far runner's hovel, just as the enormous silhouette of a dragon passed so closely over the town that he ducked instinctively. Mala! Dracus demanded of Ethis, who had followed him in his rush to the alley. Where is she? She was with Urulani and the Lyric. Ethis answered at once. Where? Dracus insisted. Where were they? They were in the market plaza near the keep, Ethis responded. Dracus's voice was closer to panic than the Chimerian had ever heard before. The screams of the townsfolk were making it difficult to be heard. I don't trust their handler, but Urulani will take care of them. No, we've got to find her! Dracus yelled as he ran down the alleyway toward Abratius Road. We've got to leave while we still can! Ethis said, stopping Dracus just short of the road. People were flooding into the street, a river of panic as they tried every way to leave the town for the relative safety beyond the walls. All the gates were open wide, but the sudden mob rushing toward them choked the openings. Children were crying everywhere, their panic spurred more by their parents gripping them in fear than their own concern. Why do they even have these walls? Dracus said grimly as he tried to push his way along the edge of the panicked crowd. Ethis followed closely as they slipped, pulled, and occasionally pushed their way down the edge of a Bratius road. Dracus was sweating profusely by the time they reached the intersection of Tyra. Ethis shouted something, but his words were swallowed up by the keening voice of the grey mottled dragon as it rushed over the length of the town. What did you? I said look! Ethis shouted, pointing down Tyra Road toward where the curving path rose up toward the commons. Dracus looked. The road was packed with panicked townsfolk blindly shoving their way toward them. A cart had overturned in the intersection in front of them, causing many of the terrified Ambeth to rush down toward the river bridge as well as in every other direction. All this Dracus took in, even as his heart went cold in his chest. Two of the dragons had landed at the far end of the road on Ambeth Commons, while a third turned slowly overhead, seeking to land there as well. Mala, Dracus said then grabbed the closest of the Chimerian's forearms. Come on! And just where are we going? Ethis demanded. To the river! 
Dracus replied, charging across the street, dodging and shoving his way through the mindless panic. It was easier going with the fleeing host than against them. Dracus and Ethis quickly reached the river's edge. As Dracus had surmised, the villagers were intent on crossing the bridge, or in some cases attempting to swim the wide river, leaving the shoreline far less crowded than the streets. They made their way quickly along the shamble of buildings and ruins bordering the shoreline. "'This is your plan?' Ethis said with an intense, hoarse whisper. "'To get closer to these dragons?' "'It's Mala," Dracus said, as though that were the final answer to all arguments. Mala," Ethis replied. "'Haven't you learned anything? She sold your life's breath to the Inquisitors, and you're still trying to protect her?' Dracus did not even acknowledge the question, but continued moving along the southern end of the Elusia Road, where it followed the river bank. The road soon turned back up the slope with the keep on their right and the commons at the top of the rise. The three dragons had all landed in the commons, each sitting back with the wings folded and facing the keep. They all seemed to be staring at something. Dracus was suddenly shoved to one side, pressed firmly against the rough planks of a wall. He instinctively reached for his sword, but a larger hand encased his own against the grip, holding the blade firmly in its scabbard. Think, Dracus! Ethis said, pinning the human against the wall. She's probably not even there. She's fled with the rest of the town, and if you're looking to save her, you should be looking for her out there. Dracus struggled with all his considerable strength, but the Chimerian held him fast. Rage filled his vision with red. You're not going to save anyone by dashing in and challenging a dragon with your sword drawn, let alone three of them at once, the Chimerian said urgently. You've got to listen to me. Dracus froze. Come to the tears of the Ambeth lost. Come are the mighty of old. Where is the sun come? Where is the past found? Ethis turned his head, his blank, featureless face twisting consciously into the image of concern. What is it, Dracus? Dracus started to shake. Where is the man whom the wise foretold? He who is seeking the truth. What does portend in treachery's ends? I hear them, Dracus stammered. Hear who? Them! Dracus hissed through clenched teeth. Ethis sharply turned his head and looked up the street, relaxing his grip. When fell the towers of human right? Why did their oaths they forsake? Death came in calling. Dark brought the falling. I don't hear a thing, Ethis whispered, more puzzled than alarmed. In fact, it's uncommonly quiet. Dracus turned his head to look toward the commons. Oh, one of them, the rust-colored one. What about it? Ethis asked. It's <sighs> singing. Broken the vow of the ancient kings, dead in the ground they now rot. Where is the seeker? Where is the keeper? They are making no sound, Ethis whispered again. Do you understand them? Dracus squinted, trying to concentrate. Come to us that we may know you. Come to the horn and the hand. Dracus returning. Dracus in yearning. They... they are asking for me, Dracus said quietly. For you? Ethis asked. Are you certain? Yes. Dracus nodded, gently pushing the Chimerian's arm out of the way. I can't explain it, but but they want me to come. Dracus began walking up the center of the deserted street. This can't be good. Ethis shook his head as he followed. Dracus knew that the Chimerian was taking far more care than he was in moving silently along the buildings and finding cover between him and the monstrous beasts as he advanced. Dracus's own training sounded in the back of his mind, reminding him that he too should be taking such elementary precautions, but there was something in the dragon's song that beckoned him onward with an understanding of inviolate honor and truce. It was not peace or even trust, but something else that he was having trouble putting words to in his mind. Oddly, the fact that there were three of them was comforting to him, although he did not understand why that should be true. 
Dracus stepped slowly up the trodden clay of the road and onto the deserted commons. His sword remained in its scabbard, and he kept his hands far from its hilt. He moved gingerly between the mottled gray dragon on his left and the yellow and green dragon on his right. Both had reared back on their curled tails and sat upright in the open space before the keep, their wings partially extending from time to time, flapping gently to help them keep their balance. Each of these dragons was nearly forty feet in height, their great horned heads craned forward on their long, scale-plated necks as they watched him imperiously through their reptilian eyes. Directly across from where he stood sat the third dragon, a towering behemoth with rust-colored scales almost a third again as large as the other two dragons. Dracus stepped carefully between them with light treads, his eyes fixed on the great rust dragon before him. The gray dragon suddenly hissed so loudly that Dracus flinched, turning sharply toward the sound. The dragon's lips curled back, bearing sharp teeth taller than the human's height. With a speed and agility far greater than Dracus could have imagined in such an enormous creature, the gray dragon's head rushed toward him. Dracus fell backward, his hand reaching for his blade. The head of the rust-colored dragon slammed into the onrushing head of the gray dragon, knocking it to one side. The gray dragon pulled its head upward, roaring with such a deafening sound that Dracus dropped his sword just as he drew it, his hands rising instinctively to cover his ears. The rust-colored dragon howled back, its neck curling down over Dracus. The enormous body fell forward, and for a moment Dracus thought it might crush him. But then the dragon spread its claws, arresting its fall as its forepaw smashed into the ground only ten feet to the human's right gouging a deep hole and shattering the stones of a section of ancient roadway. The scaled breast of the beast filled his vision as the monster turned, bringing its own head down toward the human. Dracus clambered backward, tripping over the broken stones and falling before he could get his footing. He glanced anxiously about him, searching for his sword, but the colossal head was rushing toward him. Then it slowed and stopped just above him. Dracus lay staring at the beast for a while, neither of them moving. "'Tell us the truth we are seeking. Come to the horn and the hand. Dracus returning. Dracus in learning.' Dracus stared for a moment at the terrifying face staring back at him. Thick leathery skin lay beneath the scales, all of which were a deeper reddish color near their base, but faded further out. The enormous teeth were yellowed with age, though how old the creature might be was beyond his guessing. One of the eyes was a milky color, and probably blind, and several of the multiple horns springing from its head had long ago been broken off and worn smooth by time and use. The dragon turned its head so as to get a better look at the human with its good eye. Then it twisted its head downward, lowering the long horn, which emerged from its head just behind the eye until it was within a few feet of the prone human. Dracus smiled momentarily. It was like watching an old man crane his head to hear better. Come to the horn and the hand. Dracus slowly reached upward, laying his hand hesitantly on the surface of the horn. His eyes widened, and he drew in a sharp breath. Chapter 2 Burned bridges. You what? The dwarf shouted, his body shaking with rage. I closed the portal, Ethis repeated calmly. You were running toward the pedestal, too. I thought that was what you were trying to do as well. What I was... I, I was trying to get Dracus out of the way of that fell beast before he got himself eaten. Jugar sputtered. He sat with his back propped against the wall near where the thick forest was still burning, the fire luckily blazing up along a hillside and away from the plaza. The last thing I wanted was to close that portal! Draca stood over the dwarf with his hands on his hips. Urulani's gaze searched the perimeter of the small shattered plaza. Mala kept apart from all of them, pacing listlessly back and forth. Satisfied that they were safe for the moment, Urulani knelt next to the dwarf, examining his leg with a critical eye. It's definitely broken. We need to set it and splint the leg if it's going to heal properly. I do not see why you are so upset, Ethos said, 
raising his expressionless face slightly as he crossed both sets of his forearms across his chest. Our efforts were not gaining us much success against the dragon. Closing the portal seems to have been quite effective. It was our only way back home! Jugar wailed. I would certain beg pardon for upsetting the sensibilities of our fine ladies present. Urulani glanced around in mock surprise. Dracus allowed himself a veiled smile. The ladies present consisted of a traitorous house slave, a madwoman who changed her identity more often than her clothing, and the warrior captain herself. The idea that the dwarf should be worried about the finer sensibilities of these three apparently amused Urulani. But thanks to you, we are now deep in the stew, as the dwarven mothers like to say. <sighs> you see those peaks to the south? Dracus was having a hard time seeing anything to the south, or in any other direction through all the smoke and the brightness of the burning trees to the north. Those are the same mountains where these infernal dragons flew at us from the north! The dwarf continued. We're on the other side of them! So you're saying that this portal did take us thousands of leagues out of our way? Ethis's Chimerian face betrayed nothing, but Dracus detected an edge of goading in his voice. No, of course not, Jugar huffed, folding his thick arms across his chest. But we are at least a hundred leagues farther north than where we started out the evening, and likely well over two hundred leagues north of the coast. So you do know where we are? Dracus asked. I do not know where we are! Oh! Jugar roared, then cried out in agony. You insist on getting upset like that, dwarf, Urulani said. And you'll make that leg worse. Jugar growled through gritted teeth, closed his eyes, and continued with all the calm he could manage. I have a general idea where we are because of the mountains and the stars overhead. Dracus glanced up. He could not see a single star through the smoky haze. But as to the specifics of this cursed land, none of us has a worthy map by which we might guide our way. All that's left is legends and stories, and that's no way to set your compass, boy. When Ethis here got it into his head to close the portal, he burned our bridge behind us, so to speak. And you would have preferred we all be eaten, I suppose? Ethis said through a false smile. Dragons don't eat people! Jugar grumbled. I don't know as you three would agree. Ethis observed coolly. It spit him right back out, didn't it? Jugar yelled then sat back quickly once again as pain shot up his leg. Both of you just shut up! Dracus barked. His mind was still reeling from the day, and this ridiculous argument was rubbing his nerves raw. So, how do we get back? We don't, Urulani said as she stood up. We don't? Well, not the way we came, anyway, Urulani sighed. And not right away. If what the dwarf says is true, and I'll admit that is a big if, then we're weeks from getting back to where the ship is now. We'd have to cross those mountains to get there, which it seems are filled with what I would think are very angry dragons right now. I left the ship with Ganja and Dakran. Kendai knows what happened to us, and about our plan to use the fold. If he survived, Ethis pointed out, they'll be looking for our return. Urulani corrected the Chimerian. They will wait for us. And just how long will they wait? Ethis asked. As long as it takes, Urulani said through a tightened jaw. Two weeks? Three? Ethis speculated. We still could not reach them in such a short time. Then what about the portal itself? Dracus asked. Can't we bring it back? Make it work again? I seem to remember a dwarf who has demonstrated some rather impressive powers of his own in that regard lately. Jugar turned his head away. <sighs> it doesn't work that way, lad. Enlighten me, Dracus said, and his tone made it clear that this was not a request. Jugar looked up. There are basically two kinds of magic, air and aether. Air magic is that of nature. It comes from the ground, the rocks, the trees, the water, and the wind. It is within each of us, actually. 
The stories of its origins among the dwarves are some of the oldest and most fascinating tales ever told, either under the mountain or above it. It all began with Thelgorfson, who... Dracus reached forward and knocked several times on the dwarf's head. Ouch! Uh, well then... Yes, the point is that air magic wells up naturally from the ground. It is a relatively weak force and must be gathered to the wizard over time. The wizard's job is then to retain the air magic, cultivate it within himself, and add to it as time passes. Air wizards absorb the power of the world slowly and naturally, then channel that power to their wills. I'm guessing that's not the case with aether magic. Dracus replied. Aether magic? Jugar began. Aether magic is a higher form of magic, Ethis answered. It is built on the foundations of air magic, but it uses mystic technologies, like the crystals of the Aether wells, to pull the power of air out of the world rather than wait for it to come naturally. It is more powerful, more focused in some ways, but also more fragile because of its dependence on physical devices. Still, that didn't stop the dwarves from dabbling in it, too, did it? Jugar was silent. That heart of air that you keep avoiding and talking about, Ethis said, his eyes fixed on the dwarf. The vaunted nine kingdoms who had built their nation on the power of air had come at last to dabbling in Aether, had they not. The point is, Jugar said suddenly, that I can no more activate that portal than... than... Float, Urulani suggested. Ye are a vicious woman, Urulani, the dwarf grumbled. Dracus threw up his hands in disgust. So that means we have to find another way back. No, what this means, Ethis responded, is that we have to find shelter and food. That is the first priority. We have the supplies we brought with us in our packs, but those were intended to last us through two or three days. With rationing, we can extend that, of course, but that won't be nearly enough time to make our way back to Urulani's ship. I have never been in this territory or anything remotely like it, and I doubt that any of the rest of you have either. Palm trees were new to you just a few weeks ago, Dracus. We'll never survive several weeks' march anywhere until we figure out what we can eat and drink and reasonably anticipate the dangers of the way. So you want us to just set up camp here and wait? Dracus fumed. He did not trust Ethis. The blank face of the Chimerian had fooled him too many times, and his ability to mimic other people's forms with perfection had cost him more dearly than he cared to admit. Ethis was playing his own game, and until Dracus completely understood what that game was, he would remain on his guard against his former comrade-in-arms. I am saying that it would be better if we didn't just charge off into the brush without preparing for it, Ethis said. You insisted on bringing both Mala and the Lyric with us on our little expedition to the God's Wall because you were so keen on proving that dragons did not exist and that you were not the fated one of the prophecies. Well, here we are, Dracus. The dragons most definitely do exist. If you have any further doubts to express, then perhaps you and I can go right over there together and kick that huge dead head of that non-existent. Ethis stopped short. Where is it? Ethis said, blinking. Dracus turned, then without thinking drew his sword. Where did it go? Jugar breathed. They took it. Everyone turned to face the lyric. The jaw of her thin, pale face was set, her eyes determinedly fixed on the space before the broken altar. She strode determinedly across the plaza, her body leaning forward, and her arms held slightly away from her body. Dracus, Ethis, and Urulani fell in behind her. "'Who is she today?' Ethis said sotto voce toward Urulani. "'I haven't a clue,' she answered back. "'Who I am is unimportant.' The lyric answered, her voice more husky than usual, and her demeanor disdainful of her followers. She stopped next to the altar, pointing at the ground. See the blood trail. They came from the edge of the stones, out of the jungle with worthy silence. They dispatched the one you called Quare without a sound. Quare! Urulani called out. Where is Quare? He was right over there. Dracus pointed toward the side of the plaza opposite the burning jungle. He should be... Look. 
The massive, bloody trail led directly to where Quarry was expected to stand his watch. There was no Quarry. They took the head with them, the lyric said as she knelt next to the blood-stained swath. Ethis drew in a deep breath, pointing with several of his hands at once. Their footprints, Dracus. There are five toes, but look how long. More like claws. And how many. The lyric stood up suddenly and ran back across the plaza to where the dwarf still sat. Dracus and Ethis were just getting back to the dwarf when they heard him cry out in pain. The lyric had stopped only momentarily before she reached down and with unexpected strength rolled the dwarf over face down against the ground. Oh, what are you doing there, lass? Jugar howled. Oh, please, stop! Will someone stop her? The lyric placed one of her feet firmly against the dwarf's rump. Then, grabbing his broken leg with both hands, she pulled it out straight. The bone set with a snapping sound, and the lyric carefully laid the leg back flat against the ground. Help me turn him over! The lyric commanded. Ururlani and Dracus both bent down as the lyric held the leg, rotating the dwarf onto his back. How are you? Dracus asked. Oh, you know, I'm feeling rather, um, not much. The dwarf smiled slightly and passed out. The lyric stood up, pointing to Urulani. Splint that now and bind it well. Have everyone stay close and we'll be better for keeping near the fire tonight. What did you see, lyric? Ethis asked quietly. They came for the meat the lyric said, in a tone that dared anyone to contradict her. There will be enough to keep them through the night. I do not think they will stomach daylight. If we are still here by first light, we should leave this place and go as far as we can, our broken dwarf permitting. Go? Dracus was astonished. Go where? Down the ancient road. The lyric replied as though the answer were obvious. We must find a safe place to hide, a place where we can protect ourselves. Why? Mala asked quietly, as she too joined the closely gathered group. Because they are hunters, the lyric replied. Like me. Chapter 3 Pythar It was barely a road. Grasses and vines choked their way across what remained of its surface, the fitted stones occasionally giving way altogether to the thick foliage. The sky was brightening with the dawn as they hurriedly picked their way between islands of fitted stone, broken pillars, and fragments of wall. The dwarf bounced along behind Ethis and Dracus as they dragged him on a litter, his loud complaints and cries ringing out with every jolt across the uneven ground. It had been a long and difficult night, filled with noises from just beyond the edge of the great fire that the dragon's breath had ignited the evening before. None of them had slept except the lyric, who snored quietly through the night. By the time dawn began to brighten the sky beyond the fire still burning furiously nearby, Dracus felt tired, but he could still hear the words of his old commander, Chukong, urging him on. To stand still on a field of battle is to invite death to find you. So he got everyone moving. The lyric bounded ahead of them, scouting their path and urging them onward. Quickly, daylight is short and we've a long distance to cover. How does she know that? Where are we even going? Dracus said through his hard breaths. He was sweating profusely. Never had he been in a climate where the air itself was so thick and wet. Ethis glanced around at the thick jungle that surrounded them. They are out there, Dracus. They are following us. I've seen nothing that would pass for shelter, let alone provide us any defense, Jugar said, gripping his splint to relieve the pain of nearly constant jostling. If they catch us in the open... Who? If who catches us in the open? Dracus snapped as he pushed through a group of ferns, only to trip over a pedestal fragment hiding beneath it. Ouch! <sighs> we can't fight what we can't see, and we don't even know what we're looking for. Quiet, both of you. Urulani said as she moved past them. She affected a deep calm, but her eyes were constantly shifting to peer into the long shadows of the forest around her. You're scaring the women. Ahead of them, the lyrics stopped at the top of a small rise in the road. 
She climbed up onto a pile of stones from a fallen wall and pointed, the bright salmon color of the sunrise sky casting the lithe woman in a warm glow as she gestured. Dracus followed Urulani and Ethis as they hurried to the top of the rise. They all reached the crest of the broken road and stopped. Dracus caught his breath. They were looking across a narrow valley. Here the road they had been following joined a much broader thoroughfare that time and nature had not yet so completely erased. This wide avenue ran straight across the valley to the base of a long mesa that jutted out like a gigantic ship whose stone hull was sailing through the jungle sea below. Here and there along the top of the mesa, Dracus could see a finger of brilliant white pierce the sky. It appeared to have once been a tower or the alabaster walls of a building that had all but been reclaimed by the relentless growth. The vertical cliff face was draped in vines hanging from the flat top of the mesa above it, but here and there, Dracus caught a tantalizing glimpse of the city that once was. Delicate towers, walls, concourses, and gateways remained visible where they had been carved into the cliff face, transforming the stone of the ridge itself into what must have been a grand and imposing mixture of art and function. Near the end of the mesa to their right, a great tower rose up from the concourses, its ornate curved walls soaring up past the top of the mesa plateau, where it appeared to be broken off. The great avenue rose slightly near the base of the cliff, as though reaching upward toward the carved city and its tower in the cliff wall. Trachus could see that the road extended directly into the cliff, where it continued into the darkness, but the causeway that had once lifted the great road had crumbled, and in so doing had opened a great gap of rubble at the base of the sheer walls. Look, Urulani said as she pointed toward the base of the cliff. Just to the left there. Dracus squinted into the brightening daylight. The cliff city was isolated, but not inaccessible. There was a stairway carved into the cliff face. Who do you suppose is living there now? Ethis asked. Whoever is in there, Dracus answered, cannot possibly be worse than whoever is out here. Let's go. The valley was wider than they had anticipated. Crossing it took most of the day. The sun had already lowered toward the horizon and was beyond the towering mesa, casting the face of the cliff and its carved city in afternoon shadow. The ruins at the base of the cliff were more extensive and difficult to pass through, the debris from the fallen walls choking the ancient streets and making their footing uncertain. If any of them entertained thoughts of stopping, however, the shadows that moved with them, flitting from dark place to dark place in the ruins, quickly changed their minds. At last, the lyric led them to the stair carved from the cliff itself. Clouds were gathering in the afternoon sky. I would not have believed it possible, Dracus said. Yes, it is magnificent, Ethis answered, gazing up the cliff face at the delicate relief carvings towering nearly a hundred feet over them. I meant I would not have believed it possible for the air to become any wetter, Dracus answered, laboriously climbing the stairs. Sweat was pouring off his face. How did anyone ever live here? You need to drink more water, Ethis said, eyeing the human critically. Huh, just what I need, Dracus said with a tired laugh. More water. You might be surprised, Ethis answered, just how much water you're going to need in this climate. The stair doubled back on itself as it climbed the cliff face, presenting a landing at each turn. Dracus was having trouble keeping up with the Lyric, who continued her climb ahead of them on the stairs, while the warrior pulled the dwarf's litter along behind him and urged Mala along before him. She had grown listless and sullen through the day, choosing not to speak. Her auburn hair was flattened by the humid air around her face and was stained dark with sweat. Dracus glanced down over the side of the seemingly endless staircase to the valley far below. The distance gave him pause, and for a moment... He thought dizziness might overcome him. It was a sheer drop down into the ruins nearly three hundred feet beneath them. From this height, he could make out the old pattern of streets and alleyways that had once made up the civilization that had nestled against this mountain, but which was defined now only by the crumbling foundations, and, Dracus guessed, not even that after a few more short decades. At last the stairs ended in a wide landing on the first concourse. Never before. Before to my eyes, 
Urulani breathed in awestruck wonder. The wide concourse led to delicately carved walls of buildings, each one from the same stone, but unique in expression and design, a patchwork of individuality and art that rose a hundred feet above them. The entire structure was a melding of the natural cavern and the opulent architecture of its former inhabitants. A colonnade of pillars ran across the face of the cavern opening, supporting a second concourse overhead. Two of the pillars were broken and had toppled onto the wide concourse, but those that remained were exquisite in the carvings of human faces mixed with those of dragon-like features. Each face was different from the next, as were the animal depictions, some of which were strange and unknown to Dracus's eye. Dracus turned back to gaze at the ornate wall of building carvings. Doorways and windows in the structures were largely unobstructed, the wood that once fitted their door frames or window panes having rotted away and vanished, leaving only faint marks in the stone to show that woodworking had been here at all. This will do well for us, Ethus said to Dracus, nodding with approval as he gestured with two of his four hands. I'll search some of these ruins to make sure they're cleared of any troublesome inhabitants and find us a defensible position. Then we can concern ourselves with food and water. Very well, Dracus answered. Urulani. Urulani stood staring at the base of one of the pillars, transfixed by the many faces, each with different aspects and expressions that seemed to be staring back at her with their stone eyes. Urulani! Dracus asked again. The raider captain shook herself. Mm, yes, what is it? We need to set a watch, Dracus said, walking over to her. Watch? Yes, Dracus insisted. Someone to watch the stairs to make sure that no one follows us here, and another to— Is there something wrong? No, Urulani said at once, as her eyes suddenly focused on Dracus. I'll take the first watch. Set the dwarf over here while I keep an eye on those stairs. Will someone get me off of this horrible contraption? Jugar howled. Bad enough that I should be dragged through the forest like a fireplace log, but to be tied to this— this thing— it is too much of an indignity to be borne by man or dwarf. Relax, Juga, Dracus said, wiping his brow as he knelt to undo the straps, securing the dwarf to the litter. You're not going anywhere for a while without considerable help on our part, so you might as well get used to being polite. Polite, is it? Jugar sniffed. Dragged into the wilderness of a forsaken land because some Ephendrian jelly man had to shut the door on our only way back home? "'having a dragon's head fall on me, and who nearly ate me after he was dead. "'Considering the events of the day, I believe I have been the very epitome of polite.' "'Dracus chuckled to himself, then shook his head. "'Well, perhaps you might extend your famous patience a bit longer and help us. "'We can hardly know where we're going until we're sure of where we are now.' "'Well, it's written right in front of you,' the dwarf groused. "'What is he talking about?' Urulani asked. Those columns! The dwarf yelled, pointing with his broad right hand. Those aren't just pretty carvings, you know. It's the ancient script, used from before the Shadow Wars in the time of the Age of Mists. That was after Dracus Airweaver, uh, the, the first Dracus, mind you, fought the dragon Copsy south of the God's Wall Mountains and created the desolation of the Sand Sea. And that was nearly two thousand years before— Dracus held up his hand to stop the dwarf's mouth. Just tell us what it says, Dracus demanded. Reduce to reading for the illiterate, eh? Fine. Jugar flushed red, but held his temper. He turned toward the pillar and pointed again. This says— Hecreon, seer of our goddess Quabet, bids all seekers, or maybe that sojourners, welcome to the peace and beauty of Pythar, city of unification. Uh, then there's some religious nonsense about seeking the higher way and finding peace in the one. Oh, I like the way it finishes, however. Right here it reads, Behold the eternal might and glory of Armithia, where man and dragon rule as one in their terrible might and justice. Hmm. Witness my polite compliance. Jugar gestured around him as he gazed on the ruins. 
as I behold the eternal might and glory of humanity and the dragons that protected them so well. I am looking, dwarf, whispered Urulani, her gaze following the ornate column upward, and then out over the ruins of the city now so much more evident below them. I had never supposed that we were once so great a people. Once, perhaps, Jugar replied, but no more. But we could be again, Urulani said with sudden conviction as she turned toward Dracus. The prophecies. I had not believed, had not dared to believe that they could have been true. Yet, here I stand in the land of legend, my hand touching the lost glories of our past, and looking at the man who could make all of those things once lost come to be once more. Dracus groaned, shaking his head. Ah, oh, not you too. You could be this man, Dracus, Urulani said, stepping toward him with conviction. I do not know of any gods, but I do see what is around me. The legends told of this place, and here it is. Those same legends spoke of a man named Dracus, and here you stand. Here I stand, Dracus said in astonishment. I stand here because our choices were to either retreat through a fold portal or die. How can you of all people believe what this dwarf has been selling? How can I not believe it? Urulani said, her voice rising with her temper. All the signs of the legend being fulfilled. Make any prophecy vague enough and it's bound to be fulfilled in someone's eyes. Dracus countered. But that same prophecy is found everywhere in the southern lands. Urulani said fervently, conviction growing in her as she spoke. From farthest Exalia to the Straits of Erebus. From the shores of the Lyrak Ocean in eastern Ephendria to the rocky coast of Mestophia on the Charos Ocean, the story is told of the coming of Dracus and the rise of a new day of freedom, peace, and justice. Everyone wants to make me into this marvelous, godlike hero who will come riding out of legend and save them. But no matter how hard they try, no matter how hard they believe, Urulani, I'm still just me. I'm just a slave who happened to be named Dracus and got mistaken for someone important. No. Urulani shook her head. I was there. The Iblisi came for you. Slaughtered entire villages to find you. They came because you are that Dracus. And above all, they fear you. No, Urulani. Dracus said quietly. They came after me because they made a mistake. Now that we are so far from them, I don't think any of them cares what happens to us, or even knows we are gone. Chapter 4 Proper Orders Ronos Chas was the eternal city of the Ronos Elves, and the very life's heart of the Ronos Empire. And Sejay Shurian of the Order of the Modalis was determined to make sure it stayed that way. He stood before an awning-covered stand in the Paz Rambutai, the Plaza of Sweetness, in the eastern section of the old city, and surveyed the ordered patterns of various colored fruits with an indifferent eye. Sajay was an elf of such common features as to defy description. His head was elongated, as was common with his race, but not so elegantly formed as might call attention to it. His nose was hooked, but not so sharply as might be thought attractive to his kind. His eyes were black, but the shape of his drooping eyelids shuttered them and made them unremarkable. The tips of his pointed ears dropped slightly, and his mouth was small, hiding the worn tips of his pointed teeth. He was neither fat nor thin, tall nor short for his kind. His single distinguishing mark was a scar that cut through his right eyebrow, yet even this noble mark was so small as to be barely noticeable unless one were looking for it. His robes denoted that he was of the order of Vash, but the commendations, ribbons, and medals it sported were absent any of the more spectacular awards. Those he eschewed in favor of the more common types that dealt largely with mundane achievements. In all, Sajay had the most remarkably unremarkable appearance imaginable in an elf of one of the military orders, someone who would easily be mistaken for one who had never drawn a weapon in all his years of service. Any elf on the streets of Ronos, as happened commonly every day, would forget his face within three steps of passing and never give him another thought. And yet, next to the emperor, 
He knew himself to be the most powerful elf in the entire Imperial City, and by logical inference, in the entire world beyond. Sajay Shorian was the Genitar Omris over the Order of Vash. This post, as the General of Unity over one of the three warrior orders of the Empire, would have been enough to have secured his place of power within the treacherous and ever-shifting landscape of Ronas Imperial politics. But he was also master of House Shurion. He was, in addition, a member of the most elite of all elven orders, the Modalis. The Modalis was, so far as its public face was concerned, a largely philanthropic organization with impressive public holdings north of the old keep of the Iblisi and well situated inside Sujin's wall east of the Monera Gate. Nearly everyone in the city knew that there was far more to it than that, but it was a pleasant fiction that all the Ronas selves found advantageous to maintain as the truth, even without the encouragement of the Iblisi. The true center of the Modalis lay in the rather unpresuming and otherwise unmarked building just behind Sajay on the eastern side of the Paz Rambutai, northeast of the Ministries, and situated nearly equidistant from every other order, forum, guild, and ministry that struggled for dominance in the Imperial City. It was known simply as Majority House, which was something of an irony considering the elite and exclusive nature of its occasional occupants. Sajay, after considerable deliberation, picked out an apple from the cart and paid the groveling Fifth Estate market vendor with carefully and precisely measured coins. He then turned, holding the apple gingerly in his left hand as he looked across the square to the building occupying his thoughts. He smiled slightly, baring a minimum of his teeth. He felt a kinship with Majority House. It, too, was unassuming in the extreme, if one might be forgiven for describing mediocrity in imperative terms. The subatria was narrow and high, appearing to be almost hidden behind flanks of vertical shops and market stalls in the plaza. That those shops were either owned or controlled by the modalis was an open secret, and the height of the walls and location of the shops were a part of a carefully orchestrated design for its defense and safekeeping. The avatria floating above it was small and unassuming, dwarfed in comparison to the monumental extravagances of the surrounding houses, each of which vied for supremacy of ostentation. That was also to Sajay's liking. The idea of hiding in plain sight appealed to him. Sajay lifted the apple and sank his teeth into its crisp flesh, pulling it away with a satisfying snapping sound. The plaza was filled with elves moving in the labyrinthine spaces between the stalls of the market. A cross-section of the empire was well represented here. First estate imperators, anxious to get through the crowds and on with their business in the ministries. Second estate masters and mistresses of the Aether, simply taking from rather than bargaining with the fourth estate vendors, who were dependent upon their magic to maintain the yield of their client fifth estate farms. Third estate noblewomen on their shopping expeditions, with their slaves and guardians in tow. All of these moved through the plaza with their eyes casting about or staring at their feet. Not one of them gave so much as a casual glance upward toward the unassuming building that held their fate within its common-looking walls. Sajay tore another large bite from the apple, his grin allowing some of the juice to run down the side of his chin. He was more than a member of the Modalis. He was the Senekai, the quartermaster, whose charge was to conduct the meetings of the Modalis. Some had more rank and some had more seniority in the house forum, but he alone controlled the agenda of those meetings, steering the discussion in the direction he felt necessary. It was a power that required finesse and a subtle touch. It was also a power that was best used sparingly, tactically, and emphatically. Today, he knew, was a day when all his skills would be required. Playing the Medalis council members was a dangerous game with stakes deadly high, swift, and permanent. Still, one didn't begin with the Modalis unless one was sure all his pieces were in place and that all the dice were covered. Besides, he loved a good game. Kaiori Ziochi, Sujay said with quiet dignity. You have summoned this assembly. It is time for you to state your cause. In truth, Sujay had exerted considerable effort in influencing Kaiori into calling this gathering, 
He could only hope the doddering old patriarch of the Akuran would actually remember the reason he had been given for summoning everyone to the Modalis Forum. Smoke from the incense braziers drifted through the large room. To Sajay, the smell was cloying, but it seemed to please Liao Nianje, the Minister of Thought, who was very much enamored with such recent fads. The walls were partially hidden behind layers of shadow and smoke. Only a single shaft of light from the open circle in the apex of the domed ceiling illuminated the center of the room. The elven figures sat in their appointed chairs, facing toward one another just within the shadows around the bright center of the floor, as they each did in their dealings as the modalis. Kaiori stood very slowly. "'Play your part, you old fool,' Sajay thought. A most troubling report has reached the Akuran regarding the western provinces, Kaori began. It seems there has been a disruption of the Aether Wells across most of the province. Several houses fell completely, their magic failing, and their impressed slaves released from the bondage of the house altars. A low murmur rumbled through the forum space from the other Modalis masters. As control and trade of the Aether is the lifeblood of our order, this constitutes a threat to the Modalis as well as the Empire at large, making our interests allied with the Imperial will. I therefore forward the discussion and resolution of this matter before the assembled I beg a question. Sajay frowned. It was Wei Jean Ray, the fifth high priest of the Myrdendai, and counselor to Master Kachok Velerisom, the Grand Master of their order. He was a stooped, round-shouldered elf, shorter than most, who had an unfortunate tendency to interrupt others with what he believed were more important or pertinent thoughts of his own. His voice, however, was like honey, smooth, rich, inviting, and occasionally overpowering. It did not help that the Myrdin Dai were still basking in the favor of the Emperor, as Weijon seemed talented at keeping his particular brand of sunshine blinding the members of the Imperial Court. The darker truths of the disaster in the western provinces were still effectively hidden from the Emperor's eyes. So Weijon could afford to interrupt the senior Kaiori of his rival order without fear of reprisal, for the time being. If Weijon had no fear of the Akuran, then he certainly had no fear of opposing Sajay. The Myrdin's eye have already addressed this matter, Weijan said with smiling condescension. We were first aware of this incident in the provinces, and our illustrious Grand Master Valerisom took decisive action that should serve our interests, our Iblisi brothers. Sajay could feel Kaori stiffen. The Iblisi were allied with Kaori's own order. Weijan was rubbing the aging patriarch's face in the recent changes of favor at court. "'Investigated the matter at our request, and have since provided us a most satisfactory report in all its particulars. The reports of trouble in the provinces have been greatly exaggerated, and the problem has been fully contained through the mutual efforts of the Myrdendai and the Iblisi. I put forward the dismissal of this discussion and the adjournment of this forum.' Weijon turned toward Sajay, flashing a syrupy smile as he bowed. Kaori glared at the short elf opposite him. I am compelled to remind our brother, Weijon Ray, Sajay said with a courteous nod of his own, that no member of the forum may put forward either discussion or action before the assembly when begging a question. Weijon's smile dimmed even as his eyes brightened. Our brother, Kaori, holds the attention of this forum still, and... Then I would urge this forum, Weijan's voice cut across the hall, to reject my brother's suggestion that the great members of the Modalis should concern themselves with a matter that has already been resolved. Sajay's eyes narrowed. The Myrdin Dai must be very sure of themselves if Weijan thinks he can interrupt the Senekai of the Modalis. You're getting careless. Sajay thought. It will cost you dearly. I beg a question? Sajay turned toward the high nasal voice two seats to his left. 
Your question, Brother Liao, Sujay said, turning away from Wei John. Liao Nianche was the director of the Ministry of Thought, and ironically rather slow-witted on his own, but his timing was impeccable. Unlike our brother, Liao tossed a sneering nod in the direction of Wei John. I actually do have a question. Is there any evidence of what actually happened out in the provinces? All due respect to our brother and the incomparable thoroughness of the Iblisi. The failure of aether wells over such a wide area as we have come to understand warrants more consideration than vague and simple assurances from our brother Mir and I. Wei John jumped to his feet, his black eyes flashing in the column of light striking down from above. Does our brother insult me thus? Am I to endure this outrage without the satisfaction of his blood? Liao did not move from his chair, but only turned his head slightly in the direction of Wei John. No matter how strong the wind, the stars remained fixed. Blow all you like, Wei John, but it is unbiased confirmation that we lack. Wei John reached for the handle of his sword. If the assembly will indulge me, I have evidence to present in the matter. Sir、so、J turned his solid black eyes languorously toward Chadak Vaijan. He was the imperial emissary from the Ministry of Law, a middle-level position, but his family's influence was beyond reproach. He was the one member of the Modalis that everyone in the forum knew to be beyond influence. He was the first elf Sir、so、J had learned to manipulate. Will Kaiori yield the forum for evidence? Sir、so、J asked the elder Akuran, who was still standing, waiting to present the rest of his motion. For evidence, Kaiori said carefully. Sir、so、J nodded, then turned back to Chidak. The forum is yielded to Chidak Vaijan for evidence. What is the nature of this so-called evidence? Wei John hissed through his bared, sharpened teeth. Chidak stood and stepped into the light in the center of the forum. The best evidence, I have a witness. A witness! Wei John mocked. What witness could you possibly present? One who was there at the very heart of what happened. Chidak continued. He lifted his hand, gesturing to the guardians at either side of the forum doors. One who can tell us who is responsible for what we believe to be the worst disaster to befall our empire in over a hundred years, one who comes to warn us of even greater disasters to be visited upon our empire unless we act quickly and decisively, one who can tell us the truth of who is responsible and help us to know what must be done to stop them. Hear her now. The doors at the end of the hall opened. And a thin elven figure with a bowed head walked into the forum. It was a female elf, young by the look of her build, but her face was careworn. She lifted her head as she stopped in the center of the circle of light. I am Si Shabin, daughter of Shah Timuran of the Fallen House of Timuran. The young girl said, her voice clear and her black eyes shining in the light. I was there. Chapter Five. Mutual interests. She wore the same stained and tattered dress that she had been discovered in amid the ruins of her household. Some of the rips in the cloth seemed a bit too strategically located to have occurred entirely by accident, showing off her young figure to better advantage. She put them there herself," Sir J thought, "and the stains are still in the cloth. Surely the brothers of the council are not so gullible as to think she's worn this same dress for the last two months since her house fell. Her face is even smudged. Still, it is an excellent bit of theatre, and just look at them. She's got their sympathies already." Chidak stepped to the edge of the light. His features cast in stark relief. His voice was firm, but had a soft edge to it. Tell us, child, what happened to you in the western provinces? Si Shaban raised her head, lifting her chin with seemingly enormous effort. My father 
took us some years ago to establish our house in the western provinces. He was a devout citizen of Ronas. We moved there so that my father might better serve the emperor's will. Sir Jay smiled inwardly. Everyone who knew him reported that Shah Timuron was a crass, opportunistic fool with a violent temper and delusions of grandeur far above his estate. He was generally despised at court and only moved to the frontier when no other form of easier social advance was available to him. Chadok continued, And where do you reside now? Sir Jay glanced at Chadok with a slight frown. The answer to that question might prove awkward to the quartermaster. I am currently living off the graces of my remaining relatives here in town. My home is gone, our estate is in ruins, and I have lost everything in the fall of my father's house from the wanton and utter destruction of our aether well. Sir Jay raised an eyebrow, drawing in a relieved breath. Shaban had not only avoided divulging her living arrangements, but had brought old Chadok back to the point of the performance. This young girl was proving more adept at this game than he had hoped. In the next moment he realized that he would have to reevaluate her strengths in this regard, and take care to never underestimate her again. Chadok nodded at the response. And you were there when your house fell? Yes, my lord. Shaban's whisper carried clearly throughout the hall. Then tell us what happened. Chadok spoke gently. Shaban raised her eyes toward Chadok, but seemed not to see him as she spoke in flat, distant tones. It was during our evening devotions. Father had heard the report from a few of his returning Centauri warriors early that afternoon in his court. They were the first to return from the Dwarven Wars, and had been expected as their trophies from the war had arrived earlier in the day. Father was angry with the captain of the first Octia, because he had lost the great prize in the final battle, and had only returned with meager and unimportant Dwarven trifles. Chabin's voice trailed off to nothing. You say this warrior had lost a prize, Chadok prompted. Yes, Shaban said, gaining her voice once more. The warrior had reached the crown of the last dwarven king and held it in his hands. Then he had thrown it away. Thrown it away? Erikasi to Jen Shoi chuckled loudly. Erikasi was the minister of occupation, whose concerns largely touched on any of the conquered lands beyond the traditional borders of Ronos. Once... Many years before, he had been a warrior subjugating those lands. Now, by the look of his growing midsection, he preferred to administer them from a distance. The fall of Aether Wells in the western provinces was of peripheral interest to Arikasi, who preferred distant maps to nearer territories. The conquest of the Ninth Dwarven Throne and its associated crown, however, was firmly within his purview and seemed to awaken him. You are mistaken, child. That crown was the expressed objective of the campaign, burned into the devotions of every impress warrior taking the field that day. None would have been capable of doing such a thing. My father believed that it happened, Shaban replied, lifting her chin with just the right mixture of pride and hurt in her expression. The other warriors who were with him confirmed it. And I heard it from his own lips. But why? Arakasi pressed. Why would a slave so willfully break the bounds of his devotions? Sajay frowned. Arakasi was derailing Shaban's narrative with unnecessary issues. The Senekai leaned forward, opening his mouth to speak. I cannot say, Master. Shaban responded. Perhaps it was his first willful act of rebellion, the moment when the captain of the first Octian conceived the tragedy that destroyed my home, saw my father torn limb from limb, and my mother's charred remains impaled atop the ruins of our Sabatria wall with a spear. Sir Jay leaned back slowly. Shaban was good indeed. 
In a stroke, she had both answered Arikasi's question and put him back on the point of this entire performance. Go on, child, Kaori urged quietly into the short silence that followed. Tell us what happened. It was during evening devotions, Shaban said quietly. All of the household and most of the slaves had already received their devotions. We were all in the garden courtyard. I was down near the center next to the house altar with father and mother, just next to the Aether well. We had sounds, shouts and screaming, I think, from the edge of the courtyard. I looked up with alarm and saw one of the slaves, that same captain of the first Octian, brandishing a sword and threatening my mother and me. Sujay glanced around at his fellow members on the council. There were conflicting accounts as to exactly what happened in the Timuron house courtyard that night, and not one of them corroborated the story Shaban told. It did not matter what the facts were. What would the council believe? Did Shaban's story go too far? Not even Wei John challenged her. The house guards approached him at once, and my father rushed to help them, but it was too late. Shaban continued. Dracus turned toward the Aether well. Dracus? Erikasi asked. Who's Dracus? The captain of the first Octian master, the human warrior slave. Shaban replied. He turned toward the Aether well, held out his free hand, and then there was a terrible bright flash of light and the sound of a thousand thunders. Pieces of the Aether well flew. Pieces? Kaori exclaimed. Yes, master. Shaban shook visibly as she spoke. It shattered, like dropped glass, its pieces falling like bright rain all about the courtyard. Chidak turned to speak to the Modalis. The well not only was broken but exploded. I have seen the reports from the Iblisi Quorum who investigated. An inquisitor by the name of Soen Jen Ray reported that there were no pieces of the Aether well remaining that were much larger than a finger of his hand. It was this event that caused wells all across the western provinces to fail in turn. It was only by fortune that these cascading failures did not reach Ronos itself. A murmur rose in the hall at this statement. Sir Jay raised his hand. Brothers, order, let us proceed. Shadok turned back to face Shaban. What happened next, child? Shaban's lips began to quiver, her black eyes shining under the light from above. The, the slaves all went mad. It was like Dracus had cast a horrible spell upon them all. They began raving, murdering. They wouldn't stop. The, the Avatria started to fall. And our tribune, Sajinka, pulled me out from under it. I saw my father. He was fighting with his sword, but there were so many. And I couldn't see my mother at all. The slaves tore at me, tried to pull me among them, but Sajinka kept them away. Oh, who is this Sajinka? Arakasi blurted, trying to follow the narrative. The House Tribune, Chadok offered. He commanded the Timuron Sintari in the Battle of the Ninth Throne. W wasn't there a Genitar by that name? Arakasi mused. A fort in the Belis Isles campaign years ago. I believe your memory serves you too well, Sir Jay said quietly. It is the same, Elven General, but some history is best forgotten. Please see Shaban Timuron continue. What did Sir Jenga do? He pushed me back toward the hall of the past. The Avatria crashed down into the garden and fell over. It crushed so many. He pushed me into a hidden room, a room I'd never seen before, and told me to stay there until he came for me. Until he came for me. Shapin's voice trailed off, her eyes unfocused. Chidok nodded. How long were you there? Shaban's mind seemed to have taken her to a place far removed from the chambers of the Modalis. The sounds were so chilling. The screams went on and on. 
Chidok tried again. Seven. How long were you there? What did you... What? The young elf girl blinked, trying to focus. Chidok drew in a long breath between his sharp teeth. He found me, you know. Shaban suddenly whispered across the silence, with just enough strength to be heard clearly throughout the hall. With the house burning, and my parents dying somewhere out in the ruins, he found me in that filthy little room. The Aether was gone. I, I had no magic to defend myself. And there he was coming towards me with that, that terrible grin on his face. I tried, but... He was a warrior, a warrior, you see, and he kept touching me and pulling at my dress. Chidok looked away from her. Sajay did not move. He knew this part was an outrageous twisting of the truth, but he could read the faces of his fellow council members. We've got them, he thought. My dress, Shaban murmured fingering the tears in the cloth. It used to be so beautiful, and he had to ruin it all. Ho, oh, Chidok said, as if on cue. The slave who did this, who was it? <laughs> Dracus! Shaban said through stuttering breaths. The human slave named Dracus! Thank you, says Shaban Timoran. Chidok said in quiet respect, He hear your words and shall deliberate on your justice. Shaban nodded hesitantly and then walked quietly from the room, her head bowed. The dark doors closed quietly behind her. Wei John barely waited for the sound of the latch before his voice filled the hall. What is all this to us? There is nothing new in this report that was not known to us. To what are you referring, Wei John? Liao observed coolly. That all the Aether Wells collapsed at once in the western provinces, or that it was all caused by this one human named Dracus? It's one escaped slave! Wei John squealed, his voice echoing in the hall. That house Timuron fell is a tragedy. I feel nothing but the deepest of sympathies for this unfortunate young woman who has stood before us. Sad indeed is her tale. More tragic still are the hundreds, perhaps thousands of others who did not survive this unfortunate accident to come and tell their tales to us as well. But we are still talking about a single unimportant slave. A slave who caused the fall of all the western wells. Liao replied with, for the first time in Sajay's memory, an edge of anger in his voice. Of the Aether is what supports the very foundations of this entire empire. We maintain control of our slaves by it. We command our armies through it. All trade is built upon it. Our lives are sustained by it. Our very walls are supported with it. Your own order's only purpose in existence is the distribution of this power and your enrichment through it. Yet when all of this was shaken by the hand of a single slave, you consider him unimportant? Wei Jean bristled once more. It was not our wells that failed, but those of our Akuran brothers. Is it our fault that their poor craft left the western provinces in such a state that their wells threatened the empire itself? Kaiori's hands gripped the rests of his chair until all color had left them, but a single warning look from Sajay kept him in his place. No, answered Kaiori with barely restrained fury. But it seems that the efficient auspices of the Myrden Dai managed to facilitate this unimportant slave's escape. It is a lie. I have seen this same report from the Iblisi, my brother Chidak, Kaori said in even tones. The Akuran could smell Wejon's panic at being cornered. It further states that this unimportant slave Dracus used the Myrden Dye folds to escape northward and beyond. But is this not what our friends the Iblisi do? Capture escaped slaves? Wejon snapped. 
If they had escaped into the northern lands, then it was the Iblis's responsibility to retake them. And so they tried, Chadok said. Tried? Liao asked. This same Soen Tjenre, this Iblisi inquisitor whose report has been quoted, left to do exactly that several weeks ago, Chadok said, shifting his gaze to the elf from the Ministry of Occupation. Arikasi, you remember Soen? He was the Iblisi representative at court at the time. Arikasi considered for a moment behind a frown. <sighs> yes, I remember him. Unpleasant and always moving about. That's him. Chadok continued. His reports refer to an ancient prophecy about a human named Rakus and how he would return to oppose the Empire. It's all nonsense, of course, but a large number of the Sixth Estate believe in it. They are all looking for some prophet to save them. Shortly after studying these prophecies, Soen went north to hunt down those slaves and was followed immediately by a full quorum of Iblis who had orders to kill him. Sir Jay raised his eyebrows slightly. This was something he had not known, and he hated surprises. They always had a tendency to bite you when you were not looking. Not only did this Dracus escape again, but Soen has vanished as well. Chadok continued. The Iblisi believe that Soen may have joined this Dracus. They have secured an imperial edict for his execution, although from what I understand of this elf, asking for his death will be far easier than obtaining it. They're looking for both this prophet and Soen now, and appear to be going to great lengths to find each, but so far without success. Sir so Jay turned to the Minister of Occupation. Have you heard anything from the northern marches about either of these persons? Wait a moment, Arakasi said. Someone said something just the other day. Come on, you used up old fool, Sir Jay thought. Make the connection. Uh, a prophet! I remember! Arakasi exclaimed. A trader working in North March Folds told the Pakhtan guildmasters that there were mass migrations in the north, entire villages of Sixth Estate races just picking up and leaving. Everyone was moving past the shadow coast up toward Nordesia. Something about a gathering to a prophet who would free the slaves. Liao breathed out a sigh. <sighs> it's Dracus, all those migrations. He's raising an army in Nordesia. Arikasi suddenly sat forward. Rebellion in Nordesia? It must be put down at once. The Modalis all turned to Sajay. Oh, what should be done? Kaiori asked the Senekai. Sajay had engineered this moment and despite a few unexpected bumps along the way, he had never doubted it would come. If it is the will of the Modalis, he answered with practiced modesty, I believe I know what to do. Chapter 6 The Victim the small size of the elven courtyard was more than compensated for by the elegance of its execution. Graceful curves formed the three walls around the central space, beautiful sweeping lines that spread like beckoning arms to the weaving broad latticework of pale pink that held the carefully beveled panes of glass rising from the floor to arch overhead. The glass was imbued with aether, making each pane completely transparent from inside the courtyard looking out. When viewed from the outside, however, the panes perfectly matched the opaque, dull, white pattern design that formed the peak of the understated Avatria above Majority House. The Avatria rotated specifically to the whim of the current occupant, allowing just the right amount of brightness by day to come into the central space and the perfect view of the streets and lights of Ronas Chas at night. Raised gardens were set with exquisite taste in elegant harmony, their flowers, herbs and greenery in delicate and perpetual balance. It was a study in peace and tranquility, spotless and perfect. It was a wonderful illusion, Sir Jay thought as he stepped into the garden. One could stand here in relaxed serenity and not suspect that this place had seen more violence, blood, and death than any other rooms combined in all the Ronas Empire. 
Where better to do away with one's problems than with a quick blade in a place that no one knows exists at all? All that is left is cleaning up the mess, and cleaning up messes was one of the things that Sajay did best. Looking at the lithe figure standing like another statue in the garden, Sajay actually hoped that it would not come to that most final of conclusions in this case. She was young, to be sure, but she had a fine, narrow frame and long hands. The taper of the back of her head was extremely becoming, and her silver-white hair, earlier fallen around her shoulders in dirty strands, was now washed, soft, and pinned up over the bald area of her crown. The hair exposed her elegantly pointed ears and framed her angular, pinched face perfectly. Her white silk gown had a neckline that plunged between her small breasts down to the clasp belt at her waist, exposing the bony ridges of her chest. She was striking, Sajay thought, and as cold as the stone under her bare feet. Is it done? she said. Yes, it is done, answered Sajay, removing his outer mantle and folding it over his arm. All the pieces are in place, Shaban, and they are all moving in the same direction. See Shaban Timuran turned only slightly toward the Genitar Omris. That should please you. That should please us both, Sajay said lightly. The Modalis exists for profit, but won't mind investing a bit in you as fair exchange for your help. So, you have your war, then? Shaban said, with her featureless black gaze fixed on the view of the imperial city spread beneath her. Yes, thanks to your most convincing performance. Sajay sat down on the edge of one of the raised gardens. The flowers recoiled slightly from him, but he was used to the reaction after so many years. A nice private little war without a lot of imperial fuss and division of the spoils. You have provided us with a sufficiently frightening specter in this Draca's character to provide me the excuse I needed. Arikasi will make sure that what we are doing in Nordesia remains quiet until we have succeeded. Chadak will keep the courts out of it, and Liao will manage what everyone hears and thinks. Kaiori and Weijan are so worried about each other that they will provide us all the power we need to support the army. In the end, the story will be that the warriors of the Blade of the Northern Will were dispatched to the North March Folds for training. Discovered a seditious army formed in rebellion against the imperial will by a runaway slave named Dracus, and pursued it until it was crushed, conquering considerable northern territories as part of their prize. And Dracus? He is nothing. Sajay shrugged. No, Sajay. Shaban's head swung sharply around, her black eyes fixed on the Genitar Omris. He is everything. He is our bargain. I gave you the excuse to search for him and start your little war. You will deliver him to me. Sajay stood slowly, allowing time to let the urge to strangle her slip from him. He might yet need her to justify the war before the Emperor. Still, he was not used to being told what to do by any citizen of lesser class, no matter how beautiful or cunning they might be. Why do you want this one human slave so badly? I could go out in the streets right now and buy you a half dozen human males, each one named Dracus. Indeed, I think I'd be hard pressed to find a human male not going by that name. No, it is this Dracus who must be found and brought back to me, she said, her eyes unblinking. He is to be brought before me whole and unharmed. Why? Sajay asked in an easy voice. Shaban turned once more to look out the window. He owes me something, and I will have it from him. I don't suppose you have any suggestions as to just how we might find this one and only Dracus human in all the northern lands? You said there was sixth estate trash gathering toward this prophet in Nordesia? Shaban answered. Follow them! That was information I should not have told you, and which you had best keep to yourself. Then find Sowen. Sowen? The Iblisi Inquisitor that's disappeared, you must be joking. He was tracking him before, 
and for all we know he still is. Shabin continued, I met him, you know. He was the one who found me and... Shabin's voice caught slightly before she continued. He let the quorum that found me. If the Ablesi are hunting him, then it's because of Dracus. On the other hand, if Soen has joined Dracus, then he'll be near him. Either way, if anyone knows where Dracus is, this Soen will. Sir Jay shook his head, his lips curled back around his sharp teeth. I'd think it easier to find your human slave with a blind and deaf dwarf than to find an inquisitor who doesn't want to be found. He'll be a shadow. He'll be a shadow being chased by shadows, Shaban replied. The Iblisi won't give up their hunt for him. I would think they could tell you where they're looking. That would be a start. Sir Jay nodded. That is true. At that point, it would be better for Soen to find us than for us to find him. If he is looking for Dracus, perhaps I could arrange a little detour for our friend Soen. Allow him to cross our trail so that we might find his. Shaban's face and posture suddenly changed. The chill that Sujay had felt from her evaporated into a stunning smile and bright, shining black eyes. Her rigid frame dissolved into the soft curve of an easy stance, shifting the folds of her gown in a way that made her stunningly pretty all at once. It was startling to see the cold and calculating Shaban transform in a moment into a warm, endearing young elven woman. Sir Jay felt a strong shiver go through him. He had fought in countless wars and seen unspeakable horrors, but nothing had shaken him quite this way. Oh! My dear Sir Jay, Shaban cooed, I know you can do it. You are the Mordalis, and I'm here to help you. I'll be anything you need me to be, anything at all. If you want me to be the poor, helpless elven maiden savaged by the brutal slave, well, you've already seen how good I can be in that role. If you want me to be the strong, defiant elven woman in search of justice for her wronged family and their honor, why, I can do that too. How about a warrior woman? Would you like that as well? Shaban stepped softly over towards Sajay, her hands reaching up and resting on the front of his tunic. Who are you, Shaban? Sajay asked quietly. I am... Whoever I choose to be. Shaban smiled, the lids of her eyes closing and opening with languid motion. And I choose to be more than I am. Higher estates, perhaps, Sir Jay offered. Oh, certainly, Shaban purred. Power and wealth restored, Sir Jay continued. Oh, no, Shaban smiled. I wouldn't settle for some provincial house on the frontier. No, I have more in mind. Indeed, Sir Jay said. He suddenly reached up and gripped both her thin wrists so strongly that she yelped slightly. And just what did you have in mind? Bring me this, Jacobs, Shaban hissed through her sharp teeth. And I think I can give you the Emperor's throne. Sir Jay looked down into the young woman's face. You shouldn't speak such things, not even here. Shaban eyed the various rooms branching off from the courtyard that formed the suite. If not here, then where did you have in mind? Sir Jay slowly pushed her away. Aren't you a little young for this sort of play? Maybe I'm older than you think, Shaban smiled. Maybe I'm smarter than I look, Sir Jay smiled back. This Dracus didn't assault you after the Avatria fell. I read Soen's report, the real one, and it cost me dearly to get it out of the Lyceum. Sir Jenka's body was slumped in front of the door when he found you. 
I very much doubt that he ravaged you and then took the time in a burning and collapsing building to carefully prop a corpse up just to confuse me. Sir Jay could feel Shaban's spine stiffen through his grip on her wrists. Yes, maybe you are older than you look. Sir Jay smiled as he released her. But I am going to do everything I can to find this Dracus. I'm going to make you the most sympathetic victim ever seen in the eyes of the Empire. You are going to be showered with all the love, adoration, and outrage that our Ministry of Thought can inspire. Your name will be known in every corner of the Empire. Your higher caste will be assured. Wealth will flow to you, and yes, I will bring this Dracus to you for the raw spectacle of it, because it could indeed bring me the Imperial Throne. Bring... Us, the Imperial Throne, Shaban corrected. Of course, Shaban replied. All we need is your precious Dracus. And if you can't find him, then let us make offerings to the gods that we find this Soan before the Iblisi do. Chapter 7 Temple of Whispers Mala sat up in the darkness of the room, holding her knees as she peered into the night. The rain clouds that had gathered in the early evening burst with torrential rain as the sun went down. Water from the mesa above them fell now in waterfall sheets across the cavern, spilling in a river down the steps they had climbed earlier in the day. They were all gathered in what had once been the front of a small shop, a fish shop according to the dwarf. Now the roaring cascade and the rain filled her ears with noise, the darkness was complete as they had foregone any fire that night, out of fear of what it might attract and from the more basic fact that they could not find anything to burn in the immediate halls, rooms, and warrens of the stone cliff buildings. The only illumination they were afforded was the lightning of the storm, which in its fury was nearly constant, its flashes piercing the darkness of the doorway, followed by the rumble and the crash of thunder. It was a tumultuous night, but the dwarf was snoring loudly against the far wall, and everyone except herself and Ethis, now standing guard just outside the entrance, had managed to make themselves comfortable enough for rest. Mala watched Dracus sleep, catching images of him in the flashes of light through the door, her own thoughts as tumultuous as the storm outside. I'm falling through pain long remembered. He is smiling with his fangs, longing and lusting. Never entrusting. Mala's mind had refused once again to quiet into the longed-for oblivion of sleep. Her thoughts spun unbidden through her mind, pounding like the thunder, tumbling in a roiling cascade of pain, hope, hate, longing, and fear. A waterfall of memories refused to retreat, thundering through her consciousness in a wild, uncontrolled torrent. Elven house gardens were flowering. Blood red the petals of pain. Come and forget them. Come to forgive them. Forgiveness was not in her, and she devoutly wished the voices would go away and leave her alone. The elves had put them in her head, she was sure. Voices to call her back home to them at any cost. Voices that called her to a bliss-filled forgetfulness that she longed to be a part of once again. She wished everyone would go away and take her shame and her loathing with them. Mala sat only a few feet from Dracus and hated him for who she had become. She remembered those days in the Timuron house where she pleasantly tended the gardens and kept the house spotless as much for her own pleasure as that of her overseers and the house mistress. Her hands moving through the warm earth while she planted flowers was a joy to her. She remembered the smell of freshly baked bread coming from the kitchens in the back of the Sabatria. She remembered, too, the smiles she had shared with Dracus and the desires they felt, how she had thrilled at his brushing touches and all the dreams, day and night, she had involving both of them together. But then he had returned from the war for the Ninth Dwarven Throne, and she was forced to remember everything else. He had taken her from her lovely safe garden, and she hated him for that. And she loved him for it, too. She tried to remember again that moment when she had awakened to all her memories in that fallen garden so far away. 
It was difficult to consider, for her mind only allowed her glimpses of understanding. She recalled her mind thrown into chaos, unable to reconcile one memory with another as the continuity of her ordered life unraveled in a single moment. She was in a free fall of thoughts, the cord of her mind unraveling until she slammed into a place in her past experience that had been specifically planted there for just such an eventuality. She saw it, embraced it as she had been trained to do so many years before, and a new purpose came into her mind. This memory was a dark one and impenetrable by her conscious thought. It called her to do anything, say anything that would ensure the discovery and recovery of her fellow slaves should the spells of the devotions be broken. It was not a thing planted there by the Aether, since that would have been unraveled too should the magic fail. This was far more direct, far less subtle, and far older than the devotions. This was conditioned through unspeakable means that would bend the will of a slave even against her own interest. She was a Sanar, a beacon, and even as the Avatria of House Timuron was falling to crush her beloved garden, she knew she would betray any of her fellow slaves just to keep the demons at bay that threatened to tear her mind apart. She saw the Avatria collapsing over her. She wondered in that moment if perhaps it were best for the entire structure to fall upon her, crushing her into oblivion and ending her pain. It was just as these thoughts were coming together in her that Dracus had appeared before her. Come with me! I'll take you somewhere safe! She had recoiled from his touch, longed for his touch. He was leaving the house. He was taking her with him. Take me! she had said, and had begun to laugh hysterically. Laugh because it was so terribly funny. Here he was, the great hero of House Timuron, and the man that she loved, dragging her to safety as though she were some distressed elven princess, and she knew, knew that she would betray him to his captors. Who wouldn't laugh, she thought, that the one person in the entire household who was willing, no, not just willing but compelled to rob him of the very memories and life he had just won, was the same woman that he loved and was trying to free. She'd been trained since she was fourteen years of age to do anything and everything that would ensure his capture, and for him to lose those same memories and that same life he had just won, take everything from him he ever wanted in his life, including her. Wasn't that funny, she thought, shaking in the corner as the dim pulse of distant lightning flickered into the room. The journey to peace and a purpose is never trodden alone when the heavens wake and your body breaks. Mala! She blinked in the darkness, uncertain she had heard her name. Mala! came the urgent whisper in her ear. She jumped at the sound, the closeness of the breathed whisper shifting the hairs at the back of her neck. She flinched, turning at once. The lyric grinned back at her her gaunt face filled with contrast from the cold light of the lightning outside. Come on, the lyric grinned. She's waiting. Who? Mala whispered. The lyric was already moving to the back of the shop, picking her way carefully among their sleeping companions. Hurry, she whispered. Mala stood carefully in the uncertain flashes coming through the doorway. She could see the lyric standing against the back wall of the shop, her hands set against the stone. The darkness engulfed them for a moment, robbing her of her sight until the next flash. There was a doorway in the wall, where before there had been none, and the lyric was stepping through the opening. No! Mala said, restraining her voice, fearful of waking the others. Come back! But the lyric only grinned back at her and beckoned her on as she stepped through the portal, whispering as she left, Come with me! She said so quietly that Mala was not sure of the words beneath the rolling thunder. I'll take you somewhere safe. In the next flash of light, the lyric was gone. Mala stepped quickly between the sleeping bodies, desperate not to disturb them. She made her way to the doorway that had appeared in the previously solid wall at the back of the shop and stuck her head through the opening. Circular plates in the ceiling of a long hall glowed dimly overhead pulsing slightly with each flash of lightning outside. They did not fade so quickly, nor was their light so suddenly bright. 
as though they held the light for a time in their grasp before releasing it. They lit the way down its length, plunging directly back into the mountain. Arched portals lined the hall, ink-black and forbidding, yet the lyric skipped past them, her strange giggle echoing back down the hall. Come past the dead in the dying light, come to the bliss of the night. Mala took a tentative step into the hall. Face now the truth and the death of your youth. Mala rushed down the hallway, the pulsing glow from the distant lightning lighting her way. Stop, Lyric! she called out, but her voice was swallowed up in the continuous crash of thunder outside. She rushed after the other woman, desperate to catch her and bring her back to the safety of their group. In front of her, the Lyric laughed at the game and kept ahead of her with frustrating ease. Quite suddenly, Mala realized that the woman had led her into a complex warren of subterranean rooms, some lit by the same ceiling panel arrangement as those she had just passed, and that the Lyric was taking her deeper into the ruins beneath the mountain. The hall turned, opening into a room where one wall had completely fallen, a raging stream of water rushing out from behind it and coursing down across the dim mosaic that covered the floor. The Lyric was still ahead of her, running now, splashing the water up behind her. Mala quickened her own pace, following the mad woman through a succession of several rooms. Brilliant light suddenly surrounded her, followed in an instant by an explosion of sound. Mala screamed, cowering by instinct from the overwhelming noise and glancing upward in fear. The fading light showed a circular shaft that ran up through the mountain, vines reaching down toward her from the opening several hundred feet overhead. The walls were lined with stone balconies and black doorways, each looking down on her. Rain fell straight down the shaft, soaking her hair and clothing before she recovered and rushed into the opposite opening, where the sound of the lyric's laughter echoed its taunt in her direction. The water in this room pooled above her ankles as she ran toward the arched hall on the other side. No lights penetrated this darkness, but the laughter led her on. Mala's fingers running against the smooth mosaic tiles of the curving hall. She stumbled on something that clattered at her feet, but kept on, believing that the voice of the lyric was closer now. She could see something now as she continued, the end to the curving tunnel, and a grateful return to the light. She stepped into a great circular plaza. A curving staircase descended from an upper level. This plaza, too, was open to the sky above, where the great overhead dome had cracked and part of it had fallen, its stones having crashed into and ruined the finish of the polished stones that formed the floor. This open fissure extended across the ceiling of the plaza, where one wall had collapsed into the courtyard, revealing an enormous room more than thirty feet wide and a hundred feet deep. Its arched ceiling rose up nearly a hundred feet to where it was split by the end of the overhead fissure to one side, cascading water down one wall, and illuminating a gigantic statue at the far end. Water also tumbled down the staircase and flowed across the floor, washing away the dust and revealing the ancient shine under the pulsing flashes penetrating from overhead. The lyric stood before the statue, gazing up at it as she swayed back and forth. Soaked to the skin, Mala carefully climbed over the rubble of the fallen wall and entered the enormous arched hall. There were stone benches set in rows here, all facing the statue which lay in shadow at the curved back of the room. The lightning had subsided for the moment, and Mala found it difficult to see. Lyric, she called. Come back with me. It isn't safe here. The figure standing before the statue lifted up her arms slowly, but did not turn around. Please, Lyric, or whoever you are, Mala called, her voice quivering and uncertain. She remembered that who the Lyric thought she was could change at any moment and without notice. If she was to respond at all, Mala remembered, it was occasionally prudent to ask the strange woman who she was and then hope to navigate the conversation based on whatever story she was reenacting that day. Mala decided on a different approach. I mean, excuse me, can you help me? The Lyric turned barely discernible in the darkness. Yes, Mala, she said in a deep, warm voice. I can help you. Lightning flared above the fissure. 
The statue towered over them, brilliant in the flash. It was a woman carved from marble, but her face was staring directly at Mala. It was a face more beautiful than she had ever seen, the form of her body so exquisitely perfect that it filled Mala with wonder just to look upon it. Her arms were outstretched toward Mala. There was pleading in her eyes. The vision faded with the light. Mala had to remind herself to breathe again. She had to force herself to look away from where the statue stood and back toward the lyric. I want... Excuse me, but if you want to help me, you need to come with me back. The lyric was silhouetted against the dim flashes of distant lightning. She shook her head and spoke, though through some trick of the hall, Mala thought, the voice seemed to be coming from everywhere at once. No, Mala, there is no going back. But they are waiting for us, Mala insisted, reaching out for the lyric. It isn't safe here. Those creatures, the hunters from the forest, could be anywhere in these... The Draconet will not bother us here. The voice replied. It seemed to be coming from the lyric, but Mala could not be certain. The lyric was moving her lips, yet the sound seemed to come from everywhere at once. They know that this place is mine, and that I do not approve of them wandering my halls. As you say... Mala responded carefully. She was uncertain of her own sanity, and quite certain that the lyric had none. Then we should get back to the others. They will be looking for us. The lightning flashed again. The statue struck Mala as appearing differently than she had first supposed. The face of the beautiful woman now seemed stern and resolute, looking not at Mala as she had first supposed, but into the distance. Her hands were still outstretched, but now appeared not to be inviting, but defiant and expectant of a struggle. The flash faded, and the statue fell into night shadow once more. Yes, came the deep and sad reply. They are gathering, and they look for your return. Warriors and hunters rise up against them, the might of many against the will of the few, and who shall save them? In whom will they trust when trust is forgotten and betrayal at hand? Mala took a step back from the lyric and stumbled, nearly falling over a stone bench. The lyric stepped toward her, grasping her by the shoulders. You think you are lost? The deep voice echoed through the hall. All Mala could see was the silhouette of the lyric against the dim, pulsing illumination of the great statue beyond her. You think that everyone hates you because you hate yourself more than any of them? Who will love you when you are so undeserving of love? Who will gather you home, Mala Timuran? When the truth is known and the fallen citadels rise again, who will bring you home? The lyric gripped Mala's shoulders with incredible strength. I know your heart, Mala Timuron. You are lost and do not know your own way. Mala shivered. I just want to go home. Home! What do you know of home? The voice gently mocked her. Home to you is a forgetful nothing, a blind eye and a deaf ear. Home is a dream from which you never awaken while sleeping in a bed of devouring roaches. You know nothing of home. A quick flash illuminated disdain on the statue's face. But there is a place within you that remembers what home truly is. The low voice echoed through the hall. Find yourself, and I will bring you hope. Find that memory. I will bring you home. Mala shook uncontrollably. B by the gods, she stammered. The lightning flashed again near the top of the mesa high above them, the crack of thunder following almost at once. The brilliant light bathed the statue once more. The carved face smiled back at Mala with a horrifying grin. The face was now deformed, with an elongated snout and sharp teeth. 
Rusting iron bands had been bound across the statue's chest, fixing torn leathery wings to its back. In the sudden darkness that followed, all Mala heard was the voice surrounding her. Yes, by the gods. Chapter 8 Spirits Dracus peered down the dark curving hall, gripping his sword nervously in his right hand. The splash of his footsteps echoed loudly around him no matter how carefully he stepped. He heard, rather than saw, Rulani behind him, her footfalls overlapping his. Mala! Dracus called out in a hoarse whisper as loud as he dared. Mala! We should be going back, Dracus, Rulani said quietly. You said she came this way. Dracus snarled back at the warrior woman behind him. There were marks leading into this hall, and they must have been in a hurry, judging by the scrapes, she replied. The lyrics tracks are more pronounced, almost as though she wanted to be found. But the rain and the water have washed much of their passage away. But you can still track them, Dracus urged. What is the problem? We are getting deep in the mountain, Urulani said, an unusual nervous edge in her voice. Were her teeth chattering? Dracus wondered. Whatever was tracking us in the jungle may have come in here as well. We should get the others if we are going to go farther in. How long? Dracus said, stopping in the dark, curving hallway, but reluctant to go back. How long until what? Urulani asked. How long since they came this way? Dracus's voice echoed hollowly in front of him. The water around his boots was settling into an undulating sheen from the scant light coming from one of the oddly glowing panels in the ceiling behind him. Ethis had noted earlier that the panels dimmed and flickered occasionally, as though they were set in the shadow of trees blown by the wind or clouds passing between them and the sun in a clear sky. That they were originally intended to bring light to the depths of the ancient human ruins seemed a reasonable conclusion but how such a mechanism could survive down the centuries to continue its work was a mystery to them all. By the sounds of their initial tracks and assuming neither of them was ill at the time they left, the raider woman replied in cool analysis, I would say both of them have been gone more than an hour, perhaps longer. An hour? Most likely longer, which means they could be anywhere by now, Urulani said, her voice strained and uncomfortable. I don't know why the lyric went with her. Who knows why that woman does anything? But Mala's run off, Dracus. Left us to go back to her slave masters. No, Dracus said, shaking his head. She wouldn't. Wouldn't what? Rising anger flooded into Urulani's words. Wouldn't abandon you? Wouldn't sell us all out to death itself if it meant returning back to her precious elven keepers? She already did that, Dracus. But you don't see it because you don't want to see Urulani stopped speaking, raising her own sword and crouching slightly in anticipation. Her large, dark eyes shone in the faint light from the panel above. Sounds, jumbled and blurred by their own echoes, tumbled from in front of them down the darkened corridor. Dracus glanced over at Urulani. There came the distinct sound of splashing steps, the noise of bright laughter. Dracus charged forward at once, plunging into the darkness. Urulani was momentarily surprised by his sudden action, but followed quickly in chase. Dracus followed the wall of the gently turning corridor with his left hand extended, his right hand gripping the hilt of the sword. He could hear, farther back, the echoes of Urulani's footsteps in the water, mixed with the mumbled, Wrong! she uttered with every step. The corridor was brightening before him. He could make out the moss-covered walls now, and hear the tumble of water ahead of him. He quickened his pace with his increased ability to see, and was at a full run when he emerged from the vine-covered arch and into the circular chamber. It was actually the bottom of a shaft, he realized as he came into it. Water gushed from high over a broken wall on his left side, cascading down the fallen stones and across the shattered mosaic that once covered the floor. There was another arched opening on the opposite side of the space, nearly hidden by the hanging vines which extended up the hundred-foot length of the shaft overhead. At the top, the shaft opened into gray clouds filtered through the jungle canopy, a dappled, slanting column in the mists, which in the youth of the day 
barely entered the space. Mala sat on a segment of broken wall next to the base of the falling water, her laughter echoing up the shaft in hysterical peals as the lyrics stood over her. Dracus walked quickly through the rushing water, nearly losing his footing on the slick tiles beneath his feet. He sheathed his sword in its scabbard and squatted down to look into her face. Mala? he asked. Mala turned suddenly toward the sound of her name, as though she had been slapped. Her eyes were bright as they looked more through Dracus than at him. Her laughter had stopped just as suddenly. She shook visibly now. Dracus, she said. Did you see it? Did you hear it? Dracus took in a breath. See what, Mala? She tried to focus on him, but her eyes seemed to be looking beyond him. I'm going home, Dracus. She's going to take me home. We're all going home, my beloved. You can come, too. I know the way. Dracus was shaken. He glanced up questioningly at the lyric. The lyric looked back sadly and shrugged. She raised her hand, pointed to her own head, and made circles as she looked down on Mala. We've got to leave, Mala said, her hands grasping the armholes of Dracus's leather chest piece on both sides, dragging his attention back to her. We have to get out of this place. We have to leave. What do you mean we've got to leave? Dracus said in frustration. We just found this place. I know it seems wrong, Mala protested. Her speech rushed as her words seemed to outrun her thoughts. This place seems safe enough, and we're sheltered from the weather. I know everything you've done makes sense to you, but we're in danger here, and we've got to get out while we can. Of course we're in danger here. Dracus rolled his eyes. But at least we've got some chance to defend ourselves in these ruins. Telling us to dash back out into that jumble of a wilderness. He gestured up past the moss and vine-obscured walls, broken balconies, and dark openings, toward the gray rain and mists, nearly obscuring the jungle-choked ruins below them. Is not going to make us safer. We don't even know what monsters were tracking us in that choked mess. And you want us to dive back into it by giving up the one place we've found where at least we can see trouble coming before it takes our lives? The Pythar are coming, and we have to take the living road before death finds us. The dwarf said this place was called Pythar. Urulani frowned. What is she raving about? The living road? What living road? Dracus could not remember how long it had been since the recently sullen Mala had shown much of an interest in anything, and her sudden fervor inclined him to believe her. The unexpected existence of a back entrance to the shop rooms they had previously felt was so secure gave both credence to her strange tale and concern for the safety of their cliff face warren, heightened by the disappearance of both Mala and the lyric. But now, with the gray light of dawn, and having found both women not only alive, but apparently only having wandered off on their own, Dracus's fears were damped down. The rush to action was slowly ebbing into a desire for rest, and, he thought, perhaps more lengthy and reflective deliberations. Dracus stood up, dragging Mala to her feet with him. All right, Mala, let's get back with the others, and we'll talk about what to do. Talk! Mala was indignant. There's no time to talk. We have to leave. Right now, our lives are... The bellowing sound of a dwarf and the distant clash of steel came from the curving hallway they had just left. Maybe she's right, Urulani said, shrugging her shoulders as Dracus, Mala's hand gripped firmly in his own, rushed back into the corridor and toward the shop. I'll have that back, you black-hearted scoundrel, if I have to cut it out of your rubber hide! Jugar roared. The dwarf was leaning heavily on his good leg, but still standing, his short-handled battle-axe held in both hands as he spun unevenly around on his good leg. Give it back now or I'll cleave you in twain! Dracus rushed through the previously hidden doorway, his sword at the ready, but then stopped short. The hobbling dwarf appeared to be chasing Ethis about the small room with his war-axe. Urulani slid to a stop behind Dracus. Chimerian! What's the meaning of this? Theft and thievery, that's the meaning. The red-faced dwarf howled. Piracy by Thorgrin's beard, coldly calculated and expertly performed. I regret to inform you that the dwarf appears to have gone insane. Ethis replied, dodging a strong slash across the center of his body. What happened? 
Dracus said wearily. I was on the concourse on watch, Ethis replied. The dwarf was taking another lunge at him, but the Chumerian managed to extend his arm, grasping the dwarf's head and holding him far enough away to avoid the blade. I must admit that the architecture interested me considerably and may have distracted me, but not for long. The dwarf howled, and Ethis quickly withdrew his arm before Jugar could cut it off. Now he claims I stole his precious rock from him, Ethis concluded, jumping deftly out of the way as the dwarf charged forward, stumbled, and fell flat against the stone floor. It was absorbing the air through the stones, the dwarf wailed, drawing it out of the ground in ways you cannot possibly understand. You have no magic at all without the stone, Dracus asked. Aye, all living things are imbued with air, Jugar said, rolling painfully to sit up. But it's like comparing a trickle with a river. I would have had my leg healed in days with that stone. Now it will take me weeks. He's convinced I took it, Ethis said. However, before he became belligerent, he insisted on searching everyone's packs. Everyone's packs? Mala was indignant. They had been so intent on the battle between Ethis and Jugar that none of them had noticed the contents of their packs spilled across the floor. Jugar painfully tried to pull himself into a better position. Urulani pushed her way past Mala and the Lyric, who were crowding in the doorway at the back of the shop, raising her elegant head slightly as she stepped around Dracus. Jugar is not just being unreasonable. It appears we've all got something missing. The Chimerian frowned, then fell forward, catching the ground with all four of his hands spread out before him at once. His body contracted slightly, and he looked more like a spider as he lowered himself close to the ground. Even the heavy-breathing dwarf stopped his rage at the sight. Ethis moved quickly along the ground, and then rose upright, extending his torso into the more familiar form to which they were all accustomed. Ethis placed two of his fists firmly on where his hips would have been. It was a human. See! Jugar shouted, I told you! But it wasn't one of us. Ethis concluded, What do you mean? Dracus asked, returning his blade to its scabbard. The markings are not obvious, but they are there. Ethis continued speaking with a distracted air, as much to himself as to those around him. There are footprints all through here. Most of them are obscured by the unfortunate ravings of the dwarf, but there are enough remaining for me to be sure. It was a human, barefooted too, a male of your kind of approximately fourteen years, or a female of fifteen. It's difficult to tell from what remains. Could it be one of the monstrous predators that dragged Quarry off? Dracus asked. No, there's no heel spur like the ones we saw before, and the toes are not long enough. Ethis shook his head, looking out the front door of the ancient room into the gray mists beyond. He came in and left through that front opening, too. An amazing feat, considering I was standing not thirty feet from the opening. Then we've got to be finding him at once! Jugar demanded. He's got my heart! One cannot steal what was never there, Ethis sniffed. You'll answer for that one day, Bendy, Jugar snarled. Although I would be willing to forgo the matter entirely if you'll just move your rubbery cheeks and track down this thief and recover my property no matter what his age. Dracus moved to his own field pack and quickly undid the toggle securing the top flap. Well, I have a dagger missing. Do you suppose everyone else has something gone as well? Certainly, Ethis agreed, although it seems the thief didn't discriminate in what he or she took. Value didn't seem to be the motive behind the theft. Well, he took something of inestimable value from me! The dwarf shouted as he struggled to stand on his good leg. We've got to get it back! The dwarf is right, Dracus said. It's the source of the dwarf's magic, and it may be our best chance of getting out of this nightmare. Can you track this person? Yes, Ethis answered. Now that I know where to look for, I can track him, but we'll have to hurry. Why? Because we need to find this thief for a better reason than the dwarf's magic stone. Ethis said, gazing out from the front opening beyond the concourse to the grey mists beyond. We have limited food in a land where we do not know what is edible for foraging. If there is a human surviving here, then we need to find him and learn from him how to survive here as he does. 
and there is another compelling reason for us to leave, whether we find the thief or not. Dracus finished securing his field pack, and that would be, because I've also found other tracks all over the concourse. Ethis said, Whatever hunted us yesterday has been in here before, and I suspect when the rain stops they'll be coming for us. Dracus thrust out his lower lip in thought. Mala said we had to leave. It would seem she is right. Ethis nodded. And you can track this person, Dracus asked again. If we hurry, Ethis repeated. So, you're a tracker, eh? Dracus said cautiously. Odd, you never mentioned this before. You seem to be a man of inestimable hidden talents, Ethis. Anything else about yourself you'd care to share with us? Not at the moment, Ethis said. We've not the time.